Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. My name is Kartik. I'm one of the co-founders of Eat Global. I'm super excited to welcome all of you to LF Grow. So you're all watching this thing on eatglobal.tv. This is the platform we'll be using for today's summits, talks, kickoff, finale, and the rest of this event. Uh, this is where you get to uh, talk to us live. You can kind of sign in and say hi, customize your avatar. And if you have any questions uh, in the future for our speakers or any of the talks, uh, you can type them in the chat and we'll be able to relay those questions to our uh, speakers. Uh, also, for everybody who signs in and engages with us, we'll be giving everybody a NFT PO app as well. So be sure to say hi and uh, tell us where you're coming from. So this event is brought to you by ETH Global. And for those of you who uh, don't know what ETH Global is, ETH Global is an organization with a very simple mission. Our goal is to onboard thousands of developers into the Web3 ecosystem. And we do this primarily by running hackathons and summits. And LF Grow is no different. So we have both components here uh, for this event. Uh, we're going to start off with the hackathon. The hackathon officially begins today. This is the kickoff of us talking about how the hackathon is set up and how everything is going to work. And then shortly after that, I'll talk about the summit, which is a uh, which just begins in about 40, 40 minutes, uh, and we'll have a jam-packed uh, agenda of amazing talks and speakers that are going to be talking about uh, the future of kind of how we see this space uh, and all of Web three evolve. For the hackathon, we have 500 hackers from 41 different countries spanning 13 different time zones participating and building new ways to think about social networks. So I can't wait to see what comes out of this event next week. And to kind of see where everybody was coming from, we put everybody on a map uh, and it kind of still blows us away that we have representation from six different continents and so many different people from so many different parts of the world. So we're super excited to see the diversity of uh, what everybody is excited about, the problems that you care about and the things that make you uh, super passionate about working in this space and thinking about new ways to uh, build social networks. And uh, I'm, I, I'm excited to welcome all of you to this event. And not just the hackers, we also have 10 ecosystem partners who are going to be here this entire time and over 61 ecosystem mentors who are also going to be here uh, helping you uh, get unblocked or get help on anything uh, that you need to finish uh, your projects, whether it's technical help, understanding how do you think about architecture or just even general understanding of how something is structured or built so you can better uh, uh, understand as well as kind of cater uh, those understandings towards uh, applying them to your projects. And to top it all off, we have $200,000 in prizes that are going to be given away as part of this event. And uh, we'll go into what these prizes are and how everything is split up. So uh, stay tuned uh, for those details. I just want to especially thank the Lens Protocol for being an amazing uh, collaborator for uh, this event. Uh, and also some amazing partners like Polygon Studios, LivePeer, The Graph, ENS, Toucan, Ceramic, Unstoppable Domains, Chainlink, and Lit Protocol. They're all offering different prizes for different ways you, are, you can use their APIs, SDKs, or, or protocols. And we will be going through a lot of those details very soon. So let's quickly talk about the hackathon. So the goal of this uh, session is to cover some of the logistics around how everything is set up and uh, us answering the most common questions we get uh, from all the participants, especially first time participants, uh, and any nuances that we can clarify. So the most obvious question that we've gotten here is what can I actually build? Uh, as I've kind of uh, already prefaced, this is an event about understanding how we can extend and build on uh, the lens graph. So the most common things uh, that we think everybody can be excited about is uh, looking at different ways to think about how we use social graphs in Web3. Uh, you get a really immense commutable as well as composable way to think about information, identity, preservation, and just ways you can leverage any history from any other place and include that in any new mechanic uh, that you are trying to do. Uh, there's a lot of creativity around social graphs. Uh, this also lets you enable a new way to think about claim and drops, whether it's uh, supporting a different way to think about white listings or, or user bases uh, that can get access uh, based on different sort of qualifiers. Uh, there's also ways to think about how do we include this thing in governance and identity or especially how we work with DAOs. And of course, uh, as part of any network, uh, you have so much more room to think about visualization, analytics, and understanding where information is and how it's flowing uh, between uh, different parties. So there's, that's a, these are very high-level themes. Uh, we're going to go into a lot of that um, throughout the event, 
through uh, various talks, uh, also the website for, for the hackathon. Um, and also you can see a lot more detail on what is actually possible on a technical level very soon as we have a detailed talk about the architecture of, of Lens Protocol. So let's quickly talk about the next 10 days. So what I want to cover is how everything is set up uh, and what the next week looks like, uh, what it means to kind of think about forming a team, uh, how you can get help, all the prizes you can win, all the talks and workshops that are happening as part of this event. Uh, obviously, the summit that's going to happen just after this uh, talk uh, and uh, how judging and submission works. So let's start with communication. Everything about this event is going to be on our Discord, which means that if you are a hacker or a partner, uh, you should have had gotten access to the LF Grow channels. Uh, these are all uh, private channels, which means only people who are participating at the event will be able to see them. So please make sure that you have logged in uh, and authenticated Discord from your dashboard and that you were able to see the LF Grow chat and all the other channels on the screenshot. Uh, this is where you can go to get help uh, and have any information about, or just kind of keep up with any information about talks, uh, agenda, any changes, or, or just kind of how judging and everything else has worked um, directly. And this is also where you can get help. Uh, so if you go to the mentorship help channel, uh, you can ask your questions there and you'll also see channels for really specific protocols. So you can ask uh, the teams over there for help on how you use something or if you need to clarify, or if you are facing any bugs, uh, you can kind of get help in multiple places there. <laughs> on top of all of that, uh, for every talk workshop that's being hosted, you are also going to be receiving calendar invites. So you can quickly uh, see when everything is normalized to your own time zone and the entire event schedule is on our website. We really want this thing to be as asynchronous as possible, which means that even though we have people from so many different time zones, we understand that you may all not be available to, to uh, attend any talks uh, live, uh, whether it's through work or school obligations or anything else. So everything that we're doing as part of this event is going to be recorded, which means as soon as it ends, it will be available on our YouTube. And you can kind of find all these links, the agenda, what's upcoming, all the deadlines or any other changes uh, on our website. And you can just head over to lfcrow.eatglobal.com to get the latest information about everything on this event. So let's quickly talk about how the time zone or <laughs> the hackathon works. I'm also looking at questions from the audience. If you have any questions about the logistics, feel free to ask them here and I'll be able to uh, look and answer them for you. So the hackathon officially begins now, which means you can start building uh, as of uh, two hours, one, one and a half hours ago, uh, you can start working on your projects. Uh, you can have up to five members on your team and you have now the next nine days to hack and submit your projects. Submissions are due at 12 p.m., which is noon Eastern on Sunday, the 27th. So uh, this gives you nine days uh, to work on something, get help, give us feedback or ask for any feedback and kind of submit the projects and then judging will begin the day after. In terms of rules and criteria, the rules are, are fairly straightforward. Everything that you are submitting must be done from scratch, which means that anything that was done as part of a submission for this event uh, should have started today with a traceable and proper GitHub history. Uh, so you are allowed to use pre-existing libraries. We do not want you to reinvent the wheel. So if you have any open source libraries uh, that you uh, wanna put in or any other boilerplates that are available already, you are well, more than welcome to use that and start there to make uh, your lives easier. But uh, we, we will ensure that everybody else uh, has uh, done all the work just during the course of this event and not before. And uh, we will also, enforce that uh, people are not committing just the day before. So you should maintain a proper GitHub history uh, and any anything that we see that does not uh, look like it may be uh, uh, fully traceable or it was likely done before this event will be considered disqualified project. Uh, in terms of other things that we want to add, you have to use Lens Protocol as part of your submission. This is an event entirely about thinking about how Lens uh, Graph can be uh, introduced in uh, all of your different ideas. And only RSVP hackers will be eligible to win any prizes, which means that if you submitted a project and you did not have your team member listed officially on your dashboard at the time of your submission or right now, and you end up winning a prize, you will not be 
only the people who are listed on the team will be given the prize at the end. Uh, on top of that, there there can always be a different edge cases, and we totally understand that. So if you feel like something is uh, going to be different for you or your team, please email us, and we want to understand what that situation is and handle that accordingly. So reach out to anybody on the global team, preferably over email, and we'll be able to address your concerns from there. And of course, uh, there's a, a every gloomy question of what if I'm new to all this? There's a lot of you who are coming in uh, from the Web2 side, trying to understand what could be possible. And we also want to make sure that this is uh, a uh, an event that lets you uh, explore what could be possible. Uh, and this is totally OK to sort of use as an opportunity to understand um, what, what is out there. So what we recommend is you should head over to find a team channel if you're still looking for projects or other teammates or you want to join a project and you can offer a specific skill set. There's a lot of people here uh, already on Discord asking for uh, needing help with various uh, skills or specific expertise on different technologies. So if you are one of them, you can absolutely ping and reach out to any of those other members. And uh, we also encourage all of you to introduce yourself in the LF Crow chat channel. We, we we're curious to learn where everybody's from and what they're excited about. And of course, uh, it is totally okay to hack solo. You don't have to necessarily work on a team. If you prefer not having a team or if you would like to just use this as an opportunity for yourself to challenge yourself uh, to see what you can build, uh, that is totally okay too. And uh, a lot of you uh, have already attended the brainstorming and the uh, team matching sessions yesterday and earlier today. So uh, a lot of you uh, should have still kind of gotten all the information you need to understand what you can do to pair up with somebody if you're still looking for a team. And of course, there's a lot of talks and workshops and uh, there's a lot of amazing content for beginners. Uh, so, and, and people from every skill set. So we'll be making sure that you have an, a chance to kind of look up and catch up on all these things that come out of this event. So all these uh, talks, panels, and workshops will be uh, recorded and streamed. And uh, we also have a summit right after this thing. We have an amazing set of talks and speakers coming on. And we'll be kind of going through a lot of those details very soon. But uh, you can check out everything directly on Eats Global. So YouTube channel by heading over to youtube.com slash global. And for all the details around anywhere from judging to submission to the timelines to any criteria around how things are looked at, all that information is available on your info center, uh, which is also linked on a lot of the calendar invites and your dashboard. And uh, once again, the website is lfgrow.eatglobal.com. Uh, so another kind of uh, thing here is that if you missed any opportunity to uh, participate in the team building session, there's still a lot of people who are on Discord looking for teams, and you can uh, check out and catch up on what's happening on the Discord channels uh, for looking for a find a team channel and uh, start, start talking to people there. Uh, the reason we do the session as a Zoom call is to... Uh, allow for one or two opportunities to have everybody talk at the same time synchronously on a call uh, so you can have more context and then kind of go back and forth faster. But uh, depending on the demand, we'll look at addressing if there's a, another thing that we should do uh, today or tomorrow. Also, one thing to note is that there is a notion of a check-in for this event. So there'll be two quick check-ins next week on your dashboard. These are just uh, simple questions that we ask everybody on uh, understanding how things are going and this kind of lets you uh, lets us get give you the help uh, you need uh, which is anywhere from uh, understanding where you're blocked where you need help or if you are still stuck after a couple of days of anywhere from not getting somewhere or still not being able to understand if this something is possible uh, we get to route you to different uh, people uh, whether it's our partners or other developers out there or just being able to answer hey you should think about doing this instead or anything to unblock yourself. Your stake will also be returned as you respond to these check-ins. Again, these are just very simple forms and will appear on your dashboard early next week. And we'll also notify everybody over email and Discord that the check-ins are now available. Uh, it's just a way for us to understand how things are going. So nothing too formal uh, and just more of a, a mini survey. And submissions are due at 12 p.m. Eastern on the 27th. So this gives you nine days uh, to work on your projects and submit them on Sunday. And this kind of leads us to how judging is set up. So the judging, oh, I have a typo here. Judging happens on the 28th 
of March, not on the 14th. Um, and uh, judging is split into two different tracks. Uh, there's a main judging, which will be from 9, uh, 12 p.m. to 2.30 p.m. Eastern. And then there's sponsored judging for any prizes that you are applying for, which will be asynchronous. Uh, the way main judging works is you have four minutes to uh, demo and and submit, uh, record your kind of project. Uh, we will require video submission. So on Sunday, as you are submitting your projects, you will have to record it up to four minute video of what you have built and how everything works and who you are and sort of why you built it. And that is what will be used by all of the prizes consideration, as well as the uh, the judges at the, on, on Monday. And we really recommend that you don't do this thing last minute because uh, it will require you uh, some time to get anywhere from uh, the video right to seeing if you actually are able to put everything you can and you want to in a four minute uh, limit. So please kind of give at least one to two hours of just a buffer to make that submission happen. And uh, all these details again will be available on your dashboard. So you'll be able to do all of this thing uh, via your dashboard and we'll have the judging section on the info center be populated to give you all the, the nuances around how do you think about this thing, including examples from previous submissions that you can use as a reference. As for any sponsor judging for any prizes that you're going to be applying for, all that happens um, also via your dashboard and asynchronously. So on the submission form, uh, as you're submitting your projects, you'll be able to specify these are the prizes I'm going for. And based on which prizes you select, we will be sharing your projects with those uh, projects and uh, the, the protocols and they will be reviewing all those uh, videos as well and and reaching out to you if they have any questions but this will not be a live uh, session like the main judging so all of our partners and sponsors will look at uh, all, all of your uh, recorded videos and use that as a way to understand what's happening and they'll reach out to you if they need any clarification so all that happens asynchronously and of course i want to talk about the code of conduct uh, for this event uh, the rules and the code of conduct is uh, listed on eclobal.com slash rules, but the gist of it is that please be respectful and harassment and abuse at in any capacity will not be tolerated uh, at, in our community and we will take immediate action if we see somebody being disrespectful. Uh, also, if you have any kind of if you need any help or clarification, uh, please reach out to anybody on the global team, whether it's through Discord or email, um, and we will be able to uh, address any of your concerns or take action um, appropriately and, and immediately. So that covers all the logistics. Uh, I'll, I'll see if there are more questions coming in. But uh, without kind of further ado, I want to quickly take a second to talk about our partners and, and thank them for kind of being part of this event. So we have uh, we asked them to record a video about uh, kind of who they are, how everything uh, is set up on there and why they're excited to be kind of part of this event and, and why we're doing it together uh, with a lot of them. And uh, without further ado, I'd like to sort of welcome uh, Stani uh, from Lens to talk about Lens Protocol. Welcome everyone to the um, LF Pro Hackathon. Uh, this is an amazing opportunity to hack on the future of social media, uh, especially with the Web3 uh, components. So today's social media has uh, a lot of different kinds of challenges and um, uh, it's being built in a way where there isn't uh, much of a ability to contribute as a developer. And Lens Protocol uh, is gonna change that. It's going to change that in a way where uh, you as a developer can actually focus on building better uh, social media applications without uh, creating the network effect and the platform effect that normally you would have to to compete with uh, traditional social media uh, platforms essentially what lens protocol uh, is uh, it is a, um, a web3 social media protocol uh, that it's built completely on smart contracts meaning that the profile creation is tokenized as NFTs, followings, uh, relationships are tokenized as NFTs, and the protocol itself um, uh, has uh, modules, different kinds of follow logics, uh, collection logics, and also reference logics that can be uh, changed or uh, as a developer, you can contribute to create new ones. Uh, so the protocol is modul modularized uh, to various different kinds of use cases, and the idea is that uh, if uh, we have Web3 built in a common social graph, it means that 
you as a developer, uh, you can focus on actually building better user experience or, or, or focus on building social media application that focuses on particular um, uh, use case or a niche or uh, essentially uh, creating something completely new that uh, no one has thought about yet. Um, the, the protocol is very simple um, to, um, to use, and there is an API as well. So Lens API helps you to uh, do all the middleware uh, heavy lifting, so indexing uh, NFTs and, and getting the data that you actually need to build a uh, very amazing and beautiful uh, front end. We at this hackathon, we're looking to uh, see a lot of creativity, creativity in the design, uh, the user experience, and also in your idea. And also, I want to say that hackathons are the best places to, to uh, uh, meet new friends, and it's an experience. So essentially, you should whatever you're building, you should enjoy the process, uh, enjoy contributing, enjoy uh, building and, and exploring the, the Lens protocol itself. And also, if you need any kind of help, reach out to the global team, uh, reach out to our team. We're happy to help you. We're happy to brainstorm with you and support you. Thank you so much and have amazing time during the um, Earth Grow Hackathon. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Sunny. And uh, we'll, we'll uh, just hear from him in, in a few minutes. But uh, uh, the other one we want to talk about is Eric. I was going to talk about LivePeer. So without further ado, let's hear uh, how you can integrate LivePeer. Eric Tang, and I'm the co-founder and CTO at LivePeer. LivePeer is building the video streaming infrastructure for Web3. And we're really excited to be here at LF Grow, working with you all on decentralized social applications. And that's simply because well, in today's world, almost all popular social applications have a significant video feature. However, all of these applications have a broken underlining economic incentive layer. Right? Um, and part of the reason is because it's so complex and, and, and it costs so much money for the, on the infrastructure layer to build these types of applications uh, so that only companies with deep pockets can actually succeed. And as soon as these platforms get to a certain scale, they start to exhibit very strong anti-competitive behaviors and they start to hold their users and their data hostage. For example, if you are streaming on Twitch um, and you want to be able to make money on Twitch, then you have to sign up to be a Twitch partner, which means you promise that you, you will exclusively uh, stream on Twitch and not other platforms. Um, another thing that happens in these platforms is that they take arbitrarily high take rate. Right? YouTube is famously um, taking 50% of the take rate. Uh, and what that means is for every $2 uh, that YouTube makes, it only shares a dollar with their creators. Uh, for a platform that their entire application experience is to share creator content to their viewers, uh, this is a really high tax. In the Web3 world, um, all of this changes, right? And, and that's really rooted in the fact that users now own their content and they own their data. We're already seeing this happen where applications are built around this fact uh, and multiple applications are built on the same set of data. For example, the most popular uh, NFT application in the Web3 space, OpenSea, has only a 2.5% take rate. It's not because OpenSea wants to take an arbitrarily low take rate, but it's because uh, OpenSea simply does not own the user's data, right? And OpenSea needs to be competitive to all the other NFT platforms that are around the world. Now, we're just at the beginning of this evolution, right? And we're really excited to see what kind of ideas you, the hackers, are going to come up with. So LivePeer is offering a pri uh, prices that total up to $16,000. Uh, for this hackathon. Um, and we've also created uh, a LF Grow specific hacker quick start guide, uh, which was shared in the Discord channel. In there, you will find SDKs and tutorials and even code examples that you can clone and, and use that to help on your hack. So come find us in the Discord, tell us about your hacks. We'd love to, we'd love to help you uh, and uh, good luck.
Awesome. Thank you so much, Eric. And uh, yeah, I mean, this is one of the uh, interesting pieces, which is uh, we kind of when we talk about decentralized social media networks, we're usually looking at uh, like a Twitter alternative or just a way to think about uh, posting content. But there's so much more to think about in, in social content and media consumption. And just videos is a massive part of kind of everything is growing. So uh, I'm super excited to see how people think about ways to think on all these networks as uh, we look at different forms of media other than just text too. So uh, this should be really uh, fun. And I can't wait to uh, to see what everybody builds. All right, so let's go into all the prizes. So we're just at the tail end of the prize and we can go through the rest of it uh, with uh, our, our summit. So first up, I wanna talk about all the amazing prizes that you can win with Lens. So uh, without further ado, let's welcome Stani again to talk about all the prizes that you can win. GM all for all LF Pro hackers. So um, we have some interesting bounties to announce. Um, so we have um, uh, three tracks in, in total. So the track one is uh, the front end track. And the idea is to reward uh, the best implementation of a um, front end build on uh, top of the uh, lens protocol. So the first prize is 25. Um, uh, thousand uh, dollars worth of um, uh, price, and and the second one is ten thousand, and third is five thousand, and then we have uh, category prices, uh, one thousand two hundred fifty each, and different categories are audio curation, uh, matchmaking, social gaming, commerce, creator monetization strategies composable content forking, for example, if you create some sort of an interesting uh, meme template application on, on top of uh, Lens Protocol. And then we have uh, eight category is the uh, moderation. So essentially you can build any kind of a new uh, social media experience with the Lens Protocol. And, and based on the implementation uh, criteria, criteria such as the, the design, uh, how nice, the user experience is how beautiful the application is, novelty, uh, originality, uh, the technical accomplishment, how much effort you put there, uh, the potential impact, and of course, creativity and, and fun. Also, we have a um, uh, protocol track, so uh, 20,000 um, uh, for most creative new modules. So 5,000 for the follow module, 5,000 for the reference module, 7,000 um, first and, and 3,000 for the second uh, collect module. So here you can be very creative and uh, contribute directly to the lens protocol with these new modules and um, same criteria here and especially creativity, usability uh, is, is very uh, uh, valued. And then third track is the tooling, and that's 30,000 uh, for the bounties, 5,000 for uh, migrator to the best uh, web to vampire. So essentially creating a um, uh, migrator application where you can log in with your uh, existing web to uh, social media profile, uh, and then uh, be able to migrate your profile by creating a new profile and even migrating your previous post into the lens protocol. Also, 5,000 for the best marketplace for NFTs. Uh, so here we are looking also creativity, uh, efficiency, and usability as well. Uh, most creative, 5,000 for most creative use of uh, ML, so machine learning. Uh, so you could create different kinds of algorithms, follow algorithms, recommendation algorithms, uh, collect algorithms. 5,000 for the best feed algorithm, uh, 5,000 for DAO tooling. Uh, and uh, that could be helping DAOs to create uh, uh, DAO uh, Lens accounts and make uh, from multisig and 5,000 for Graph Explorer it could be dashboard visualization, something like Etherscan, but will be more of a Lens scan. So it's oh, it's 100,000 worth of bounties. So it's going to be very, very interesting. A lot of things to do, uh, enjoy um, and have fun. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tani. And uh, I know you went through a lot of the prizes uh, very fast, but uh, 
you can kind of take a screenshot here. Uh, just it's a break breakdown of everything that was just said. So it's gonna be first, second, third place prize, and there's gonna be a lot of tracks. So this is the front end track with fifty thousand in total for various different categories and modules. And then a second track for protocol specific things where you can create different modules and different variations of how you would think about any world uh, with how these modules should be changed from how Web2 is structured. So it's 20,000 for, for this side. And then there's a whole big massive section on tooling. Uh, tooling just gets me excited every time, but uh, there's a lot of things you can do here in any of these categories to uh, win any of these prizes. And don't worry, this is not the only place where all the prizes are. You can head over to our, our prizes page, which I'll link uh, uh, very shortly to get all these details, including documentation and links and uh, even videos on how to get started. So next up, I wanna talk about LivePeer and we'll have Paige from LivePeer talk about all their prizes. Hi, Pierre, and I'm going to talk to you about the prizes we're offering for building the future of decentralized social media with Live Peer. Do you think video is core to the future of social media? Want to create the next decentralized Twitch, YouTube, or TikTok? Live Peer is Web3's open and decentralized video infrastructure layer, and we make it easy for you to store and stream video in your application. As a presenting sponsor for LF Grow, LivePeer is offering $16,000 in prizes, $4,000 for the best Web3 video creator social platform like YouTube or Instagram, $4,000 for the best video streaming social platform like Twitch, $4,000 for the best short form video social platform like TikTok, and finally, $4,000 pool prize for pro projects that integrate with LivePeer. Remember, you need to have completed a live peer integration in order to be eligible for a prize. We're excited to see what you build and we're here to help. Sign up for a product session with me or time with one of our engineers to help with your integration. Good luck, have fun. Awesome. So just to summarize, uh, LivePeer is offering $16,000 in total, one for best social creator platform, one for best streaming social platform, and best short form video. So there's a lot of video related things that we can do here. And there's also a pool prize, 4000 which means anybody who uses uh, LivePeer will split this amount equally. Then we have Polygon Studio. So the best social media DAP built on Polygon will be receiving 5000 uh, The best DAP that uses uh, Web3 identity uh, as its core will be receiving 3000 for the first place. And the best implementation of Polygon Finity Design in ADAPT will receive 3000 and the best following five dApps uh, that leverage Polygon specifically will win 1000 each. Then you also have Lit Protocol, which is a way to think about um, how do you actually make uh, give consent to your data uh, across uh, different audiences. So the best private data solution on Lens uh, will receive $4,000 for using Lit. Uh, then we have the graph uh, and the best use of existing subgraphs uh, and integrating that into a new social network will receive 1500 and the best new subgraph creation as part of this event will receive $2,000 in total. The first place gets 1500 and the runner up gets 500. And we also have Chainlink uh, offering $4,000 in link tokens to the top five projects or $5,000 uh, into top five projects that use Chainlink for their projects. And then we have Ceramic. And Ceramic is uh, offering $2,000 for the best social app that also integrates Ceramic uh, network and the SDK into their app for managing uh, data. And uh, the best integration that uses NFT DID account types uh, will also receive $2,000. And we also have Toucan Protocol. So Toucan Protocol is offering $4,000 in total for the best use of uh, tools and networks that sort of bring in carbon markets on chain, uh, especially as part of these interactions. And uh, this is going to be an exciting one to see how people think about using these things uh, in, in new ways of thinking about Web3 platforms. And just to kind of summarize, all these things are available on lfgrow.youthglobal.com slash prizes. You can see all the details, documentations, and boilerplates for getting started with all of these uh, protocols. So finally, before we get into our, our summit, I want to just remind everybody to uh, pace yourself. We really don't want this thing to be exhausting for you. This is very much about learning and experimentation. We really want you to have fun. So uh, we're kind of bringing in new technologies and protocols to see how everything uh, can be uh, in the future. And this is an event where 500 of you are going to uh, really try every different variation of everything that you can see that excites you. So uh, without further ado, I want to Welcome and congrats to all of you for being part of this event. Happy hacking, and uh, we'll see you all on our Discord. And with that, we are ready for our summit. 
So we have an amazing day packed for, for all of you. Uh, just to give a quick overview, we're going to talk about just jumping into uh, what we think about the future of decentralized social media looks like with Lee Jin, Stani, and, and Balaji Srinivasan. Uh, we're going to give a more detailed technical architectural interview of how Lens Protocol is set up. Uh, we're also then talk about other ways to think about new ways social networks should grow from the protocol side and what we can do to extend them. Um, then uh, we'll talk about just how we think future of on-chain creation and collaboration looks like if you have a social identity that can be uh, commuted and composed. Uh, we're going to have Juan Benet and Jonathan uh, Doden talk about just unstoppable thoughts and how we actually think about data preservation in this context of everybody having access to everything um, always on chain. And we also want to talk about just the impact uh, of how we think about public goods uh, and uh, carbon credits and climate uh, and how that integrates with uh, Web3 specifically, but with social impact at scale. And lastly, we're going to talk about how anywhere from tooling to collaboration to ideas that we can think about on making it easy to work with DAOs. So uh, let's get started. I want to bring on uh, our three amazing panelists, uh, Stein Kulichov, Lee Jin from Variant and Balaji Srinivasan from 2029 as our panelists. Um, I want to welcome all of you here. I'd like to ask you to turn on the videos. And now uh, we'll talk about our round three of basically decentralized social media. We've, this has been a very active conversation we've had with, uh, with a lot of you here. And uh, kind of the goal is to kind of finally see that this is now being put into action. Uh, a lot of it from our learnings from uh, these chats before. And uh, I want to quickly uh, ask everybody to uh, give a quick introduction on themselves and who, uh, who you are and, and what you do. So I'll start with uh, Lee. Um, would love to kind of understand uh, who you are for the audience uh, to know, and then we'll go with Balaji and Stani. Hey, everyone. Um, Lee here, and I am a general partner at Variant Fund. We are a first check crypto fund investing in the ownership economy, really of the belief that crypto enables digital ownership, which facilitates new user experiences across the board in a variety of different categories. Um, I've been a consumer investor for many years. I previously um, spent four years at A16Z covering consumer networks, including social networking, marketplaces, and other kinds of multi-sided networks. And then um, I left in 2020 to start my own fund, investing in the future of online work and the creator economy. So it's really nice to be here with everyone today. Amazing. Um, Balji would love uh, you to give a brief intro. <laughs> Sure. Yeah. Um, I'm Balaji Srinivasan, former CTO of Coinbase, uh, former general partner at Anderson Horowitz, investor in a bunch of Web3 things, Twitter. And without further ado, Stani. Um, I'm Stani Kulachov. I'm the uh, uh, founder and CEO of, of, of Aave. So um, we're a team that we that uh, builds and creates uh, Web3 protocols. Um, and, and over the past years, uh, I would say past five and a half years, I've been building um, uh, decentralized finance. Um, and, and now we, we have built the Lens protocol and kind of like a, creating more tools for developers to uh, build the, uh, the future of Web3 uh, social. Um, I think myself as a uh, kind of like a more of a technologist and, and uh, curious community member, uh, and I'm super excited about the uh, the hackathon here, especially hearing that we have over 500 hackers, which is insane. Uh, so um, yeah, that's that's my introduction. Pleasure to be here. Well, we're excited to have all of you here. So um, I want to start off by just kind of uh, being uh, just kind of understanding how each of us interpret that when we say decentralized social media. This means different things to all of us. Uh, and kind of just jumping right in, uh, I want to start with Balaji and kind of get your understanding on when I say decentralized social media, when somebody says this, how do you think about that? And what does that mean to you? Sure. So, I mean, the way I think about it is if you think about Bitcoin, Bitcoin's backend is open and PayPal's is not. You can print out every Bitcoin transaction that's ever happened. Um, everybody in the world can do that with a computer and internet connection, just download the blockchain and do it. But you cannot do that for PayPal. It wasn't set up that way. Only the PayPal engineers have root on their database. And so that's why I think of what blockchains are is uh, they're the next step after open source. You go, uh, they're not just open source. You also have open state and open execution. Open state meaning the backend is open and public. Basically every 
um, every record can be printed, not necessarily every row in a database because it's not a SQL structured thing, but every, every record in the blockchain can be printed. And it's also open execution where if you run a node, um, you are able to see every opcode and insofar as people didn't trust a ranking algorithm of some kind, the decentralized social media implementation of that, people could run the equivalent of a decentralized Twitter node or Facebook node to actually interrogate the opcodes and actually see that the ranking algorithm is not shadow banning them or biased in one way or another way or, or that it is. And so once you have an open backend, once you have open state and open execution, here's some things you could do. For example, if you had a properly decentralized Twitter, you could print all tweets, you could load them into a database, print all tweets that are a particular string, print the entire social graph, sort every follower by the number of tweets they like. You could do sentiment analysis. You could send end-to-end -end encrypted messages to other users using their public-private key pairs. And perhaps most importantly, you could integrate this with every aspect of your backend. Just It basically sits next to your Postgres because your slice of an open state database is actually yours. You have root on it. It's more like your space on AWS or, or GitHub than your space on Twitter. It's much less locked down, much less restricted by API. So that just completely changes how you build because so much engineering time is spent ma maintaining flaky integrations with these social media APIs, which can basically just deplatform you at any time. And, and protocols are just much more, much more potentially reliable and stable than that. Um, and and that's that's what this this space means to me. Amazing. I think you ended up prefacing the rest of the, the set of questions as well. Uh, we'll see if we can go deep into any of these topics, but uh, uh, what is I with Lee? Like, uh, uh, how do you think about this thing and how much of this do you uh, agree or, or disagree with uh, Baji's views or rather disagree nuances on? Yeah, I, I would echo everything that Balaji just mentioned. Um, I think it's interesting to consider decentralized social networking um, in contrast to the current state of social networking, which is extremely centralized. Um, so today, the state of the world is one in which there's essentially a very small handful of centralized social networking companies that effectively control all of the means of content production and distribution for all of the users in the world. And that really is predicated um, or is due to the fact that the data and content and basically like all of the identity and relationships and, and every piece of data created by these users is privately owned by that handful of companies rather than being publicly accessible as an open utility or um, through that open state as Balaji was mentioning. And so the implication of that is that the existing social networking paradigm is actually quite coercive, where as a participant um, in this landscape, if you want to be able to reach people or participate in content creation that reaches anyone, you really have to go through this handful of centralized gatekeepers in order to do that. Um, so I think of decentralized social networking really as the opposite of all of that, where um, if we start with the base layer of open state, then um, you could have many different developers all building different applications and interfaces on top that showcase that information in different ways and compete with each other to offer the best user experience. Um, and there could be a proliferation of different discovery algorithms or um, different content moderation approaches um, that really serve up different types of social experiences to users. Um, so I think that's a really exciting vision um, of the world. And the implication then is that users would have a lot more choice and agency in the systems in which they're participating. Absolutely, and uh, and Stani, without further ado, yeah, yeah I I, <laughs> I I definitely think there's like uh, kind of like a, what what's been echoed is that uh, you know decentralized social media it creates a lot of um, uh, choices uh, choices for the users choices for the developers, and you know the way we have built Web two is uh, we got this like enormous efficiency by. Uh, centralizing a lot of data and making it as efficient as possible, um, and then using that data to, to basically um, uh, knowing and understanding what the users want and and, and selling them to. And the, the kind of like a uh, difficult task here is that you always need to follow this particular model uh, when you build a social media uh, business or application, and you don't have many choices there. So what decentralized social media uh, helps, especially from the uh, builder's perspective, is that you actually can, as a builder, uh, uh, when you have this um, kind of like a social graph 
as a public good. And you can focus on actually building um, that particular user experience that you, you want to achieve or uh, certain use case um, or, or maybe certain kind of like, um, uh, I would say, uh, uh, build an application with certain values. For example, maybe you are more interested in, in building more humane uh, social media or making it more private or um, maybe the future of social media for your uh, user base might not be uh, what's your reach of followers uh, in the crab uh, in the in the graph but maybe um, you know the quality of those followers and how much engaged there are and when you will have to create a new social media application from others perspective you need to build this big platform effect uh, and and to compete with the users and get those network effects and in web3 social what I um, kind of realized is that uh, if you make you know this particular piece as a public good and everyone is uh, pretty much sharing resources which with each other um, uh, the networking the data uh, what happens is that you can just switch your focus on on whatever you want to build so you have more choices as a uh, builder but at the same time, it's kind of like a waterfall effect going towards also to the end user, meaning that as a user, you can start actually voting with your, uh, I will not say voting with your feed, I would say voting with your wallet uh, and your lens maybe profile uh, amongst those applications, which actually serve you the most. And that might be the user experience you're looking for on the same uh, content distribution um, uh, platform, or it might be just an algorithm you prefer more to use even within the same application because you are not uh, stuck anymore on, on building towards the same uh, mode. For example, you might have users that are more interested in actually discovering new content uh, or maybe just getting more um, deeper content on particular uh, topics. And this allows developers to actually, you know, like maybe first time ever to comp compete with, with big social media uh, platforms like um, Twitter, Instagram, and, and, and Facebook, and so forth, because essentially everyone who is building on top of a same graph are actually growth hacking for each other. And that's like the kind of like a uh, value proposition from, from my perspective. And there's a lot, of, lot to be said about the ownership. So you are essentially uh, building something that is owned by the users. Uh, you own your profile. Uh, you own your connection with the, with the audience, especially with the uh, uh, NFTs. And, and then you can actually take, the, take that audience uh, kind of like elsewhere or you, you can meet them in another application. So there's definitely like a lot of uh, advantage there and also compatibility. Maybe now that we have this common, uh, I would say like a graph, maybe we'll see application that uh, couldn't be built before because no one is actually in Web2 social media sharing those resources uh, on, on this Kind of like a scale and I, I think that's a very big uh opportunity for for now uh, all the uh, developers who are uh, building social now absolutely i mean i think we're, we're all sort of echoing similar themes here which is a good premise to think about alternatives and uh and anabology you've written a lot on this uh, in the past on just anywhere from how to exit twitter to uh, uh just what a good alternative would look like so maybe my kind of question to you is uh, what do you particularly disagree with sort of how existing Web2 uh, large kind of consumer social platforms are, are set up with and what do you think they can do better? Uh, we kind of understand the sense of resistant argument, but what else kind of goes in, in, in that? Sure. So, you know, censorship resistance is one way of thinking about it, but a, I think a better way of thinking about it, because censorship resistance seemed like more of an edge case, much less so today, but an even better way of thinking about it is in terms of digital property rights. And one way of thinking about that is in the 2000s, um, the deal that social networks were offering seemed too good to be true or is an amazing deal because, you know, you had free... They gave you free distribution to everybody in the world and hosting and all of these content creation tools. And you just had to bring yourself and hit some keys. And relative to the 1980s, for example, or the, even the early 90s, when distribution was very scarce and you, you know, to be on TV was this huge thing. Now anybody could you know, stream on YouTube or post on Blogger or Twitter or Facebook or what have you. This was this huge, huge, huge thing. So initially that was a great deal. But as time went on, um, now that's become actually sort of considered the standard package. And now what has happened is basically uh, rather than being neutral platforms, these platforms have a huge thumb on the scale. 
and lots of people are, you know, whether it's YouTube's ad apocalypse or there people are getting downranked in search results, or, you know, there's various issues where as more of life has now gone digital, people don't have a share of uh, what they're creating and they don't have control over their digital presence, which becomes more and more and more important as it becomes a larger percentage of your life. One question I asked people is what percentage of your hours are spent, your waking hours are spent looking at a screen and people you know, realize, wait, it's actually more than 50% often for many people, for many information workers. So most of your life, your remaining life will be spent in the matrix in some way. And if you don't have root over the matrix, if you can just be boom, just basically locked in a box in that matrix and all the doors are closed and your money is taken away and you know, you're silenced like that scene from black mirror where the guy is just mass blocked and nobody can, can hear him anymore. That's actually possible if somebody has root and then those people wouldn't even be able to hear you. Uh, and, and you just be totally powerless. And so, you know, against that, uh, the alternative is, for people to have control and to have economic rights. And that control means private keys and the economics also means private keys. So it's it's both the freedom and the prosperity. Those are kind of, you know, they, they, they go together. People talk about the freedom in terms of censorship resistance, but it's also the prosperity in terms of digital property rights. The reason that's so important is crypto creators will be so much bigger than even internet influencers because they get a direct cut of what they create. Billions of people are not getting a cut of what they create. When they do, they're going to create a lot more of it. And it's going to be a lot more useful because they're going to be doing it in return for cryptocurrency and not simply likes and RTs and so on and so forth. I think the internet looks very different when that happens. Um, and I think we need to accelerate that. Absolutely. No, I, I think, uh, and by the way, if uh, Leah, Sonny, if you, any of you have any things to add on, just feel free to jump in. I, I don't want this to be like a take your turn type of uh, it's a setup. Uh, but uh, I think you touched on a really awesome uh, kind of theme here. And, and Lee, you've written a lot about this as well, which is just kind of how does this turn uh, everybody into an ownership sort of side of the economy here. So I'd love to kind of hear your thoughts on what changes in this world and how do we think about marketplace versus social apps or are they the same in this context? Yeah, so I really like to ground a discussion about um, the shortcomings um, of the existing social media platforms in kind of the concept of user freedom, um, where today it's a fact that network effects, the combination of network effects plus closed data is a recipe for user coercion. Um, and a lot of people will say, but creators and users are free to just you know, exit from these platforms, choose not to use them. You can delete your Facebook account, whatever. But I think people who, who say that users have a choice, I think it's actually quite hollow because there is this pool towards these platforms because they control and represent um, so much distribution and network effects that are proprietary to these platforms. And so this has created all sorts of issues um, for users and creators in the current social media paradigm. I recently wrote um, a blog post called The Creator Economy is in Crisis, kind of outlining really the parallel, um, the parallels between the gig economy and how it's turned out, as well as the creator economy, where the gig economy had made all of these promises to, to the supply side about being your own boss, um, kind of being free to work on your own terms whenever you wanted, and obviously didn't quite live up to that because the platforms, the apps, controlled really every level of detail of how the supply side actually was able to work, ranging from pricing to intermediating the customer relationship to determining whether or not you could even work on the platform at all. Um, and a similar set of issues are now arising on the social media platform social media platforms with respect to creators, where you have this exploitation of creator labor, um, this underlying insecurity because the algorithms and discovery is really controlled unilaterally by the platforms, as well as intermediation of all of the relationships with one's audience. Um, and the result of that is that you have this entire class of social media creators who exist in this um, kind of state of economic peril where they at any moment can lose their livelihood and access to their customer base. Um, so I, I think that's a huge issue today. Um, so I very much agree with Balaji that like the current state of um, the creator economy and the economy that has arisen from these social media platforms, it's, it's not just about freedom, but there's a huge part of the economic opportunity that is lacking because people really don't have a choice in 
the platforms that they're participating in. Uh, absolutely. I think uh, maybe one kind of question that we get uh, all the time is um, if uh, nobody disagrees with anything that's been said, but uh, I guess the question is like, how do we think about um, whether it's psychologically or from an experience standpoint, uh, how things would look like if everything was tracked and it feels too transactional, like does that take away any of the experience or how people look at any from consuming information to interacting with uh, anyone from their peers to their friends? Like, is that an actual fair kind of counter to uh, having everything tracked and just being, being at, at your own sort of mercy of understanding how you parse that information because it exists? There's, there's both good and bad about that. I think um, the good is that all of these basically unmonetized actions, people are, you know, if you think about it, like the Netflix CEO once said something like, our competition is the time you spend, you know, having a drink of wine with your significant other or something like that, right? And that's because basically there's 24 hours in a day and they're just essentially fighting to take as much of your time as possible. And these loops are built to be as addicting as possible. And that is something that benefits that centralized company. And you know, the thing is, on the one hand, you can appreciate how hard it is to build these companies. It is really hard. But then you can also you know, appreciate that it's actually extremely um, difficult to, uh, to have something where you know, you've got a loop like that, which has been optimized for addictiveness on many people, and it's draining so much time, and then not have that be compensated in some way. And so, so that's a good part is now people actually get compensated for their time. The bad part is, as you say, things become more transactional. I think on balance, though, there's some good to that too. And the reason is so much on social media is empty posturing, so much, you know, is hostility and so on. You know, it's funny, like when my friend said, wow, there's all these you know, if I was a teenager, there's all these famous people, you know, that are online and what do people decide to do when they're kids? A lot of them decide to just troll these famous people rather than go and be like, Hey, you know, I'm also into art and this is a great artist. Maybe they can, you know, teach me something. And here's, you know, like, that's like a much more positive kind of thing. And I think you could, you might be able to get more of that if there's more mechanisms for economic alignment, as opposed to simply like zero sum status. Right. And so, uh, so that's, you know, th those are some of the things I think about where I think on balance, there's certainly negative. Some relationships become more transactional. We'll probably see also, uh, once everything has a price, um, you're going to see a lot of things that you didn't think of as being priceable now have a price like sentiment. You know, people will be able to trade memes and hashtags. And so you'll be able to short and say this social movement, I actually don't think it's going to have staying power. I think people are going to basically sell on this and probably that'll be like a, like a social market alongside it. Lots of unpredictable consequences. So I can't say I know every you know, aspect of what's going to happen, but I think on balance, it's probably better to add some degree of scarcity to the mix here because otherwise that scarcity is hidden and it basically exists as root on somebody's server um, instead of put that back into people's hands. No, that, that's yeah, I, Go ahead. Yeah, I want to add there because uh, it's, it's actually fascinating because like normally when you look at how uh, all this kind of like Web3 uh, platforms work, you know, you have databases and, you know, you have data in, in someone's, in one company's, you know, database and it's valuable, you know, but that data is valuable for, for kind of like a that uh, party and, and the stakeholders that, that is, that the data is shared. And, and essentially uh, what happens is that it's the users that are constantly giving up that interactional uh, data and, and kind of like a, uh, signaling what, uh, you know, what kind of things uh, you like in life. And it's, it's a vast amount of data, but, you know, the, the value is captured there, in, in my opinion. So I have this like one theory that the value is, is going towards uh, those stakeholders and, and this uh, monetization system and, and the users, like we kind of ha have built previously a system where, you know, the, the users are there to use the product and, and they're the, the customers. And we're just shifting in a place now uh, and an environment where Actually, it's, uh, you know, these networks and protocol are built for the users uh, and it's meant for them and the value should go, you know, back to the users. And, and, and it's a really interesting because uh, in uh, blockchain, what, what is happening, actually, you, have, you might have the same information of value as you would have in a traditional uh, data systems. 
but that data is kind of like, you know, it's um, accessible maybe, but also it's in a uh, ledger that is distributed. And you might argue a bit even like in a way that's uh, because you have the same data in a distributed system uh, and, you know, that you have this kind of like a um, transparency there, but also the access rights, for example, that um, you might be able to transfer that value or interact with that value or you as a member of the community that builds a bit more uh, value into that. And I think uh, uh, there's definitely like a couple of uh, I I issues here. One is that, you know, we in Web3, we transact quite a lot in public. We, we love transparency uh, and we love seeing new information and, and what people are doing and using then, then it's kind of like up to us building application to use that value in a way where uh, we uh, create better applications for us, better user experience, but also like use the data in a way it's, it's beneficial back to the users. But in the first place, we're we are already getting part of that uh, value anyways. But if there is, for example, an application that it has been built on top that actually, for some reason, um, you know, you don't, you're not aligned uh, with how the algorithm processes your data or um, uh, like how it collects some inf additional information, it's so easy to just uh, change the application and have the similar experience. So I guess like taking that uh, big layer the, the, the social graph and, 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 and decentralizing a lot of components of, of social media, it creates a, a, an environment where, you know, those platforms and, and values, they have to compete. So you actually are competing uh, not only with the user interactions, but uh, with their values. And you want to be aligned with the users because if you as a, you know, um, social media application developer, uh, you're not aligned with the users, uh, you will essentially lose them to somewhere else because it's very easy to create a new application when, when you have this kind of like a shared resources. And I think this should some way drive the, the, um, this kind of like a, a competition on, you know, listening to the community more better and, and also the, the users, you know, maybe now it's time to actually even the off-chain algorithms to, to actually kind of like express uh, what those algorithms are what kind of data they use and how they are actually good for you. And if you don't do that, what happens is someone else will do that and they can spin up very quickly. And I think this will, this is the radical kind of like a change here that we have the opportunity from the developer and user level to actually uh, create a new ecosystem, make things better. And uh, you're not tied into the system. And this is something that, um, what Lee mentioned that, um, you know, if, if you lose your account in, in Twitter, kind of like for some reason, or you're afraid that's like your living hood. But now you have the, you have the basically the, the, the value and it's up to all these uh, uh, applications to show you how you can get most out of it. Absolutely. Yeah, as I say, I think um, maybe a question for Lee and Balaji. What, what would you say the ingredients are for like a really good alternative that's crypto and Web3 native uh, for just think about new social platforms? And I think that'll cater us for the rest of the, the conversation. What are the or what are the, uh, the, the that are out there? Uh, sorry, the ingredients for a good alternative to um, a Web three native social media platform. I mean, I, I do think the single most important is crypto identity, whether it's ENS or Solana names or um, you know like Urbit or a bunch of other things that are out there, right? And um, the reason for that is if you you know we, we're going to probably need a better term than connect wallet. Uh, because it kind of sounds like this thing's just going to drain your money or whatever, right? Probably going to you know, need something like that. But if you've seen like web one, web two, web three, like web one is username, password, web two is login with Google, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, et cetera. And then web three is currently connect wallet, MetaMask or, or something like that. That portable identity is way more important than I think many people think, because when identity becomes portable, backends become liquid. Like you could have the, if it's truly one click, and you could truly log into a new service as easily as you load a new web page. Um, that means the billion user tables suddenly become liquid. These gigantic ice blocks that are Facebook's database and Twitter's database of all these users where there's lock-in, those all become liquid and can flow between platforms potentially as easily as just clicking. And uh, we, you know, the thing is that when you talk about something like that, it's kind of like the transition from taking photographs with 
you know, cameras, taking photographs with digital cameras. At first, digital cameras were clunkier in some ways than normal cameras. They had worse resolution. If you remember the first iPhone camera, that wasn't the first digital camera, but the first iPhone camera was much worse than a typical, but it was, was portable and it was everywhere. And so people used it a lot. It got better and now it's way better, right? And so the same way, like once Web3 identity hits that flippening and it is, you know, it's got you know, millions of users now, hundreds of millions, if you include all holders, I don't know how many millions of ENS users are, but once that's there, and once you have like services are built for that first, um, eventually, and it'll take a while because there's a lot of momentum in these things by 2020, not 2025, but let's say late 2020s, maybe 2030, you have a crypto phone where that's built in and you have identity that's actually, you know, fundamentally on your private keys. And people wonder how it could have been any other way because your identity is linked to your money and all your digital property. And how could we have ever lived where it was on corporate servers? Once that happens, now exit, digital exit becomes much more powerful. That means these big services don't have as much lock-in. They need to actually, you know, fight for their bread every single day, which is good when it's a huge corporation, it should be doing that, providing a service to people. And then what happens is, that's why I said, you know, what's the scarce resource of each decade, right? The 2000s, it was bandwidth. And the 2010s, because of social, it was attention. The 2020s, I think it's block space, just figuring out technically how to put all this stuff on chain. And then when we've liquefied every single big company back end with Web3, in the 2030s, I think the scarce resource will be loyalty. That is to say, every single community, because people can leave at a moment's notice, they're going to actually need to provide something that is more than simply utility. They're going to need to provide value to their community. And I think so that's where the 2030s go. That's loyalty. So seeing ahead a little bit. Uh, yeah. Um, Thanks for the alpha, Ali. <laughs> Uh, I, 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 there's a good post. Uh, one of my friends wrote this called the billion user table on this. Uh, John Stokes wrote this post, which explains that thesis in a little more detail. Uh, one quick follow, just just uh, as you kind of talked about entity, were you just like, is the argument that it's a propagation game and not anything else? Like, are, are you just fundamentally saying we just need more people and that's when you can actually do a mass mover? Or, or yeah, is it? Okay. I, think, I mean, well, I think what's here's the thing you can do, and this is something I've been thinking about. At I, what I want to see are vampire attacks on, you know, Twitter's like user base, Facebook's user base, like LinkedIn, et cetera. Like, in the sense of just like, you know, sushi swap, like, you know, I'm, I'm pro Uniswap. Um, you know, I think Hayden's a pioneer and so on and so forth. I think in a macro sense, it is good that that vampire attack occurred because it made, you know, Uniswap do like a token and so on and kind of good things happened, I think, overall as a function of that, right? You know, when, when protocols compete, you win, right? Um, and so like effectively vampire attacks, once you get to a certain scale, you could do something where let's say you have a million people with an ENS social network or SNS social network or something like that, Urbit social network, whatever that is, that's working, right? Um, they all have a hundred friends. And so they could decide, okay, this thing is working. We, you know, what's our growth strategy? Our growth strategy is we invite the heck out of our friends and we do the following. Um, uh, proof of spurn. Okay. So proof of spurn um, means that you are posting, let's say a tweet or a post or something that is like your last post, your tombstone post on that social network. And so long as that's up your tokens or whatever vest in this new thing, but any further action that you take publicly on that social network means that you haven't actually exited from it, right? So something like that would sort of be like, you know, proof of exit or proof of spurn or something like that, where you spurned the old web two network for the new one. And if you get a bunch of people to do that collectively, you're like, you know, Moses parting the Red Sea, right? You get collective exit, collective migration, sort of like the mass migration of people to Miami, just, you know, SF is done and now we're, we're all moving together, right? Um, and I think you're going to see something like that online, uh, where it's like a community migration. And then social networks actually start becoming community aware because there's a culture to that community. Once you have tokens integrated with social networks, you know, right now, you know, like people don't really care if someone moves from Twitter to Facebook to Instagram or whatever. They don't, they don't really have a, a culture, but people definitely do care if you move from Bitcoin to Ethereum to Solana to something else like that. Once crypto tribalism is integrated with social networks, those are truly online digital tribes that have a lot of community and association. And I think that's going to be very important for the world to come, both, both in positive and negative ways. 
Amazing. I, I think um, this is like a perfect time to kind of think about or, or rather ask Tani on just what, what made you start Lens and can you talk about sort of just overall um, how do you address all these things that we brought up uh, and, and historically consistently have been brought up about the, the criticisms of existing social platforms? Yeah, I, I, well, the, the start of the Lens, I, I think it was more of like an accident in the sense that we, uh, we were um, kind of like helping out in a, in a uh, NFT auction contract and realized that um, actually one of our de developers realized that you can like beyond the current NFT standard, there's a lot of things you can actually do, a lot of cool things. Um, and uh, if you innovate on, on the smart contract area and from there kind of like we noticed that uh, one of the ways to do, you can actually, uh, of course, like tokenization NFT profiles, but also you can create dynamic uh, content, dynamic NFTs. And essentially we, we ended up um, testing a model where uh, you have this kind of like a follow NFT. So uh, if I'm following uh, Balaji, I'm the number one follower, the, the number one fan, I get the token ID one. And if there is, let's say 10,000 followers, uh, you know, all of those follow relationships are token as an NFT. So if I go into my any wallet, uh, OpenSea and look at that follow NFT, it reflects kind of like the latest content of uh, Balaji. So if there's a picture of a cat and reposting a picture of a dog, the content changes. So essentially like we realized that uh, actually like trying just having this experimentation, um, you know, you create this um, kind of like a permissionless distribution channel between you uh, and your audience. And this could be a pretty cool thing for uh, wider Web3 Social. And of course, like in our team, like uh, Web3 Social was something that uh, was very fascinating. Uh, in, and, and, you know, we're always looking what to innovate in larger uh, Web3 space because we see kind of like Web3 space as an economy. So there's decentralized finance, but also in economy, um, uh, you have e-commerce, you have social, you have uh, creator economy and, and all these different parts but you need a, like a value network to transact. So uh, whether, it's, whether it's like a monetary value uh, or social value or uh, something, you know, that we didn't even realize that is, is considered valuable until we, we put it in uh, on chain. And um, I, I think for us, like uh, approaching the whole like Web3 social uh, was somehow um, important to approach from the developer perspective and, and see kind of what kind of ideas we will have because what they learned from the, the Aave protocol experience and previously in, in DeFi is that you never, you're never you never like building by yourself. You're building as a community and ecosystem and you, you basically want to uh, grow together. And that's kind of like, I, I think uh, Lens protocol is, is very fascinating uh, protocol, but I, I'm pretty sure the, the stuff that will be um, built during this hackathon will be way more uh, cooler and our protocol becomes the, the boring uh, kind of like a backend. And I'm also like expecting that people will build those uh, migrators or vampire attack in you know, some very classy, nice uh, way. Amazing. Um, Lee, I think uh, I want to tap into something you said earlier in one of your answers. And uh, I, I mean, I would love to kind of get a glimpse of uh, what you think the set of opportunities is in Web3 to kind of let people choose their own algorithms. Yeah, I think obviously um, in the past few months and years, there's been a ton of criticism over the existing state of social media and whether they take too heavy of a hand in content moderation or too light a hand, um, like they're blamed for all kinds of social ills and events that have transpired in the past few years, um, really because there is only one content moderation policy that can be upheld at a given time on a given platform. Um, and it's built in this very monolithic way. So I think the opportunity is really for users to be able to choose among a set of different options available to them in terms of type of content they would like to see, type of discovery experience they would like to participate in, um, and ultimately choose an experience that maps to um, like that maps to their beliefs or views and, and degree of um, discoverability and content moderation. I think that is, that is kind of the North Star goal of decentralized social media. I think there's also obviously a lot of um, downsides to that potentially as well that probably don't get addressed often enough, which is 
um, you know, if the existing social media um, paradigm has created all of these filter bubbles, then a more decentralized social media landscape would probably enable that even more, where people would opt into the set of discovery algorithms or the set of content moderation policies that best corroborate their existing viewpoints. Um, a thought experiment that I like to pose to people is, do they believe that existing social media platforms have prolonged the pandemic? Usually the answer that I hear is yes. Like you can imagine a world, you know, pre-social media and a world, the current world in which we do have social media, in which world would the pandemic have lasted this long or would the pandemic be longer? And most people agree that social media as it currently stands has proliferated misinformation about the pandemic and the vaccine, et cetera. So in a world in which users are opting into their own algorithms, um, I'm not sure how to solve a problem like that, to be honest. Um, I think it's one of the open questions around the next generation of social media. Yeah, the, the tricky part, there's, I'd give kind of a couple of comments on that. One issue is that it's not that like necessarily the centralized government sits so well on it either, right? Like that's, mm -hmm. you know, one of the issues is that, um, you know, especially in the West, people either react with apathy, they react with apathy first and then panic, right? They only have kind of two modes. And so like the sober, careful, like, okay, let's do vaccines, but not say it's just the flu nor triple mask after vaccines. That's sort of like, you know, kind of scientifically reasonable sort of thing was, was not as much there. And um, so it's not obvious to me that the centralized authority will get the right answer. If it gets a wrong answer, it's catastrophically wrong. And so you might tolerate um, some people getting it wrong in order for at least one of those solutions to be correct. There's more system robustness, even if there's more loss in an average case, there's less loss in an extreme case. And, you know, the other thing I'd say, by the way, is, you know, with Spanish flu in, you know, 19, you know, 17, 1918-ish, um, that was something which was heavily censored by governments. It's kind of the opposite of today, because like states were gaining power at that time rather than kind of losing power. That media was centralizing rather than decentralizing. And it was actually a much more lethal virus uh, by everything we can see, it had like about 100 million dead. You know, COVID-19 is not nothing. It's going to be about 10 million dead worldwide, you know, when all is said and done, if we're lucky and no nasty new variants arise. That's still pretty bad, but it's not 100 million dead. We're fortunate. It was exponentially ramping in the early days, but kind of stopped around like 7,500 dead a day as opposed to 75,000 where it easily could have gone. And so the thing is, we but but the Spanish flu because it's so censored, people kind of didn't even remember that it had happened. It was sort of literally Orwellian, like kind of memory hold wiped out, and wasn't a common point of reference and so on. Because governments at that time thought, oh, if we have control, we should censor it to stop panic. But lots of people died, and we don't know. Maybe it's because like we've run an experiment. Um, perhaps COVID nineteen would have spread to more people. And we would have not gotten a vaccine on time had, you know, like folks not taken preventive measures, or maybe, maybe it would have been exactly the same. We, you know, the counterfactual is sort of hard, you know, so there's folks who do this thing at the, this, at the country level and they'll say, oh, well, Sweden had this policy, others had this policy, but really what you want is actually a huge table with individual cases. And you actually want to diff that against, you know, the pharmacogenetics and the background. And so to see what actually, you know, or the immunogenomics rather, like what variants might've made you more or less susceptible. TLDR is, I'm not sure that you can say that the kind of very powerful states that exist in the 1910s did a better job. Um, may, maybe they would have been better, but I think they have much higher downside risk if they get it wrong. So that's my counter argument, Lee, not, not gain saying anything sure. you're saying, but the counter argument is centralization has catastrophic risk when it goes wrong. I mean, I think uh, what we're sort of getting to is that uh, obviously there's, uh, well, to kind of back up a little bit, I think it's going to be obviously hard to know. You, you can't run these types of experiments uh, counterfactually or, or rather uh, just look at that and change some variables and see how this would pan out. But uh, we, we kind of, I guess, are, are agreeing on the fact that at the end of the day, this is more about how people get to choose their own adventure um, in, in this kind of world, uh, whether it's a billion people and a billion rows existing uh, in a single place and everybody having a, a slice of how they want to experience something or just being able to understand like what 
uh, this would mean if they were to ever exit or just wanting to get more control. Um, and, and kind of this kind of leads to the question of uh, like, I mean, it sounds like if you blend this thing with identity and, and once you get to scale, everything is a social graph at the end of the day. Uh, and it's even more powerful in terms of things being actionable uh, for uh, in kind of Web3. So is this something that uh, I, like any of you uh, agree or disagree with? Uh, if so, like what do you think the set of the opportunities are? Because uh, I feel like one thing I want to reset everybody on is Every time we say we need a new social network, people think it's a Twitter or Facebook alternative, which um, kind of mentally thinks uh, puts us in understanding this is like a text communication platform. And but there's other different ways of thinking about media platforms. So just like, w- what does that look like? And and sort of, what do you think about just social graphs at the end of the day that are Web three native? Maybe Sani, you can kick us off, or, or Bob, you go for it. <laughs> sure. So I've actually thought about this a lot, and I actually think people don't understand that Web3, it's not just people calling it Web3, it really is the, the third web, and here's why. Like, let's say the first web, the dub, 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 you know, that's an open web, and Google could index that. It's actually very difficult to index the open web. It's non-trivial, but you can do it with crawlers and, and so on. And for example, you need to do things like you have a finite amount of download bandwidth, and you have to guess whether a given site is going to update and then spend that crawler bandwidth to go and download it. And maybe it only updated a little or not, you know, or a lot. And so you have like statistical prediction algorithms just for whether to recrawl a site and, and so on and so forth. And it's actually crawling is a very complicated thing. And it's a million different formats and you have to do wrapper induction, all this stuff. It's if it's a database populated, you know, page, how do you know you've got all of it? Are you breaking the web app by crawling it, et cetera, et cetera. And then the social web is even harder to index because it's on Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn's servers, and they don't want to let you index it. LinkedIn did lose the high five case where scrapers, you know, now in theory can index LinkedIn, but they're still not making it easy for you. In theory, individuals can do like an, a data export, but really it's not just data that you want to export. It's your identity and your connections to others, the social graph. It's not just you as an individual that wants to leave. It is you plus your social graph. That's your community, your subculture, right? And so what, what people don't get about blockchains is up until this point, they've mostly been hosting financial data. And it didn't look like, you know, web one or web two data. It didn't look like, you know, HTML pages or social pages. But now it's starting to, as block space increases, you have things like DSO and Mirror and, you know, Urbit and Capsule Social. It's like essentially you have decentralized storage of posts and identity and other kinds of things. And the consequence of that is actually profound because among other things, it radically simplifies indexing. One way I can prove this is already going to be a big deal is anybody can set up something like btc.com or blockchain.com or blockchair.com or so on. You can set up a block explorer. It may not be as good as the production ones, but you can do that because that gets back to the early point. These are open state services. The backend is open, right? So anybody can set up a front end for them and that's already happened. In fact, multi-billion dollar businesses have been built as block explorers, either scan and blockchain.com and so on and so forth. That shows that the concept of an open backend where you build clients for it is super powerful. So the thing is that indexing, because it's easier, searching Web3 is way easier than Web1 or Web2, because rather than that crawler problem where you have to go and ping a bunch of sites and you know so on, it gets all pushed to you. You just get a block. Every whatever seconds, you just get a block of all the updates. Imagine if you got a block of all the updates on the dub, 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 right? That's insane. Now, of course, they'd have lots of pointers out to them. You wouldn't necessarily, you know, the data availability problems, non-trivial thing to solve but we're solving it. That's why I said block space is a scarce resource of this decade. It might take a while, but we are solving it, whether it's zero knowledge or many of their scaling techniques will be solved in different ways in different times. Now you have this super parsable thing. You don't have to do all this inference. Maybe you subscribe to a bunch of different chains, but still it's scoped the problem in a much, much easier to solve way. And you get something else that I think people underestimate. You have a web of trust integrated with everything. Okay. So you have digital signatures as a first class field in every single blockchain that you're indexing in this way. And what that means is, you know, like so the social web had some of that, of course, because you had identity, but you still have fraud, you still have fake profiles and so on. And web one is even more plagued by this, where you don't know whether a web page is written by a human or an AI or something like that. And that's why Google search quality has dropped off to such an extent. That's why they've just relied on pure money as the ranking algorithm, where more and more of the time their first page is festooned with ads. They don't have the sort of non-commercial community signals. And that's why people will search on Twitter or Reddit rather than Google increasingly to find people, real people talking about this. But now with 
something where people are effectively signing their social posts or other content with their ENS or their SNS or their other identity. You now have digital signatures as a first class feature. That's huge. And they're open. They're not like the closed social web. And you can also, of course, include the balances of these users to see how real they are. You have a much richer set of signals for effectively integrating the social web with the open web, with now the financial web, which also makes more money. And I think Google is being caught completely sleeping by this. I think Facebook might be the only one that survives, maybe Twitter uh, as well, because they've actually, you know, Facebook said they're doing NFTs with Instagram. Zuck still runs his company and Twitter is actually pretty crypto aware. But the others that have not been making moves on this, Google hasn't even done a block explorer, which has nothing to do with you know, issuing a token or anything like that. I think they're actually in much bigger trouble. I'll say one other thing, which is a big chunk of Google nowadays with Google search is actually queries for recent events. They don't actually show the historical stuff. If you've made have notice, it's hard to find historical stuff. That means that if it's recent events, their index is highly biased towards things that open state platforms which are less than a year old, a large fraction of searches on Google will move to new clients. So they're much more vulnerable than people think because the full scope of what they index and the difficulty of indexing it may just get transformed. You know, Sometimes the way to solve a problem in math is you just define the problem differently, right? You know, and, and so this problem has now been defined in a different way where search becomes easier. It's got more signals. Google doesn't have the core competency around it. And, and they could just get, boom, disrupted like this. The disruption is already happening in, in block explorers, but they don't realize how important that is. Amazing. Um, no, I think that's that's the alpha leak, not, not the block space argument. <laughs> um, we, we are at time, so I'll just do two quick questions uh, and then we can uh, call it. I want to respect your time. Uh, maybe just one question that actually just came in from the audience and similar to what you just said, Balaji, but I'll, I'll have anybody kind of come in is, uh, we're obviously seeing Twitter and Facebook kind of go j- jump into uh, integrating NFTs and just other kind of Web3 primitives. Um, do you think, uh, like, how do you think about competing with them in that world? Like, do you think that's an advantage to them or do you think that just helps them sort of prolong uh, their their relationship with their customers? Or is that, that doesn't matter because somebody will overtake them that's Web3 native? I think even- uh, Is that a question for me or Lee? Or I, just, uh, I was like, I'll keep that open. It's an audience question. I think I uh, want to make sure that from a time standpoint, anybody who wants to take the first step can go for it. So, uh, Lee. <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, basically, I think- <laughs> I think Twitter and Facebook, I mean, crypto is kryptonite to large companies, right? So because it has risk and you know, what's much scarcer than budget is risk budget. Okay. Because budget, you can kind of make more money, but risk, especially like regulatory risk, PR risk, like larger companies, once you have an average of many people, once you have more risk averse people in the organization, it's really hard to take a risk. I I respect the Zuck a lot for taking, you know, even if, you know, I think that that they should have started, I actually said this at the time, they should have started by just integrating Bitcoin and Ethereum, you know, into WhatsApp with like off-chain payments or something like that. That's what they should have done rather than starting with, uh, you know, like Libra slash DM. But I respect him greatly for trying that when they were already under a lot of scrutiny, like only like a founder actually has the risk budget, right? So companies that are founderless typically don't have risk budget. And uh, risk budget is, you know, this thing is like on any on any accounting statement, they'll show the reward, right? They'll show the financial return, but they won't show the risk that was taken to get that return. That is not actually accounted for. It's invisible to people many times. And that's where there's low risk and high risk returns. And so I think once you think of crypto as kryptonite to most large companies, I'm actually much more bullish on, you know, frankly, places like India, Israel, outside the US for the most part, as well as small, you know, startups and stuff within the West, because they don't have the baggage. There's a huge internal immune reaction from a lot of Web2 companies, either both their, their executives and their customer base against Web3. You saw this with, you know, unfortunately with Discord, with Kickstarter, with other companies like this. Um, people will make, you know, also the kind of neutral argument, hey, we can't afford the risk, whether they agree with it or not. So I think for the most part, with some exceptions, like those two, maybe they'll, they'll make it. And in fact, if you look at the history of Silicon Valley, very few companies have actually made the leap between technological eras. You know, Microsoft, Apple are unique in terms of like reinventing themselves every decade. But lots of other companies like DEC, or like Gateway Computer, they were big in one era and they just missed the right angle turn for the next one, right? So we'll see, but I actually think a lot of them are gonna, are gonna fall, we'll see. Yeah, I'll just add to that. Um... For, for the person who asked this question, I think the exciting opportunity in my view with blockchain is to actually build 
social networks that couldn't have existed in the previous paradigm. So social networks that would have been impossible to jumpstart from a network activation perspective or to get past that zero to one stage. I think that is the opportunity that now exists with blockchain and tokens. Um, and so I would worry less about or, or think less about um, con being constrained to more skeuomorphic social networks as they exist today and adapting that for crypto and more thinking about um, what entirely net new social networks could exist that, that currently don't. And that might sound quite abstract, so I'll give an example. Um, I think one of the open opportunities still remaining in social networking is to build a local social network. Like, you know, 20 years into the development of the internet, we still don't have a view into what is happening in a five, 10 mile radius around me. I, there's no app that I can open where I can see in this moment who is around me, who's doing what, what is happening in my neighborhood, in this place where I am. And many people have tried to do that, but the amount of network density that you need to reach in order for that for that experience to be valuable to any given user is so high that I don't think any app has ever gotten there. And so I think that is an opportunity and perhaps the solution to that is leveraging tokens to get to that level of network liquidity. Oh, so yeah, I, I want to mention- with, I agree. Oh, sorry, go ahead, sorry. I just want to mention that I, I think what's significant, significantly different now is that you know, many of these uh, you know, social media, Web2 social media platforms, they, they are very big. But I think what's what's going to happen is that um, when we have a, a kind of like a decentralized craft and uh, you you lower the barrier to enter to the competition of building applications and building uh, user experiences, and it it, it means that uh, as previous you might need uh, like a bigger team to deliver a social media application and build something. Now you might need just maybe want to developers, maybe we'll see from this hackathon something very, very interesting built in a couple of weeks that's uh, very exciting for the whole, um, you know, uh, 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 social media space. So it, it doesn't like it, lowering the threshold is where kind of like we bring more people to compete and build applications and, and more people to use them uh, as well. So I think like, uh, it, I would not say that's uh, like the, it's hard to compete against the the, uh, the 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 bigger participants and stakeholders, especially when we're in a situation where uh, it's so easy to build now a social media application, which means that there's more and more uh, innovation when the when the kind of like a bar to enter is lower. And it's the same in in decent just finance. You know, it it doesn't take much of actually. Uh, building a, a protocol, it takes a bit of time, but essentially even improving a pro protocol might take less. And there's like less financial kind of like a security risk on the smart contract. So I could imagine seeing a lot of interesting stuff coming up. And, and when you have this innovation coming from everywhere, it's just like a constant remix culture. So when you look at open source development, it's always been remix culture, like Linux distributions and everything, it's all, uh, it's, it's all remix. Absolutely. Yeah. I, 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 let me say one thing, which is I half agree with Lee and I half disagree and I'll say why. Right. So part I agree with, I absolutely do think that new kinds of social networks will be built. Um, and I think that they, uh, I think many of them will involve finance as a first class feature because every user, you can assume every user in a, in a crypto social network has a balance and can send encrypted messages where you couldn't do that in normal social networks, just like Instagram, and, and Snapchat assumed you had a mobile device and open to the camera, whereas Facebook and Twitter started out as non-mobile, so they were built around a different set of assumptions, right? So I definitely do think new kinds of social networks will emerge. With that said, somewhat related to what Stanley was saying, like the backend change to a Web3 social network is so challenging that, and gives actually so many benefits because it makes it fully programmable, like the early Twitter and to some extent the early Facebook were, that that... Uh, what people might just do is essentially have almost exactly the same client, like a familiar client that everybody knows, and just put all of their energy into innovating on the back end and making that actually work first. And then kind of the new things would sort of come out of that. So without gainsaying what you're saying, Lee, I think that'd be the like sort of the 
like an engineery, you know, mindset approach, which is the front end has been debugged. People have figured out what RTs and likes and so on are. Freeze that, have that be exactly the same, and just open the back end and put all your energy into that. And developers will then take it from there and innovate on other kinds of things. That's like one approach. Um, and you know, different folks are trying different things. Farcaster, Deso, all these folks are trying different things. So. Awesome. Well, I think this is a perfect note to uh, to end this panel on. I want to thank all three of you, Balaji, Stani, Lee, for uh, taking the time and also going a little bit over. Oh, I've I've got a little announcement. Uh, Go for it. <laughs> uh, well, I just all right. I'm just tweeting it now. Boom. Okay, new book coming out, uh, and uh, if you probably everybody here will like it. Um, new book, How to Start a New Country. It's finally coming out. You can pre-order <laughs> it now. Arrives on July fourth. Um, oh, and perfect day. <laughs> so it's uh, my top tweet right now. So if anybody in the chat wants to see it, I thought I'd save the best for last. Um, and I got a nice little blurb by Mark and Vitalik and Brian and so on. So check it out. I'll be out in about three months. Well, I will pre-order this right after. Amazing. Yeah. Thank you so much, and uh, I really appreciate this. All right. Thanks, everybody. Everyone. Thank you so much. Okay. So with that, we are ready for our next talk. And that is us going a deeper into how the Lens Protocol is set up. Uh, so you can actually learn about the internals of what you can actually do from a graph standpoint. And uh, without further ado, I'd like to welcome David and Josh to go into all those details. Josh, uh, uh, David, appreciate this. And uh, I'll, I'll let you uh, get started. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let me get our little presentation up here. Uh, GM everyone. My name is David. Uh, I'm the product manager for social over at Ave Companies, uh, and that includes Lens. Uh, and I'm super fortunate to be joined today uh, by Josh. Uh, Josh Stevens. He is one of our amazing leading back, lead backend devs uh, who helped create the Lens API, which we're going to get into uh, later today. And we just want to give a quick overview of the Lens protocol. Uh, you know, why we built it, what you can do with it, uh, what are some awesome things you can hack on it, try to give out some ideas, some alpha, uh, as well as what the Lens API is, why we built it, and, and what are some of the things you guys can build with it. Um, so without ado, let's kind of jump into a quick overview of Lens Protocol. So, you know, why did we go out and, and, and build Lens? Well, web to social media is broken. Um, networks, they sell your data. Um, I think this was mentioned a lot in the last session, but you're paying with your personal information uh, to get distribution. There's no such thing as privacy. The reason you're not paying for Facebook, you're not paying for Twitter, is they're taking their, your data, they're turning around and selling ads. Um, and, and additionally, your data is not portable. As a creator, as a user, I, I am bound to the network I'm working with. Um, if all of a sudden Facebook or YouTube decides to turn me off for any reason, I've lost my audience, I've lost my content. I've lost my connection to my fans and, and, and that can spell the end of a career. Um, in addition, I have no ability to go between uh, any two services. Um, it, it, it turns this, uh, you know, this, this social graph into a moat, uh, whether or not the app is better. Uh, if I'm a startup and I've created this really great new user experience, these new fair algorithms or, or something that people like, uh, I, I have to bootstart this, you know, jumpstart this graph. Uh, and I'm at a huge disadvantage, even though I have an objectively better product. And lastly, user data centralized, right? We, we, we've all seen what happens when, when large databases exist, they become targets for hackers, uh, act, bad actors, things can get hacked, data gets leaked, never a good situation. Uh, the last thing we need is, is, is more scams uh, and, and more hacks. And so the goal with Lens is to use Web3 tools uh, to bring power back to the users, back to the creators, uh, and really change the game theory of Web2 of web social. It's currently zero sum. Uh, you know, Facebook only makes money off of data in their system, as does Twitter, uh, as does TikTok, and they're all incentivized to really lock you into those ecosystems, build in positive feedback loops. Uh, using Web3, we can turn on its head. And, and we're going to do that um, with Lens Protocol. Um, we are going to allow developers to build apps and tools on a singular, composable, and decentralized social graph. So, so, so what does that mean? It means that we are going to have all of the data built using NFT technology owned by users. 
um, on on a, on a permissionless blockchain. Um, you know, we are we are currently building on Polygon. Our test nets are on the Mumbai test net. We're getting ready to go to mainnet soon, um, and it allows app developers to focus on the user experience, on a UI, a UX, and content moderation, um, rather than user acquisition. And for creators and users, you own your links to your audience, you own your content, and you own your monetization. Um, and if you don't like a certain platform and you want to go elsewhere, it's as easy as clicking currently today, Connect Wallet. Um, I agree with what Balaji said in the last session of hopefully we get better terminology. So with that, let's let's dive into a little bit of, of how Lens works under the hood. What is the actual kind of infrastructure that, that we're building? Um, the first kind of key primitive is, is the profile, the profile NFT. Um, if you've ever worked with unstoppable domains or ENS, very, very similar. We have this, this NFT that represents your profile. It's got your handle. For example, I could be at David, Josh would be at Josh. Uh, it lives in my wallet. I can have multiple in the same way that when I'm on Twitter, I have at David E. Silverman, my nice fancy professional account, and, and a couple of anons where I like to you know post, post things that I want to keep personal. Um, it's minted upon creation. Um, I can have other metadata on there, maybe a bio. Um, but I also have this special array uh, that I can fill with publications. Um, this is where I kind of post my content to. And, and we'll come back to exactly what publications are, are in a minute. Um, in addition, it has another field called a follow module. Uh, and we're gonna come to that a, a bit later as well. The next thing we have is, is following. Um, we represent follow with a, a follow NFT. Um, if, if my wallet, davidev.eth wants to follow at Josh, uh, I, I, will, I will execute that transaction using Lens uh, and I will receive a at Josh follow NFT. It'll say that I follow at Josh. Um, it will have an, an, a token ID based on the order I followed. So I'm his fifth follower. Um, and it will also have a reference to his latest publication, which is really interesting because it means when I go to try to render this follow NFT in, in any wallet, whether that be you know, Rainbow or, or even a smart contract wallet like Gnosis Safe, or, or I go to OpenSea or Zapper, um, it's going to resolve to whatever his last publication was, which means every single wallet uh, has now become a, uh, a distribution mechanism uh, for, for, my, for, my, uh, for me as a creator, a content creator. In addition, these follow NFTs have built-in governance. And so every creator has a built-in social token just without the ERC-20. Um, let's say Josh uh, tweets out a bunch of really great developer alpha. Uh, he, he, you know, he, he publishes out a lot of great stuff on Solidity. He can pull his audience, you know, should he be, should he be doing on Snapshot? He can say, I want my first 500 followers you know, have them tell me uh, if I want to do uh, some more stuff on on maybe Ave V3 or if I want should be diving into Alchemix V2 and his let his audience kind of decide what he wants to build. We then kind of get into what a publication is. So a publication uh, is just really kind of a, a, a bunch of metadata that says where to find content and, and some things about that content. Um, Lens takes is completely agnostic as to where the actual data itself is stored. You could reference a place on chain. You could also reference IPFS, AR Weave, uh, Ceramic. You could even reference Old Web 2, uh, a, a URL or, or an S3 bucket. Um, and that just tells you where to get the content. And in the metadata, you can fill out anything as you normally would. You can even say what application it's posted with. Um, you can also add this thing uh, called a collect module, which will produce a collect NFT. Um, this allows any publication to be turned into its own standalone NFT. Um, where the creator kind of defines the, the minting logic. Um, let's say I post this really great image uh, of a recent trip to London. Um, my, I can set monetization. I want to allow you know, anyone to be able to collect this, that's our term for mint, for one ETH. Um, and when they go through and pay me the one ETH, all of a sudden they have an, a collect NFT in their wallet uh, exactly mirrored from the original publication. I can even include additional logic uh, for mirrors. Mirrors is how somebody retweets. Uh, so if somebody wants to share my content, let's say I post that really great image uh, uh, of my trip from London and Josh decides to mirror that on his own feed and somebody collects it from seeing Josh's feed, I can actually specify a, a certain amount of that uh, mint fee to go to Josh's wallet. And so we can actually even incentivize curation entirely on chain. Um, publications come in, in three types, regular posts, which is a uh, the plain use case, I've posted an image, or I've posted a piece of text, or I've posted a video using live peer. Um, it also has this concept of comment, which is um, a reference to another another publication, 
as well as some additional content. So I can comment on someone else's uh, image with, uh, with, my own, with, an, with my own image. Maybe it's a meme with my own text. This is a great image. Or again, any other arbitrary content. And the last type of publication is a mirror, just a simple reference. Uh, that's the same thing as a, a retweet or a share or talk to uh, formulation. Now, as a, as a Web3 developer, how can I kind of build in interesting uh, extensions to Lens? Well, Lens kind of has these things called modules, and they allow you to build arbitrary logic onto, uh, onto Lens protocol. And they, they come in three places, and they are, they are really powerful. The first one is the follow module, and this is set on a, on a per profile basis. The follow module, it runs, it's arbitrary logic that will run, uh, and it has to resolve to a Boolean yes or no to let you know whether or not a follow NFT is minted. So when my wallet, davidev.eth, tries to follow at Josh, his follow module will run, and using some series of conditions will decide whether or not me, davidev.eth, the wallet, is allowed to follow him. And, and we can do really powerful things with that, right? I, I can say that only people who hold certain NFTs are allowed to follow me. Maybe I want to restrict it to certain NFTs on Polygon, or I could even use a chain link oracle to say, you have to hold an AVAX warrior on AVAX or a board ape or a punk on mainnet in order to follow me. Um, I, I can make it payment. You have to pay me five ETH to follow me. Uh, I could make it, you have to have some POAP or been at these different events. You can make it as complex as you would like uh, any of these, so long as it kind of just comes back to a, a zero or one value. Additionally, you can have that follow NFT go to a, a smart contract. You could use that to, you know, build out subscriptions. If you don't top off this contract every now and then, uh, you know, one with five Matic every month, um, I'm going to pull away your follow relationship. And now we've built kind of subscriptions. The next one is a reference module. And this is run before uh, somebody tries to comment or mirror my piece of content. So I, I post an image, let's say, uh, via my at David profile. If uh, at Josh wants to try to comment or mirror, uh, the reference module will run on a per publication basis and decide whether or not, remember a Boolean answer at the end, whether or not Josh is allowed to reference either comment or mirror. And again, I, I can do simple token gating. Uh, only people with 32 FWB are allowed to reply to my content. Uh, only people who have uh, certain NFTs are allowed to reply to my content. And I, I can combine this with other higher level integrations. A, a really interesting use case would be, what if I wanted to build a completely private social network uh, on top of Lens? Well, I could have the actual content in a publication be stored in ceramic, encrypted using Lit Protocol, another sponsor in this hackathon. And I could have the, the access control uh, be, you need to have at least 32 ETH in your wallet to get the decryption in order to see what the post is. And I can also have the comment, collect, uh, and, and mirror functions all require that I have 32 FWB in my wallet at a given time. And then the only people who are allowed to engage with my content, view, you know, sorry, read and write, need to be in my community. And so that's, that's reference. And, and the last area is collect. I think collect is really the most powerful. And that is logic that is run to decide whether or not this kind of collect NFT, uh, this NFT that references this original publication uh, is minted. So the example is I, I post an image and I can say, you know, for one ETH, this gets minted out into an NFT that you can control. I can set a cap, hey, here's, you only can do this five times. Uh, you can do this five times with incrementing. Uh, so the first one is one ETH, the next one is 1.1 ETH. We can also do really complex logic and the community has really jumped at this. We, we have a, the community wrote one that does DeFi aware NFTs. So I will sell my NFT for five Matic but before the transaction completes, it takes the Matic, deposits it into Aave, and sends the A tokens uh, to the creators. Now, creators have kind of you know self-driving NFTs. Um, we have another one. The the great folks over at um, at Klima came and built in the Refi Collect module, um, which you could even extend the logic further and say, hey, take some of the you know look at how much gas this transaction used, convert that to carbon offsets, take some of the incoming. Um, the incoming funds, convert it using Toucan to base carbon, base carbon token, retire it on chain. And now my entire transaction is carbon neutral. So that's some of the stuff you can do with collect and different ways for people to build on top of Lens. And what our goal with Lens is to really foster a broad, diverse and evolving social ecosystem. 
Fully composable and transferable on-chain social graph. You can go from one application to another. You can bring all of your followers. You can bring all of your content. You can bring all of your NFT and it's NFTs and it's composable to any other application, whether it be NFT minters, whether it's DeFi or other blockchain applications that are yet to come can build on top of these existing tools that we're building. Follower NFTs allow for social DAOs and new types of social tokens. Governance mechanisms, including snapshot, delegation, and compatibility with Aave governance, as well as Governor Bravo are fully built in. And lastly, the real key thing is modularity. We allow developers to focus on the experience and the front end and leave the network effects to the protocol. You don't need to create a bootstrapping plan. You know, as users start using any application built with Lens, your application has access to all of those users as well. We, we call the protocol Lens as the Lens plant you know, enriches the soil around it and allows other plants to grow around it. And that's kind of our view from the ecosystem, changing from a zero sum game that we currently see in Web 2 to a collaborative sum game in Web 3. Now, in addition to just the Web 3, um, you know, the Web 3 hooks that we have with modules, Josh is going to talk to you about the Lens API, which is something that we have built at Aave to allow Solidity 3, Solidity free Web 3 social development. Josh. Cheers, David. Um, bear with me, I have got COVID, but I should be okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, we have um, built a API for all of this. So if you're building a social media site, uh, the key things that are super important is you know speed. Um, you know, if you're on Twitter, et cetera, et cetera, if you lose that speed, it becomes unfun. Uh, scalability um, and traceability, all these things are super important to be able to get to. Um, now we were building an API anyway for our own internal needs, but we thought, why not share that with you guys? So the API is, it abstracts all the complex things about the, 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 the protocol away. So as David's been talking about how many amazing features there is, um, like modules, different kind of modules that take in different input parameters, all these kind of things. Um, the API abstracts that away to a simple enum uh, with you know standard stuff to pass in. If you want to enable a reference module uh, that only your followers can uh, comment, it's a Boolean and it will construct the data for you, the sign type data, and then you just send it on the client. So uh, it's more of more of a helper tool uh, and a traceability tool. Um, and we think it's super important that you know, if we're going to build the next social platform that we have tools so Web2 developers can just focus on building a, say, board Ape community or, um, you know, anything like that without having to understand the protocol completely, because it is, you know, quite overwhelming with how many features there is. Um, so that's the idea. Do you want to hit the next slide, David? Um, so build front ends fast with the Lens API. So you don't have to worry about indexing or querying the data or reorgs or speed or fetching the data um, and everything's done super quick. So we have an indexer watching all the data. We index that data so we can grab it quick. Um, and when you get a publication back, all that data is extracted for you. If someone said, hello world, that data would say content, hello world. It would extract the um, module for you saying, you know, they have a fee to collect this, which is 0 0.0 0 ETH, um, one ETH. Uh, and then you have a simple way to be able to construct that and redeem it with another function called collect. Uh, so all these things allow you to, um, you know, really just focus on what you guys need to build and want to build. Um, you don't have to deal with any real data. So we have crons watching the data, making sure that the hash still exists and then removing them, them away um, from the uh, queries if they if they don't exist anymore. Uh, we have full caching layer on there to allow this to be super quick. Uh, you know, the, the, the queries are really, really fast to kind of grab everything that you want. Um, you know, some of this data to grab is super complex. Like, you know, a publication can include, you know, how many times it's been mirrored, how many times it's been collected, how many comments it's got. Uh, a publication is an unlimited pointer. So what I mean by that is you can have a post and a comment and it can go unlimited depth and it can keep pointing and pointing and pointing. So um, being able to scale that, uh, like how Facebook and Twitter do really quickly to have that user experience is super important. Um, you don't have to worry about pre-filling the contract data or validating it. And what I mean by that is we have these WIVSIG methods that, uh, you know, you just pass, you want to collect a publication and all you literally do is pass the publication ID. It will construct you all the type data for you. 
it will a validate that you conform to all the modules as well so say you have to follow to collect this publication it will validate that for you and throw a web two error saying hey you don't follow this person so you can't collect uh, it does that for everything for uh, you know if you don't have enough balance if you don't if you haven't approved an, um, enough for the token uh, all these things allow a much better development experience where straight away you know oh that's gone wrong with the protocol or what you know and this person doesn't have enough balance etc cetera, etc cetera. as i said before it's a web two style interface so if you go to the twitter api it's super easy to just go and get all the followers or you know following yes it's heavily rate limited um but we took inspiration from the kind of you know, the web two interfaces and just as easy it is to get the followers that um, are on Twitter, it's just as easy to get the followers that are on Lens. Uh, it's just as easy to grab all the publications. It's just as easy to get everything a, a user has collected. Um, and all these things is super important for growth for the Lens protocol. Um, and I think what, one of the biggest things is there's not a huge learning curve. You know, the whole API is built using GraphQL. Uh, you know, it's super easy to fetch what you need when you need it. Um, and you can just focus on the stuff that you want to build. So all the documentation is, is there for you to use. Uh, and yeah, we're super excited for you guys to use it and give us some feedback about how it helped you or how we could improve it. Uh, yeah, it's uh, super cool. Awesome. Thanks, Josh. A few other things I want to point out about the API that I think are going to be kind of key and, and also point a bit about the strategy we're doing with Lens. You know, the first thing is we want to give Web3 developers really awesome new powerful tools to build with. Um, some of the ones we're super excited about are these DeFi aware NFTs with collects or really trying to see what people can do with follow NFTs and this concept of social DAOs. Um, on the web two side, right? We wanna make things easy and approachable for brand new developers, right? Not every single person wants to be an expert in Solidity or should be an expert in Solidity. The reason web three social is gonna win out is because we're approachable for everyone. And that was really the goal with the Lens API. We also want to make sure that every single application built on Lens on the Lens API is going to get a top-notch set of features. So they're beyond just access to the full social graph, there are built-in queries for, for search, for timeline, for explore, common pages you may want to put in a social graph. And in addition, you know, we have it, we have a data science team, the same kind of app, you know, we've we've kind of said that Ave is working on its own front end. The same algorithms that will be powering that are going to be ported through the API. So as, as, as those algorithms kind of get built out and improved, your application will gain from that as well. We think that's kind of a, a big thing we want to help out. Not everyone's a data science expert. You, you know, you can kind of pump in from an existing awesome data science team. And the last thing is really making easy to use tools so people can focus on novel and unique um, experiences. We want to abstract away the blockchain for developers who may not be familiar with it. And that's really the design goal. Of, of the Lens API. Can I just add one more thing, just to put it into perspective of how much easier that it makes for you. Um, to unfollow someone, uh, actually to do that, you have to burn the follower NFT of that profile. Now that profile itself, every profile has their own follower contract address, right? And you could have minted three or four different tokens in there. And on chain, there's no way to go, hey, how many tokens do I own of this without looking at the instant indexer? But, with the API, you literally just go, I want to unfollow this profile. It will construct all the data for you. It will do all that, all the joins that needs to happen. And all you do is sign and send that transaction. And then you've unfollowed that person. Um, that's just one of many examples where uh, it really helps um, the development of anything that you do on this protocol. Definitely a big thing I also want to, I want to shout out is, you know, we, we have our bounty tracks. I think, I think, you know, we teased this at, at the start of this session. We're really looking for people to build front ends on top of it. I know there was a uh, some some people talking in the chat, like, is there a reference UI? Well, we hope that people build a reference UI. There's been a couple of great tools uh, in the Lens community that's been built so far uh, inside of, uh, if you go to the Lens Discord, um, I think there was, a, there was a, a simple explorer, a profile creator and a way to build statuses and that was running on our, on our test net. Um, for anyone building, please make sure you use the new test net. Um, we're looking for protocols people who are going to build some really novel, interesting collect modules, reference modules, and uh, follow modules. I think there was a, a, a brainstorm session we were doing in the uh, in the voice chat of Discord, and somebody was talking about it. They, they were thinking you could do you know, on-chain private DMs with read receipts using custom collect modules, uh, lit protocol, and ceramic. Um, not saying that hits a couple different sponsors for the hackathon and partners. Maybe it's a cool thing to build. Um, there's tons of really awesome things to, that, 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 that can be built here. 
And on the tooling side, we want to make it so that this is still a friendly place for developers. Um, you know, building explorers, building vampire attacks to help the entire network gain from stealing users from Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, uh, TikTok. I'm probably going to get in trouble with legal for saying all these names, but I'm, I'm, I'm calling out targets. We want, we want, we want these, uh, you know, we want people, we want everyone to kind of gain from Web3 social, um, show that there's more use cases for blockchain than just speculative tokens. And then lastly, you know, Stani said earlier in the last session, you're never building by yourself, but you're always part of an ecosystem. And we've learned this really, really early on with Lens. The community has jumped through our bounty program and built more modules than, than we even built as the original Genesis team and has given so much feedback. We had to redeploy a brand new test net just for this hackathon um, to make sure that people were using the most up-to-date feature set. Um, and so we really encourage, as you guys are building, please provide feedback. What else do you want to see in the contracts? What else should we be putting in to all of these different, uh, to all of these different uh, primitives? Or you can write updates to the primitives yourself. You know, um, Come help build this next generation social graph. And same for the API. What else do you wanna see in this API? How can we make your lives easier as developers? How can we make this community grow? How can we do it all together? How can we really help this ecosystem? So, you know, we, we are we are gonna be around uh, all week in the ETH Global uh, Discord. We're gonna be in the Lens Discord. We're gonna be on Twitter. Um, so really, really definitely wanna to, want to hear from you on what we can do best. Um, so that's, uh, you know, that's, that's Lens at a very high level. Um, as always, you can reach out to anyone on the team for questions, feedback, and comments, and, and we look forward to seeing what, what everyone here builds, and, and we hope you guys have a great hackathon. Thanks, guys. Um, Kartik, sending it back over to you. Hey, we're back. Kartik broke away from the, uh, had a little technical issue there. So we're going to go to a quick break. Thank you guys. That was awesome. Much appreciated. And um, everybody, we can uh, hold for just a couple minutes till our next talk comes. Thanks, everyone. All right. Um, sorry about that. I just uh, I had some technical difficulties on on my end. Everybody, um, I think we are a little bit ahead of uh, kind of. Uh, <coughs> apologies. We're a little bit ahead of schedule here. So uh, what we'll do is kind of take a quick break. I know a lot of you've been kind of watching this for a good uh, uh, two hours already with the logistics and the last panel and the discussion. So uh, while we wait for the next uh, set of speakers to kind of join in and get ready for our next uh, talk, um, we will take a quick uh, five minute break and uh, and then come back. So uh, we'll just kind of put on a timer. In the meantime, enjoy some lo-fi beats and uh, we'll see you all very shortly.
All right. Welcome, everybody. Hope you had a good, uh, quick uh, five minute break. And with that, we are ready for our next talk. So next talk, we're going to talk about what does it mean to kind of get more creative on building on top of Lens. And for this panel, we actually have three uh, amazing people. So we have Rich, Ramon, and Simon uh, from We3, and they're going to be talking about all the things that you can do and how you can extend uh, your creativity with, with Lens. So without further ado, let's welcome all of them here on stage and I'll ask them to turn their videos on and uh, I'll let you all get started. Hey everyone, uh, nice to meet you. Um, I think we, should we just get started, Cardik? Absolutely, yes. Also, uh, you should uh, flip the video on so uh, the live stream can see you as well. Uh, one second, just going to the start of our slides. Okay. Um, give me one second. Uh, can you see at least my slides for now? Yes. Okay. Um, okay. Cool. Um, shit. So, okay. Uh, Rich, Simon, are you guys ready to? So I can kick it off. Absolutely. Go for it. Good. Okay. Cool. So, uh, welcome everybody. Thanks for being. Pro this is talk number three, four. Uh, so, still staying with us and excited to have. Uh, quite a few folks here to kind of like listening to what we have uh, uh, brought to you today. Um, today it's a lot about kind of like what can you do with Lens and what like how to think differently about what products or innovation you can build on top of it and uh, kind of like what where where this could lead. So I, I think we already heard a lot from Stani and uh, Josh and David of like what Lens is. So I shortly just kind of like want to introduce us in the call and maybe uh, Rich and Simon, once you talk, you maybe can just introduce yourself very shortly, who you are and kind of like what you do. But uh, I'm Ramon, I'm part of WeFree. WeFree is a web-free design collective. So we're a bunch of designers who realize that web-free is growing exponentially and it's one of the most interesting area for design to come in because it's early because we don't really know yet how to use it best because it's still hard to use and so we came together and we realized there's a lot of space for making the space more accessible more inclusive uh, opening it up for the next generation of users and uh, we Prefer, primarily do this through helping through product and uh, brand strategy, product design and brand strategy, and really help kind of like building narratives from like early ideas to actually bring it to uh, the market. Uh, maybe a little bit of how we got involved in Lens, just to kind of like as a little bit of disclosure, we have been working with them since quite a while in the background to really shape the brand and the the, the brand itself of Lens, but also kind of like help expand what Lens could mean for the ecosystem. I think Stani was saying is like, it's really about building an ecosystem. And so what we have been tasked to help out in the last few weeks is really kind of like pushing the edges of like what Lens could do in several places and really help to kind of like shape that. So with that, I would love to shortly talk about why uh, we or we believe or I believe uh, social graphs matter or what social graphs are. Um, being a designer in that space, I, I think it took me quite a while to understand what the hell is a social graph? Why does it matter? And uh, I, I or we use the metaphor of kind of like, it's a little bit an iceberg. So like we know social media, we know news feeds, we know friends lists, we know that it matters to have friends online or being able to connect to them and like write with them through messengers. But it's really kind of like just the top of the iceberg that we really see here. And there's like, there's so much data and connections and content or connections that below the surface that are part of the social graph that are not really accessible for us, but they're also kind of like the bread and butter of like the traditional web two platforms like Facebook, Twitter and all of that. So I kind of like think for, mo for most people that come into this space talking about the social graph, it's really just kind of like the top of the iceberg, but like what is really exciting is like what lies below that. And 
what we mean with that is like that basically everything has a social graph, right? When we started to explore Lens, it was a lot about like, is this social media? Is this a new news site? Is this a feed? Is this a friends list? Is, like, what is it really? And the reality today is that basically everything that Web2 touches and potentially Web3 will touch too, has a social graph, has a social component where we connect with each other, being it from sending and transacting from one wallet to one wallet, kind of like uh, following someone's on-chain activity to kind of like the more traditional Web2 applications like Twitter or all of that. So when thinking about where Lens is going, I think one thing, oh, wrong button, is this is bigger than decentralized Twitter. I feel like when we start to ideate in this space, we often end up with decentralized Twitter, uh, a new news site. It's like the, the go-to things. And we really wanted with this kind of like exploration and what we're going to show you today to kind of a push what, what an open graph can enable for an ecosystem itself. What do we, what do we mean with this is that it it's about how the a news feed is curated, what we're seeing there. But like when we start to zoom out there, it's as much about music, movies, and entertainment, right? We share playlists, we get recommendations, we play together, we watch things, uh, let's play video on Twitch together. So it's kind of like all of those has a huge social component, how we kind of like connect with each other and do things together. And like that can be even broader in the sense of like, uh, in, in the realm of like uh, matchmaking. So like it's it can lean from car, uh, uh, creators matching to create something together on TikTok through a duet to kind of like actual matchmaking through dating to finding collaborators in a DAO. So like a lot of those are built on social connections and, and doing that. So it's like Web3 is already inherently social and we need to get to the next step there. And that can, and I think like when we think about where a social graph can be helpful, it's as much about social media, the metaverse, governance, shopping, working, gaming. It really can encompass all of this, which makes it sometimes really hard to start, but also kind of like shows hopefully how broad, broadly applicable like a protocol like Lens could be. So with that, we wanted to kind of like highlight what are some core challenges that we think uh, we can address through new new experiences and new product design. And one thing is there's a huge chance to kind of like give more power or control uh, to users. So we surrender, like with Web2, Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, you name it, TikTok, we surrendered a lot of power and control for convenience, right? We give away control over over our data with sign in with Google and now we have wallets. So like we're really kind of like in a state of empowering the user again, but like this empowering is also kind of like frightening, but like it's actually really kind of like a new paradigm shift for social media that you're in control of your social graph, of your connections and that you can shape it and control it. And that's quite a no novelty. So like the question for us really should be, so how might we balance the control and the power that we gain with kind of like also ease of use through better UX and UI design here so that we still get some of that convenience back. Number two that we think is super valuable here is like around uh, insights. And the, the reality is we have a information asymmetry in the current uh, social graph world, right? Uh, platforms like Spotify, like Google, like all of that, they have a ton of data on us and we might potentially even have access to that, but it's really hard for us to understand and acting on that. Like, so platforms often more know about ourselves than we do. And I think with opening up the social graph now all of that, again, this power of insight, this reflection and understanding can shift back to us. So kind of like, how can we use web free on-chain uh, activity, this general more transparency in this space to, to give not just not just to create more trust, but like also more insights about ourselves. So what if if those open graphs that we talk about kind of like really allow us to understand and reflect about ourselves, our communities and new ways? Next, I think it's important to kind of like acknowledge that Lens is a protocol, not a platform. And um, I, I 
still uh, stole this one from one of my favorite paper called like uh, platforms uh, protocols on a platform but i think that this kind of like idea of like portability that you're able to choose how you experience content or being in control of that or moving moving your friends list or your friends list is moving with you and doesn't have to be established again is quite a big change in like how we understand like uh open graphs itself so uh, this idea of portability is not novel for us i feel in web3 where we have wormholes where we have uh, talk about cross chain and like we're trying to figure that out but like the, this idea of like that social media is not a unique universe a world garden but it's more like the marvel cinematic multiverse where things can coexist and connect with each other i feel is quite a novelty and like so thinking about this what we're going to talk about is kind of like leaning into the last point is the more power we have the more we understand ourselves and the data that's established through those places and kind of like we create more portability that allows us to completely rethink what a front end could be like how we interact with it right it's like if you don't like how a, what data you get out of a front end or if that could be more like you you move on you build your own and like that that is a quite novel approach to kind of like go often also going a little bit more back how the internet was like a long time ago. So what this allows us to do, it's kind of like, it allows to kind of like lead with better design because there is more competition, hopefully more choice. And like also, oh, not everything has to be broad. You can also design uh, for, for niches itself. So with that, that's kind of like a little bit an intro how we got excited about working with Lens itself and like why social graphs matter. And I'm handing this over now to uh, Rich and Simon to kind of like dive a little bit into uh, some clusters of ideas that we had so far. Um, Rich, Simon, I'm going to mute myself, but please free to move on. Nice. Um, thanks, Ramon. Um, yeah, so we've got a few ideas that we've been uh, tinkering on. You know, obviously, it's such a such a big space, such a big area, so much opportunity of, of where to innovate. So, uh, where do we begin? Um, well, we've sketched out a few um, ideas that we'll share with you, uh, just to get the juices flowing. And you can consider these as kind of like interesting territories to explore. Um, some of them are really kind of like the natural breaking points of where Web to social media sort of breaks down, or where you might sort of find the cracks there. Um, and other areas are really where sort of Web3 enables us to create something net new. Um, so you'll hear us talk a lot about what ifs, we'll be sort of posing a few questions. Uh, really, really, these are just kind of prompts against which we think um, it would be interesting to explore. So you know, let us know what you think, riff with us, ask questions, and uh, throw ideas down in the chat as well. So let's, uh, let's dive right in. Yeah, absolutely. You're gonna hear a lot of what ifs from us uh, for the next little while. So. So settle in, uh, but we're kicking off with some ideas around uh, lens tooling, because uh, when we're we're building something new here, something from the ground up, which means that you know we get to start pretty fresh, and we get to set set up the tools and the systems that help make us make the most of that sort of like green pasture of new social. Um, the issue is right now, much of today's tooling for social is completely boxed off. It's like pretty hard or impossible to change or to introduce interact with. So it's, it's really exciting to start to think about breaking that and giving users the power of the tools that make the most of that new social. So we've been thinking a little bit about some tools that people can create to get the most of their lens social graph. And if you give it a little scroll, now we've got one here, um, all about verification. It was right now, verification is controlled by social media platforms and not really the communities that grow into them or grow to use them. And that can like stifle the innovation or it can lead to even verification being a centralized platform's whim. Cough, cough, blue tick. Uh, so what if social media verification meant more than just being a real person? What if it instead sort of captured any kind of label that was meaningful to a community or to an individual or set of individuals? So like broadening this kind of, uh, this idea of verification to an extensible system of tags that could be attached to, you know, users, to communities, even to posts would help us open up a rich new set of experiences. So again, some what ifs, like what if a distributed fact checking community could tag posts that is researched and evaluated as like trusted? Maybe what if a curated collection of articles uh, written by award winners could easily be created and automatically kept up to date? What if an idea could even be traced back to its roots um, of, and its tree of posts and replies? 
And lastly, what if a company's online profile could be tagged with this global carbon footprint? But speaking of influence and that sort of like sense of meaning to a community, how about kind of getting a sense of where you as an individual community stand in your graph? Yeah, so um, another thing we're sort of thinking about is really the, you know, what's the default visual expression or sort of the visual viewing paradigm of, of your social media experience? And you know, today, the typical, just to give it some context so you can sort of understand you know, where the ideas are coming from, but you know, the typical viewing paradigm really centers around like an infinite feed of content um, that's designed by the businesses and the platforms really to drive as much engagement and uh, as much consumption as possible. And I don't know if you guys have seen the social uh, dilemma, but uh, the guy that in, you know, invented infinite scroll sort of often regrets kind of how that's led to a lot of mindless consumption. So, you know, things like your relationships and what you actually might learn about them um, seem to be things that are really like secondary features in, in today's social media experience. So uh, you don't really see those things that they're just, they're just lists of contacts in secondary features. Um, with something like the open social graph, though, I mean, I think what's interesting here is that because this is these experiences are being powered by that data, it's like this ever-growing model that's capturing information about your relationships with people, you know, groups and communities and even businesses. Um, now that we would have ownership over that, what's also interesting is that we also have um, choice uh, or possibility about how uh, data is actually expressed or visualized. So, you know, the question that we're exploring here is, uh, you know, what other ways could you express or visualize your social graph? You know, what other new paradigms might we create to view your experience? And uh, in this little illustration we've got here, my digital roots, um, you know, we're imagining something more of an interactive graphical view. Uh, it's like a sketch, uh, but of what your relationships look like. And um, this is something that could emphasize relationships over content. So. You can imagine different filters and, and, and different toggles that you switch on and off to kind of, you know, explore your network. Um, but, you know, what else could it do? Perhaps it could actually help you see the degree of your influence or your reach um, or even your exposure to different types of people from different groups. <clears throat> Perhaps you could also even see like timelines of your relationships and how your connections have flourished or diminished over time. And you know, perhaps even understand more insightfully, like things like your frequency of contact or the dynamics of, or the interactions that, of your exchanges with others. So there's a lot of insight that can actually be drawn that we're not privy to at the moment in sort of web two social media. And these are things that could be interesting. And when you sort of frame it in the idea of like, you know, could you actually improve your relationships with people? It, it starts to become quite interesting. And then you think about um, what could this mean, not just to your, friendship circle, but when you start to consider teams or professional networks, like what happens then? Um, and uh, yeah, to sort of like close out this little sort of territory, like Rich will sort of uh, chime in now on um, what tools could be like to make the most of your experience with, with it. Yeah, you give us a scroll there, Ramon. Yeah, so right now, um, you know, we're all using the web. And we're all subject to these really opaque algorithms that are kind of ruling the current social media experience. You know, they're deciding what to show or even what vanishes into the ether and what doesn't get seen um, by users. And we've got very little sort of influence over what we actually see um, because those algos are trade secrets. You know, we're unable to show how the inputs and the interactions can influence the kind of contents that we might then consume. So what if we were able to have greater control over our feeds, over the way we consume different media across platforms, set our own rules, even our own standards, our own algorithms by which to kind of sort, uh, filter and discover that content. Then the open graph uh, not only allows anyone to build their own front end experiences, but also perhaps the very engines themselves that define how content uh, breaks through to the surface. You can infuse a point of view over which uh, content should be prioritized and filtered based on different needs and different tastes um, at your own whim. So a few what ifs. What if uh, you could choose from multiple open sourced algorithms or lenses uh, by which you could view your lens feed? What if there are easy ways to manage permissions around what personal data a front end might use to personalize recommendations? Or what if those algorithms were like completely transparent and tunable to this point that you might even be able to jump in and sort of change a, 
change a lever to see what you what you're viewing. And then this is a fun one. What if you could even flick a switch and have a completely different content experience? Even like view the world through the eyes of your friends, celebrities, or like total wild cards from the other side of an echo chamber. But that's enough about those kind of foundations, that, that kind of tooling. What about what we should do specifically for creators? Yeah, so I mean, obviously this is, you know, when you think of Web3 and social media, it's very much synonymous with creators and the creator economy. And it just feels like there's so much potential to create new types of experiences for creators, but also for fans as well. And I think like we're interested in um, also how you can sort of foster connection from nuanced data around tastes and preferences. How can that inform and power new, new types of connection between creators, but also between um, creators and fans? Um, so if we scroll down a little bit, one of the things we're wondering about is uh, the idea of collaboration and, and how matchmaking could serve um, greater collaboration, how, how Lens sort of might facilitate that. And, and to give it some, some backstory, I mean, today, you know, creators around the world, you know, they collaborate with fellow artists and writers and musicians and brands um, to develop fresh content. And often it's about furthering reach and actually growing audiences as well as, you know, experimenting with different types of content. Um, and, you know, you tend to find that it creates new dialogue, can bring communities together and, and all that sort of good stuff. But I think what's sometimes challenging is, you know, how do you find and, and signal that you're sort of looking for this sort of collaboration, whether it's for like a project or for an art piece or for a DAO or for a brand, how do you find the people to work with? Um, so the question we're exploring here is, you know, how might we use our insights in the open graph um, to match creators together and catalyze new content and uh, creative collaborations? So how do we make that seamless, sort of more easy? And um, we're thinking about tools for things like audience insight and matchmaking. So in our little sketch here, you can imagine <clears throat> a creator is seeing different types of, of uh, potential matches or collaborators that are being served to them. And here we've got a kind of like a, you know, a sort of Tinder style where you're, where you're seeing different types of folks perhaps matched on certain criteria or content or preferences, or perhaps it's about, you know, like how you're signaling certain project ambitions. Um, and then next to that, like the idea of like this merged graph. So this is interesting when you have like a visual overlay, you know, what, what if you could have two creators that could easily and perhaps visually compare and contrast their audiences um, to see where they overlap in tastes and preferences, but also to sort of see the gaps and the differences where they sort of might grow. Um, so these are a few ideas just around uh, matchmaking uh, within the context of creators, but matchmaking of course is a theme that it's going to run through lots of different verticals as well. So, you know, what, what as you as you take this forward, you know, think about like what does this mean across different platforms or even gaming um, or finding collaborators in DAOs to start projects together or even uh, dating. Um, but that's sort of a little bit about the creators. Now let's sort of think a little bit about uh, the fans as well. Yeah. What about flipping that about the sort of the fan experience? Because um, fan engagement is obviously huge for growth. Um, and access to, you know, maybe if you're a creator, access to the data about your followers, um, you know, or uh, uh, is pretty limited on today's platforms. It means that, you know, it could be pretty tricky to have sort of like valuable interactions or even, even any at all discussion to understand the sort of your fans and your followers. Oftentimes it's even like fragmented across different channels, across different apps. Uh, it's really hard to have a sort of central discussion uh, to engage the sort of like feeling across the different channels. So we're thinking about how we, how might we provide creators with tools and resources, better understand their fans, even deepen their relationships, and really unlock the full value of their fan base. Um, and thinking that on the flip side as well, how can we also like bring it, open it up for fans to basically get closer to the creators uh, when you know as their time is valued as well and their their engagement is valued. So like Lens could potentially enable creators to engage with their fans in any way they want and really get a 360 view of their fan base of their followers, maybe giving options to engage um, or to build connections that otherwise might not be possible. So I have some just ideas. What if creators could really get reports and breakdowns on who their fans are, who's consuming the most content, what they love, what they like, who they're from, get a sort of holistic view um, of everyone that's involved. And then 
maybe on a recognition point, like what if creators could even recognize individual fans with rewards, perks, personal experiences maybe, and gifts, perhaps even some direct contact as a way to sort of thank them for that support um, and show them that they're a valued fan. But then on to monetization over to you, Simon. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so um, yeah, this one's really about monetization or commercializing content. And, um, uh, you know, this is something that I think bugs a lot of creators today. And it's very difficult to find a, a way to have a viable, sustainable living on, on web to sort of social media. Um, you know, there's, there's always a few issues at play. I mean, platforms take a large cut of any profits you make anyway. Um, but also creators aren't always just free to focus on their content because they have to worry about how do they beat the algorithm? You know, how do they climb higher in the rankings in order to kind of better mon uh, position themselves to, to monetize um, their content? And while also having to, you know, maintain towards community guidelines or guidelines and rules set by the platforms, which seem to be ever changing. So it's, it's a sort of frustrating loop that I think a lot of creators get stuck in. So really it sort of feels that um, it's a system in which there are limits to the freedom uh, of how you might sort of thrive both financially and, and creatively. So, you know, one question that we're thinking about for, for Lens and uh, what it could, could imply for creators is, is really like, what if you could relieve some of that pressure, you know? Um, and what if you could put more control and better tools back into the hands of creators um, in how they commercialize their content so they can both thrive financially and, and creatively? So, you know, um, obviously with NFTs and, and the sort of the boom there, like creating content on chain is going to enable new forms of monetization, uh, different systems, and, and also the way uh, that could be tuned and targeted towards different audiences. Um, also, it kind of lowers the barrier for new creators to enter the system. They don't have to fulfill, you know, minimum audience sizes and things like that to kind of actually participate and, and actually enjoy some revenue from their work. Um, so a couple of ideas here, like one of them is this idea of a, a dashboard, right? So monetization dashboard, you know, what if it was easy and simple for folks to um, automate or configure different options or systems by which to uh, monetize their content. So in the sketch, you can kind of see, you know, maybe it's an ad model, the traditional ad model that I switch on and a match made to brands. Uh, perhaps it's pay-per-view or sort of surge pricing or even subscription. And on the right, you know, perhaps I can just customize each post in different ways for, for different audiences. Maybe there's members I have or early bloomers or just like, what is it for everyone else? Um, but also, you know, beyond this too, you know, with content sort of minted, uh, sort of released on chain, I mean, um, we're also imagining tools that can track content across apps built on Lens so that creators can, you know, uh, monitor and track and receive income or royalties for or attributions for any content that's used by other creators on, on Lens apps. Um, and then the middle idea here is around membership. Right, so um, obviously we're seeing this in different forms on, on certain platforms like uh, Patreon, uh, et cetera. But um, you know, what if creators could design their own membership programs and where they define the tiers of access and the different perks and rewards that uh, their different audiences might have? And um, also, can they even pull in their audiences or their top fans in, into their into their kind of orbit and actually help them grow and incentivize those fans and audiences in different ways with uh, financial rewards or tokens. So tons and tons of opportunities as it comes to uh, monetization. Um, and then now sort of back over to Rich for a little bit on uh, DAOs. Yeah, I hope everyone's clinging onto their seat in this avalanche of <laughs> ideas. <laughs> um, but we're getting there. But um, yeah, on to DAOs because DAOs and collectors, they're like integral to the, the way of thinking, even the identity really of the sort of Web3 social world. But like oftentimes the tooling and front ends that we work with today, they're, they're you know, they're, they're uh, limited, uh, you know, for, for individual use um, or potentially even the ones are, are sort of, there's less of a social aspect to them. It's more about sort of the hard financials or the governance as, as we heard earlier. We've been thinking a little bit about how DAOs um, can have a sort of collective presence, giving them, you know, almost like a social soul of their own on the social graph. So you've given a little bit of a scroll there. 
There we go. Lovely. Uh, yeah. So, like social media today really is built for individuals um, and groups and companies like do have profiles. Um, the user experience is, you know, still orientated really around an individual person who controls the organization's account or perhaps, you know, maybe a, a, a team in bigger organizations and the like as well. And those platforms really are not set up at all for any sort of decentralized or ad hoc communities that may have, you know, a range of ways of organizing themselves that might not fit into these sort of strict buckets. So like, what if there was uh, different voices in a community could come together under one profile, maybe one pop-up ad hoc profile without giving any one person complete control? And we kind of have this, you know, we have multi-sig crypto wallets where we can, you know, let a group of people follow, you know, a collective policy for transferring digital assets. But how about that for sort of a, a profile, if you like, for, for uh, managing, you know, a social presence of a collective? Yeah. What if a community could have a profile at a publication channel with a user uh, interface that really suits its governance style, its tools? Uh, maybe what if you could have pop-up sort of uh, communities around these things? What if there was like local fans of uh, Taqueria in Los Angeles were able to compete to win the right to post a review under, under a shared account? And then what if digital native companies could easily distribute control of their social media feed to every single employee so that everyone kind of has um, an ability to uh, contribute to, to the presence on the web. And if you give us another scroll there, Ramon. Um, yeah, we've got a sort of sense of how you can make decisions about identity, uh, but how do we sort of get a sense of the members beyond just uh, you know, a pseudo anonymous address? And those have become obviously significant organizational structures in the Web3 space, bringing in completely new ways of organizing communities, treasuries, voting on change, distributing funds, but, you know, they're focused on right now, maybe enabling the sort of uh, the financials uh, and the operations. Um, they're becoming increasingly harder to manage uh, and they're becoming very fragmented and siloed across lots of different platforms. Like we all know the Discord problem. Uh, so what if those were built on a suite of tools that really helped to integrate not just governance and finance, but also a sense of identity and a sense of community and communication? And those on-chain tools for DAOs right now, they're, you know, they're typically centered around the voting and finance, like I mentioned, and they're uh, by default sort of pseudo-anonymous with no identity, no sort of social presence um, attached to any sort of voting or anything. But what, if you introduce sort of social connections to individuals and content represented on chain, then tools can expand to include that social and productivity features that otherwise you know, would exist you know, completely off-chain in other different silos. So what if DAOs had a dashboard for members that automatically showed the collective interests, maybe the authorship and the favorite content of its members? What if DAOs had a set of tools that enabled them to have one view of their operation, their communications solving that Discord problem? And what if DAOs uh, had more elaborate voting systems based on group membership, allowing some communities to run in sort of representative manners perhaps with boards and committees empowered to make certain decisions alone? We just opened uh, opened three sort of boxes just now, but there's a lot more to explore, and I'm going to ping it over to Ramon to take us home with the wildcard section. Thank you. So that that went broad. Um, so we talked about kind of like the idea of like an open social graph and how empowering that can be. We talked about kind of like building potential new lens tooling that kind of like helps expand the ecosystem itself. We talked about kind of like the idea, the ideas or concepts that kind of like to, to evolve to create the economy itself. And we kind of like, we know that DAO tooling is a huge emergent space that needs a lot kind of that, that is growing and thriving right now. And uh, needs this social character. So kind of with those things, one thing where we wanted to end with or go now is like looking a little bit more and like how could this manifest itself into front-end experiences or looking into that space. And so we have a couple of sections here that we want to run through, through a little bit to just inspire you to kind of like see how the world is already super social, but it can, can now like where we can hopefully now put a web free twist on it or make it more web free native and a big belief we we have a big belief that music is in inherently social we go to concerts we share playlists we have a deep connection to artists 
themselves and like we want to like like uh, we want to get like be connected to them we often are more willing to pay to an individual artist a significant amount than to to kind of like to a service so kind of like how can we rethink the relationship between an artist and uh us and create novel music platforms that take this web free mentality of ownership and relationship together and kind of like build new uh, primitives uh, that are that enable new things to do there. I think it's also going there with uh, with the, the the gaming world that is social by default, right? It doesn't matter if you play alone together in with others around you in in a uh, in a game like Fortnite, Roblox, or all of this, but like those games become more alive if there if there are real people around you that you can interact with. But gaming is not just inside a game; it's like the whole world of of Twitch, Discord, all of this. This kind of like economies and worlds around games itself. That like even in this even in this chat right now, we have a chat going on on the side where we have. A conversation going on and that we use the prompts to bring it into our live conversation right now here so kind of like how can we move from those very broadcasting tools to kind of like more interactive elements and conversations and like that that bring multiple worlds together in novel ways so so one way is like how can we how can play be even more social like what would it be to build the uh, iOS game center on top of lines to easily find, find friends to play against with. Like we all probably had our wordle moment in the last couple of weeks where we just kind of like also love to show up how good we were on Twitter or not uh, as me. But like the idea is kind of like we love those connections. We love to compete. We love to kind of like like comp challenge our friends and like a lot of this kind of gaming is super social so but right now it's locked into specific worlds so can can we do this even make more social and what this makes me also super interested about is like i spent way too much time building up my gta 5 character in gta online and like that is a part of my identity too what if an online an in-game character has its own social graph too and how can we build those worlds around that one thing that we haven't touched yet, but like we want to go back is, yes, we talk a lot about lens tooling and like uh, DAO tools and all of this, but like e-commerce is one of the prime reasons the internet exists and thrives and grows. And like what we know from history is that wherever you establish a market, a community will build around it. No matter if it was the Silk Road, a, a marketplace in a, in a Southern European city that the whole town is, coming together to kind of like exchange gossip and news and whatever happens around it, like markets build culture, right? And like, even like looking at like the, like marketplaces like Depop or Facebook, they're in, they're extremely social too. And I think we can go to the next level, like where we can actually see what our friends are up to, what our friends are recommending, what, what, they are using right now or not using where we can maybe get early access to it. And even like Rich was talking about uh, rethinking algorithms based on our preferences. There's a lot of like ways how we can rethink shopping itself. And like, let's be honest, like Instagram turned into one of the greatest shopping malls in all time. So like shopping is social. So how can we gain the control a little bit more back and like using it uh, for us? The other thing is, I think we sometimes miss that even the way we work and all of that is social too. This talk was created in Figma and FigChamp, right? That's how, how we, at least as our team, are working. It's like you're following other people around in a file and like you're building connections there too. So no matter if you use Notion, GitHub, Figma, or all of those tools, even Google Slides, there's a lot of like social elements and moments that we create. And I, I think, again, it's it's about kind of like making sure that you find your friends, that you can create new assets and all of that together. That makes it extremely powerful to think about like, what does it mean when we have an open graph and we bring it together with the composability of Web3, together with the potential new business models that we can make, think through that come through DeFi and blockchains in general to kind of like create, like rethink work, social gaming and all of that together. I want to end with 
one of my favorite things is like I think we it's easy to get super heavy weighted in those conversations. And one of our like favorite ideas that we just want to leak here and show here is like the, around the ideas of memes. And a little bit background here is like for me the when I think about TikTok or all of memes, it's like this is web free culture. It, like someone creates an expression and others start to build on it. Like memes are composable by default. Like that's how they work, right? We're building on top of each other and it creates this ecosystem of reactions and interactions and evolutions and all of those, like they grow. And like, so one thing that we start to think about and even like just kind of like, how can we build a social network just around memes? And I think that just show, that for us shows um, the actual power of Lens itself, right? We can, we could build the next evolution of Apple Music or Spotify. We can lean into it, building a social network, but it can be as small or nerdy as just a forkable meme creator on chain that kind of like shows you to build how your memes are spread and then evolving over time. And like that, that for me makes this super interesting. So to kind of like summarize where we ended with our thing is like we we started with that a social graph we really just kind of like at the tip of an iceberg here right we talked about it's really about uh, empowering you uh, us ourselves it's about kind of like that this is bigger than twitter and facebook and covers other things and it's really about expanding what lens can be from visualizing our networks to rethinking about how we label things and organizing it for better algorithm. It's about kind of like better matching between creators, more insights from our relationships between fans and audiences and new business model, and also kind of like the whole aspect of community itself. So this was a lot of talking from our side, and we hope that we at least could bring up the iceberg a little bit and like show a little bit more potential of like how big this opportunity actually is, especially when we start to cross connect the services that we build on top of it all together. Um, I do think we have a couple of audience questions. So I think that's a perfect moment to kind of like close this uh, conversation and like hear what are some questions. So let's freaking build this together. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for uh, going through that amazing talk. And um, um, there's so many amazing comments and how well kind of thought out everything that you talked about is, as well as uh, just overall the, the detail and the attention you put into uh, preparing this. So it was it was super insightful. So the few questions I want to ask, and uh, we'll kind of go to as many as we can uh, until we kind of run out of time. But uh, I, I guess the first kind of question that comes in is, from kind of your perspective, having been on now both sides, like what do you think is a difference between being a designer in Web two and and now in Web three? Like, are there any specific things that stand out, or or kind of how do you assess or contrast both? I I can take take this one. I think like on a crafts level, it's not that much a difference. But what is different is that you have to think more about building for a community, building with others. You have to. Uh, uh, Appreciate that everything is composable. Like if you design a brand, it's about you have to embrace memes and that others will take the brand further. So it's a lot about giving control away and like en enabling others. So I think on that one, on a product design lens, I think the reality is that we have to acknowledge we are still in a super early nerdy stage. It's very technical often. You, you have to understand some of the smart contracts fundamentals to kind of like, like especially in the more complicated like DeFi areas to kind of like really push what design can do. And the reality is, I think there's just not as many of us designers out there. So you can't find that great inspiration first. So we need to find more of us to, to really push what design can do in this field. Absolutely. And if anyone else wants to add something, feel free to go for it. If not, I'll move on to the next question. All right, cool. I'll, I'll do the next one. So uh, kind of the other piece is uh, you talked about uh, essentially kind of how do you present information and, and what will be a, a good way to think about how Lens can make that easier. But um, what would you imagine sort of like the user ends up feeling uh, 
Uh, and uh, so I'll try to make this verbatim. So uh, how do you imagine the users might feel different when interacting with a Web3-based social media network? Um, like what kind of different emotions would they, do you think they might experience compared to the current social uh, kind of net norms or just networks out there? And, and do you think this is a different emotive experience too, or is it just a different way of thinking about where the data is and who controls it at the end of the day? And it's a bit of an abstract question, but uh, that that is a great question. Yeah. <laughs> and, I, and I don't think it's one that we'll know the answer to until we start to build stuff, right? And we start to put things in front of people and gauge reactions. Um, but ultimately, I think it's ho hopefully we'll be evoking an interesting reaction. Uh, the, the whole sense of ownership really is is what what a huge piece is here, and hopefully a sense of I guess. Um, I guess a lot of trust has been degraded from some of the sort of bigger centralized sort of social media providers. And I'm, I'm curious to see, uh, and at least from, from research that I've done on other projects about how, uh, how folk are sort of perceiving those current uh, social media providers now versus sort of the newer ones, which are decentralized by default and sort of, you know, have a lot of sort of trustless stuff um, baked in as well. So I think lo lots, to, lots to see, but hopefully um, a little bit of interesting stuff against the backlash of the centralized incumbents. I think two things to add, like, I, I really think the, the, the fact that you own your content and you're in control of it and you can decide what happens with it will change quite a bit how we think about what, how we create content, what content will be created and how content is curated. I think we haven't touched that space enough that creators are important, curators are the next big thing. The other thing is like, I, I actually think rage quitting will be a superpower as like we're in the sense of like if your data is portable and you're in control you actually like rage quit is actually something that can be a force for good right where like where if someone builds a better user experience a better way to moderate the content as you want it to see that has better privacy section it's not like you're locked into a system, you quit and move over. And I think that hopefully creates a lot of new competition and innovation of like actually exploring what this world even can be. Yeah, big plus onto that. A lot of stuff that we heard from Lee, Stani and Balaji earlier around this idea of like a race to create the, the best front ends, most novel and most interesting. And hopefully that's just going to drive a great user experience, which we're all excited about. Agreed. And uh, we have uh, the final audience question I want to ask and then we can... Uh get to the next talk is, um, how do you feel about the real-time distributed collaboration sort of world in Web3? Uh, do you think that's going to be interactive, like maybe like this, this call we're in, um, or do you think that's more on kind of the broadcasting side where we're like a Twitch where people just kind of consuming what somebody's doing, but it's not really interactive? Oh, I think on it, on it, honestly, I think that the reality is, uh, COVID and Corona, the pandemic changed the way how we think about collaborating together, right? I was at IDEO before and post-its were my life and now I haven't touched a post-it for two years. And like, I do this all through, through Figma and it changed the way we work. Before that, I couldn't imagine it. And like the technology might sometimes still buggy, not there, but like, I think real-time async, we find new ways and we, we use it in appropriate ways, right? Sometimes we want to lean back and just enjoy Twitch. And sometimes I actually would love to kind of like be the annoying person on the side that can actually influence as a audience Twitch for the ones I'm watching playing. And like, I think there will be new forms of interaction that can be enabled through those things. And like, it, it's probably like, it's not A or B, it's a gradient of things that we are enabling here. Absolutely. Well, Simon, Ramon, Rich, thank you so much for that amazing uh, talk. And um, this was just oh. great. So thank you so much. Thanks, thank you. Bye-bye. And with that, we are ready for our next panel. So uh, collaboration is a, a very recurring theme here for today. And uh, what we're gonna talk about next is just what the future of creating new things on chain looks like, whether it's music or um, artwork or anything else in between. Uh, there's a lot of room here and there's a lot of uh, tooling as well as uh, context that we can kind of bring in from how we use tools existing uh, in the existing Web2 world and to kind of, uh, talk about all these things, uh, I want to welcome Carmen.wave. and Olive Allen, and moderating this chat will be Cooper Turley, so I'll welcome all of them here on stage, and I'll let them uh, turn their videos on and say hi. Thank you, Karthik. It's good to be here, man. How are you feeling today? 
it's uh it's great to have all of you here so all right i'll, I'll let you take over and uh I'll, I'll get out of the way awesome hey guys what's up my name is cooper and i'm joined by an awesome panel here today we got some amazing creators on board so i want to spend this session really helping you understand what does a creator go through when they're tokenizing work on chain we have visual artists here, we have musicians, we have curators on the panel. And so in this discussion, I wanna really talk about the creator economy and specifically the tools that allow people to tokenize their creative work. So we'll start out with a quick round of intros. Carmel, I'll kick it over to you first and let's go ahead and go around the horn and tell everyone what you're working on. Sure, how's it going all? I'm Karma, I'm a musician, music producer and world builder. I'm currently exploring different experiments within Web3. So that being Song Camp, um, that being Wave World, which is a social garden, and really exploring how the ownership economy is going to impact creators and how value flow is going to flow throughout that. So excited to be here and get this panel started. Good to have you here. Kate, how are we feeling today? Hey, I'm feeling good. What's up, everyone? My name is Kate. I make music as Dot. I'm pretty new to the Web3 space, uh, currently just working on some drops with catalog and sound, but really excited to see um, what other tools begin to emerge uh, for music, particularly around uh, reaching new audiences. So, yeah. Love that. And last but certainly not least, all of how we feeling this morning. Hi, I'm great. Um, so I've been an artist and creator in Web3 since like 2018, since the NFTs emerged. Um, I don't know, I've been through a lot throughout the years and currently I'm working on my solo show that opens in New York on April 30th. Yeah, exciting. Nice. Why don't you tell us more about that? I feel like this is a really good place to start where you can kind of help people understand what does the life of a creator on Web3 look like and how are you going to be able to bring that to the masses? Um, I guess a lot of the creator is the same. Uh, I mean, throughout time. So you just, you know, like creating work, hoping, you know, it makes sense, you know, every single day. That's what it is. I mean, Web3 difference is that um, time goes much faster right there are a lot more going on there are a lot more noise which is good and bad at the same time um yeah i mean as i'm preparing for the show i'm i'm taking a bit of time off to focus i i don't check social media as much um yeah web3 can be very very distracting because there's yeah. so so many people from all over the world versus traditional art world when you're just like in your scene in your city like new york la whatever right and that's about it. But this is like a global economy. It's really economy at scale, which is fascinating and challenging at the same time. Yeah, so I want to start. I want to start there because I feel like you being around since 2018, you've really seen the whole wave of on-chain creation platforms. So things like Foundation, Zora, um, Super, OpenSea. You know, I could name five or six other ones probably. I would love for you to just give a quick overview of when you're thinking about tokenizing your creative work, what does that process look like for you? And how has that changed from when you first started to maybe some of the options you have on the table today? Well, I've been a founder myself. Um, I was building an early marketplace in early 2018 um, with a mixed degree of success. So I understand the whole process. I minted my first drop in early 2019 on OpenSea, and it's been a very challenging process. Like it has changed a lot since. Um, with the emergence of new platforms that made it easy, that um, made it work for creators and etc. I, I feel like now it's so like, I don't know, you don't even need to explain how to mint your work. It's so easy. Like mm. I see a lot of my friends be like not even asking before to be like, oh my God, how are you even doing that? It's so complicated, so challenging. Like how do I install MetaMask? How do I go on OpenSea? But and that process simplified so much and um, it's a delight to see. Uh, I mean, there are tons of platforms. There, in, uh, there's a new platform like emerging every single day. I feel like, but uh, honestly, as a creator, um, having so much choices, I, I resort to having my own contract and minting my own work because I, I don't know. I, I don't think platforms can do as much for me at this point than before. I feel like in the early days, there were four like main platforms: Makerspace, Nifty Gateway. What else? Super rare and maybe open C, but nobody was like using it much for minting. Uh, and yeah, everybody knew what's going on, what drop is happening, and so where to get stuff. But now, if yeah, it's just like if you don't see it on Twitter, like, you don't know what's happening. If you miss an email, there's so many platforms, there's so many creators. That what became a yeah. challenge, even though all of the platforms play 
to be created uh, curated at some point at, at, at to some degree right like it's like you always need to be plugged in 24 7 like not to miss your favorite artist your favorite musician or your the job that you want to get so and i know a lot of people are on it 24 7 and that's a full-time job for sure i mean as, as you as you probably know yourself yeah absolutely yeah, I would say um, you highlighted something really important there, which is custom smart contracts. So I want to come back to that in a second, because I think that's a really fascinating conversation topic. Okay, first, maybe turning this over to you as a musician who's been tokenizing their creative work. Can you talk about the process with uploading to catalog and sound and maybe what that experience looks like? Yeah, um, I have been kind of shocked, actually, by how simple it's been, um, you know, coming from 10 years of experience in, in like web two music industry and dealing with heaps and heaps of paperwork, not getting paid, um, you know, having to hire an attorney for, you know, some of the most simple of tasks to then be able to upload music and write a quick description, get it out there. And then, you know, immediately receive value if someone chooses to collect that it's, it's just a whole different world. So that's been really, really fascinating to experience. Um, yeah, it's, it's been surprisingly easy. I'm keen to see, uh, you know, what um, sort of what f like further tools emerge for uh, creators to be able to not only collaborate with fellow artists, but also build in structure for artists to um, make sure that their teams are also getting paid. Um, one of the benefits that I see of this greater efficiency is having artists who are maybe at a, a earlier stage in their career be able to hire managers or hire um, agents, hire people to assist them at an earlier point. Um, so finding ways for them to also be able to collaborate with their teams, I think is going to be important in the future. Yeah, I'll give a quick shout out here to a project called Zero X Splits. I know that this was born out of an ETH Global Hackathon, but they're doing really great work right now on routing on chain payments. Would highly check it out for those who haven't heard of it. And I guess kicking this over to you, Karma, I think you have a really good lens on this because a lot of the work you do is with collaborators. You know, it's putting people in a room together, finding experiments to bring this together. Um, what does that experience look like for you? And what are some of the platforms that you guys are looking to when you're choosing to make your creative work? Yeah, of course. So I would say, yeah, the marketplaces like catalog, like sound, that are more curated. There's always like something like Manifold if you want to go through your own contract. As far as collective creation, which we do a lot in Song Camp, and actually right now I'm part of Camp 3, which is called Camp Chaos, which is an experiment where 80 people, 50 musicians, and the rest are operators, economics, is basically going to release as one headless artist. And we're actually really using 0x splits. That was one of the biggest things we needed in our camps to orchestrate this whole thing. Some of the zero X splits, devs are in it. So I would say for collective creation, I think the splits and selection did a beautiful drop on sound have really changed the game. It was something that was so needed for musicians. Um, and as Kate said, right, like the traditional way royalties work, it can be so backlogged. It can be hard. There's a lot of administration. So I think using smart contracts to really um, be able to track all of this and have it be transparent is such a game changer. And on the other side of things, it's like, I've made music since I was three and to have people value like a wave file, right? And pay for that where I've only ever made money from other like avenues of music is really a shift. And I noticed that even myself as a musician and collector, because for me, it's blurring the lines, right? I think the lines between what is a musician, what is the collector, what is a fan is kind of getting blurred. And we're gonna allow for this new bottom up um, creator economy to emerge, so. Uh, I would say that's the that's where I'm currently at. Love that. Yeah, I'll definitely give a big co-sign for Song Camp and Chaos. It's a fantastic community of producers. And for those of you who aren't aware, there's a weekly call every Monday at 1 PST. I'd highly recommend checking it out. Um, Olive, I know that Karma just mentioned Manifold, which I think most people in the creator economy recognize as sort of a leading toolkit if you want to be more independent with your sovereignty around minting. I know you mentioned you have your own custom smart contract now. Can you talk about what that process looked like for you? You know, maybe uh, first yeah, and foremost, Manifold did it. That. And Manifold right. made it like back in the day when they didn't have a platform. Um, I was a part of uh, Christie's auction back in July. Um, oh my God, it's almost a year ago. Jesus, time flies. Um, and they were making smart contracts for everybody who was uh, dropping their artworks and so it stayed. Um, yeah, and it turned out to be the most convenient way for me in terms of tracking provenance, which is important. 
And yeah, collectors like tend to prefer it. So like they know it's my smart contract, that's the provenance, it's real, you know, and right, especially for one-on-ones. It really does make sense for larger drops. I, I don't think it does, you know, it's something else. I'm planning of like making a game, it's like a larger project um, this year, like next year um, release. And yeah, definitely we're writing different contracts for that. But for one-on-ones, like provenance of uh, artwork, uh, uh, manifold contract is great. And I think every artist should look into that because as a platform's like, no, I, I'm a, I was like early artist on Nifty Gateway and like go find my work. Like it doesn't on the back end, it doesn't really show that is my work necessarily mm-hmm. or anybody's work because it was minted from one wallet. So everybody's yeah. work is minted from one wallet and it, uh, virtually not distinguishable within like one wallet, right? So it's yeah. not the best provenance going forward. Like now you know Nifty Gateway, but tomorrow it might cease to exist. And like you wouldn't really find it like 10 years, 20 years from now. It's virtually impossible to prove that it was your artwork, in fact, minted that time. So that was a big, big flaw. I think they are realizing it right now. Yeah, and smart contract yeah. is to go. Yeah, I think I, it's really a testament to the times. You know, like the fact that Nifty Gateway was able to realize that they needed to offer self sovereignty with smart contracts. Um, it just wasn't something that I think anyone thought about at the time. But I think it's a good, you know, telltale sign of where we're going. Sorry, Karma, I know you wanted to add something in. There. No, no worries. I just wanted to add on that for creators. Um, I think it really is important that if you are going to go with a platform, some platforms will actually create your own smart contract. So that exactly what you're mentioning, right? That your smart contract is going to exist if the platform fails, right? Because we know how crypto goes. You can see 2017 music platforms. So I think sound is minting their own smart contracts. And I do think it will be a trend towards sovereignty on the smart contract because that's really the game changer. The fact that it's not at the platform level, it's at the protocol Mm -hmm. level. So yeah, really important point. Yeah, I want to stick on this point for one second, because I think for the hackers that are listening, this is really a fascinating design topic. When it comes to creating your own custom smart contract, when it comes to minting from your own custom smart contract, are there any uh, issues you guys have experienced with sort of that ease of uploading relative to some of the more convenient flows that we talked about with the platforms? Or what are some of the current, you know, maybe blockers or design areas that exist within the smart custom smart contract space? I don't know if Manifold has a front end. I'm not so sure about it. I'm doing everything like through a like back end, like through either scan. But if you think about it, it's not very convenient if you don't know what to do. So it's like not for everyone. I don't know if they have like a front facing, like a user facing platform right now. I have no idea. They might. Yeah. I would definitely echo that sentiment. I mean, I work with a lot of creators on building out their Web3 products. And I think that the biggest issue I see right now with custom smart contracts is conceptually, it makes a ton of sense. I think people want to have self-sovereignty and be minting tokens from their own source. But I think the tooling to be able to do it easily as a non-technical creator is very difficult. You know, if you're able to navigate Etherscan, if you're able to go into Terminal, I think that it's fantastic. But one thing that I would really call out to Uh, the developers listening to this is that the tools around creating custom smart contracts and being able to easily mint from those contracts, I think that there's a lot of designer there. That's anything from expanding the scope beyond one of ones to doing additions and generative art to just very simple tools where I can go in and just plug and play. You know, I don't have to be an ether scanner or terminal to deploy this. So, you know, I guess, um, Kate, maybe turning this over to you as a question, you know, as someone who's kind of newer to the Web3 space, what is the conversation around sovereignty looked like for you? Has it been important? Is it something that you've learned about over time? Or when did this really come into your orbit as being, you know, a discussion topic to even have in mind? Um, Yeah, it's definitely important. It's something that I know I've been talking with a lot of other artists about, particularly around like how much power are we giving to certain platforms versus having, you know, full control over how we want to mint and then release our work. Um, so I don't really have like a, I guess, a clear answer or <laughs> definitive thoughts on this yet. But, um, you know, I think it, it, it is something, you know, that is important to consider. And, and as amazing as some of the tools are and some of the platforms are that currently exist, um, I think it's going to be more and more important also for people to just have full autonomy or full control over their own contracts, not be reliant on other platforms to mint their work or distribute their work um, and figure out ways of, of doing that and like going forward. So, yeah. 
Nice. And then one topic I want to get into here, you know, the metadata of NFTs is something that I think is a little bit more low key from the average collector. I don't think we talk about it very much, but I'm really curious to hear, maybe I'll, I'll start with this on your end. Um, how do you think about metadata relative to your NFTs that you're creating and where does it kind of slot into the, the conversation? Right, right, right. I've been thinking a lot about it. I know there are two ways to save the metadata right now. I mean, um, obviously, um, three ways, actually. It's not true. Um, IPFS, like the old fashioned way, but most reliable, like um, ARV. Um, I don't, they say it's better. I don't know. It's hard for me to tell if it's better or not, but like you have to get tokens. But in the US, you cannot buy tokens. So it, it's a bit of a drag, to be honest. Um, mm. I don't know if it's better or not, but I don't have tokens, so I have to like stick to IPFS. And a uh, third way is actually um, embed art on chain itself, but like the size of the file should be very, very small. But if you mean in like fine artwork, it's MP4, and it's like a large, large file, it's kind of uh, borderline impossible. The gas fees will be astronomical if you do that. Um, I know uh, some projects, uh, some crypto projects, PFP projects do that very successfully but the size um, of the files are very, very small and the PFPs allow that. It's like a small like avatar thing, maybe pixelated. It's a small file, so it's possible. Mm -hmm. So, but the, for my artwork, uh, not really at this point. So IPFS is the way, unfortunately, unfortunately. Yeah, and I guess Karma kicking this over to you, have there been conversations around this with relation to music NFTs and sort of the differentiating metadata standards that might be used relative to crypto art? Yeah, I mean, I think in general, music, and I know people are working on this from the catalog and Mint Songs team, suffers from a lack of metadata standards um, from a curation perspective and a discovery perspective. And I mean, yeah, what, what all the places that were mentioned is basically where music is being uploaded. I do think that uploading MIDI on chain is a pretty interesting thing. I know Beats Foundry is doing that. I like that concept. Um, but like was said, like if you want to upload a wave file, it's going to be so expensive to mint on chain. So right now, primarily it's happening on IPFS and I know glass.xyz, I minted a video on there. They're working on our weave. So I do think for like the builders out there um, in the catalog discord, there's a music NFTs like metadata standards. And I think the work around that is going to be super important just so we have composability between platforms and between protocols. So I think that's really where the biggest bottleneck is in music um, as far as metadata standards. Yeah, I think this is a great transition because we've been talking in the first part of this panel about sort of the technical layers of creation. So custom smart contracts, metadata. I think the social aspect is something that's really important and unique relative to sort of the creator economy that's being developed now. So I guess, Doc, kicking this over to you, how do you think about minting your music on platforms like Catalog or Sound versus you know a typical distribution system where you just put it through a distributor and it's on all platforms? Do you see any bottlenecks with that? Or how do you sort of view having different platforms, um, you know, host different content that are kind of existing in silos right now? Yeah, um, I, mean, I think the biggest difference for me right now, like putting something on catalog, for instance, versus um, like Spotify uh, is catalog or sound is a very, very small, very niche community still at this point. So you're, you're reaching, um, a small a like fewer number of people but very potentially like high quality quote unquote fans like people who genuinely want to engage with you on all these different levels um so i think just as far as like volume of users go like that's that's a very big difference um it's it's something that's highly highly curated um versus like a spotify or apple music there's just this massive volume of music coming through and while while there are ways that we are sort of curating it while you know there's playlisting there's all these different options um it's so much more saturated so i'm i'm eager to see kind of what happens as these platforms continue to grow and expand um, and get more users not just on the collector side of things but um get more and more musicians involved or creators involved um yeah, I forgot where I was going with that. So I lost my train of thought. But that's been the biggest difference is just, I think, number of people who are actively engaged. Um, yeah. Yeah, I love that. And I'd really echo sort of the quality of the average contributor right now and the people that are collecting these works. But I think, you know, one of the things that we take for granted for things like Spotify and Apple Music is you can search any song in the world, or it's going to show up, you know, irregardless of the streaming service that you use, it's typically there. And so I guess, Karma, kicking this over to you from a collector standpoint, 
How do you think about music discovery right now in the lens of Web3? And what are some of the challenges you see around, you know, not being able to find music or being kind of too buried because it's only in one place? Do you see any areas of improvement there? Yeah, I've, yeah, I think that's where most of the building has to be done as far as like curation, discovery and social and really taking a bottom up approach to it, right? Like what type of curation wasn't possible before that now is possible? I know you made a great tweet actually around gatekeepers versus curation, right? And it's a really tough problem to solve. And we see it across the sentiment of musicians being like, I want to be on catalog and sound, but I can't get on. And I think it's really important to keep in mind that there's a reason that it's being curated the way it is, right? Because if we just leave it open, there's going to be so much supply that the demand is not going to be there to keep up with it, plus a quality control issue, right? So I do think the approach, and these platforms are already going towards that route, is slowly like giving it to the artist and then the community, and then hopefully like actually just creating a new type of incentive system. And what I would like to see is curation at like a protocol layer that works across the platforms. So it kind of just takes a little bit of that curation power away from them. But like right now, to be honest, it's all happening off social and it's mostly Twitter, right? Like, let's be honest. It's still like most of discovery and curation is happening as a result of attention harvesting algorithms, right? And it wasn't like made with bad intentions originally, but I think they have emerged to be these new information ecologies that they optimize for time spent on site, but not time well spent, right? So for me personally, as a creator, like I'm a lot more into having a small amount of listeners that are like actively listening to it, engaging with it than having this huge, huge reach, but it's not an or thing, right? I think it's, a, it's an and thing. Right now, web two is acting as this reach and web three is acting as this depth. The question is, is how do we start solving the problem of reach and bringing it into a more Web3 native way? So that's like my, where my head's at around things and maybe even rewarding people who are curating. I think curators themselves, and it's like collectors are almost curators. I think that's gonna be a really large emerging trend. Yeah, and I think that's a, a good area just to kind of give a shout out to the sponsor of this panel. You know, Lens Protocol, I think is a really awesome solution for this. You know, I'm hopeful that there can be a world where instead of us doing all of our distribution and social experience on Web2 platform like Twitter, there can be something that's a little bit more on-chain native like Lens. And so I guess I'll turning this into a question for you. How do you get in contact with your collectors today? You know, like when you have this event coming out on April 30th, is there a way for you to contact, you know, holders of your NFTs? Or what are some things that you would like to see in that regards, just being able to have a more direct line of communication with them? Um, honestly, yeah, that's a challenge. That's uh, um, reaching out to collectors. Like that's real challenge. Like you're relying on Twitter algorithm, literally, and maybe Instagram. Like okay, a bit better, but honestly, it's it, it's been a headache. I, I don't have a good answer. I'm just reaching out one by one, and I've been doing it for a very very long time. Like a lot of my collectors, I don't even know. Like uh, you know, like for like 2018, 2019, I, I don't know where they are. Literally. I don't even know why wallets are active, like if they're in Twitter, like, yeah, maybe I should have been cataloging it better there. Maybe, I don't know. It's interesting point. Like uh, I'm thinking, I'm actively thinking about it right now. It's like very hard to reach those people and it's very hard to reach anyone. And the crypto space was a lot of noise. I re if you guys have ideas, solutions, please do, like, do share. Yeah. I mean, I think this is, um, it's really interesting because in Web2, we have email lists, right? And if someone buys your product or if they subscribe somewhere, you can send them an email and say, check this out. We don't really have that on chain right now. You know, again, just to give a, a shout out to Lens Protocol, I think that there's some promising signal in that direction, you know, in particular, being able to query someone's on chain activity. You know, did I buy something on catalog? Did I buy something on sound? Did I buy something on foundation, nifty gateway, OpenSea, whatever it is, and starting to build more of a social graph? You know, I'm excited for this next chapter of Web3 Social because I think it's really going to power, you know, Web3 native artists. I think to all of this point very early in this conversation, right now, if you're a creator in Web3, you need to be full-time on Twitter for the most part. I mean, obviously I think it's really important to take breaks and not be on there, but I think we see time and time again that a lot of the success Web3 creators have are how tied in they are on a day-to-day -day on Twitter. And so I guess, um, Don, I'm gonna turn this one over to you because you've been, you know, really crushing in that regard recently. Did you ramp up, you know, your social activity specifically on a platform like Twitter with relation to your activity in the music NFT community or what did that process look like? Yeah, I did make a conscious um, effort to to start ramping that up. Um, and it's definitely been 
I won't say like a point of strain or stress. It's it's work that I'm happy to do. Like I love I love creating music, and so anything I can do to share that with other people in whatever form that may be is wonderful. Um, but I I think you know going forward, I would really love to see ways for creators to reach collectors and also reach new audiences that really prioritizes like the medium that they're already working in versus their ability to you know, be funny on Twitter or, um, you know, it, for me also, I, I work in audio mostly and um, a, a, a platform like Instagram is really prioritizing images. It's visual. And so it's like the success or failure of a post about your project is not even based on the work itself. It's based on this other aspect of like, you know, a visual representation of the music. And and so that's been, I think, really challenging for, for musicians specifically. We don't have a lot of platforms, you know, maybe Audius is something that, that prioritizes the sharing and discovery of just the audio itself. Um, or you know the web 2 version of that could be like soundcloud where there was also that social aspect um but i i would love to see like more and more tools um that integrate like the social aspect of of, of music <laughs> sharing and, and community yeah let's stick on this for a second because i think a lot of the process for creating on-chain work does have to do with the social layer of it as well i mean i think that we see now that twitter spaces play such an important role in getting the distribution out there you know, doing these things like having private sales on a platform like Foundation. You know, Karma, I want to kick this one over to you because I think you're most, um, you know, active in this space. What does it look like for you to be able to relay what you're working on to the community you've built in Web3? Can you talk a little bit about sort of the relation Twitter and Discord have and some places people should be keeping in mind to help, you know, talk about distributing their creative work? Yeah, 100%. So I think primarily it's happening and it also depends on it. Like I'm a more Web3 native creator and I'm cool with that. Like I'm still doing things in Web2, but it's, very much so like I'm I love web three and for me and people asking this a lot it was very organically I feel like I was drawn to the way things were happening because of its eclectic nature I felt like finally in my life I could take all my different disciplines and kind of put them into one but it really is happening on Twitter and discord and like almost funneling into discord from Twitter the way I see it I think Twitter spaces were a huge game changer and I do like that conversations are happening right? That it's not this news feed based thing. People can hear each other's voices. But I think, and this is what the builder should be thinking about. It's the design principles and the design model and the ethics around how these networks are built. And they're incentivized to just keep you scrolling, right? They're incentivized to show more sensational content. So I think really building, and I love that idea of including audio, including the medium that we're already creating in, baked into the social layer. And I know sound like definitely touched on this. And I think it's a big reason for their success. Um, like I've met people because we've been on the same sound pyramid and then we are at an event and like now we're friends, right? So I think that social layer and also for the builders, the reason that music didn't have its PFP moment was partially because there was nowhere to display them, right? So I think having ability to display these things and use these things and interact with them in the social layer is going to be game changer. So, yeah. Great point. Yeah, I want to shift this conversation over to the consumption side of things because I think it's really important. We talked about minting NFTs with custom, custom smart contracts. We talked about distribution on different platforms, the social experience around marketing. But how about after you collect an NFT? You know, where are you showing that off? Where are you displaying it? How are you experiencing it? that? Um, there's two really awesome topics here, both with crypto art and music. I guess first and foremost, all of with the crypto art side of things, when it comes to people displaying the work that they've collected from you, what are some of the platforms and solutions you recommend? And maybe where there's still some, you know, open problems that people can be looking into? Um, right, like um, me as a collector myself, to be honest, um, I don't display my NFTs as much, honestly, and unfortunately, um, I just put them in different wallets and just I, I'll look through on OpenSea like what I have, the inventory, I'm like, okay, I'm checking on, okay, so still here good to have like wallet for fine art for whatever art uh, for something to flip the same like project whatever i got like i'm ashamed of getting that minting that shit so, like i don't want people to see my lens you know i organize in different wallets and 
like, yeah, I, I check on them sometimes, you know, because I'm like attached to Ledger, so I'm a hot wallet, you know, like, okay, still here, which is like not the best way, not going to lie. So I wish there was like a better tool, more secure tool to organize it somehow, but it is what it is right now. I don't display my lens or whatever PFPs. So I just, I have them. I hoarder them. Um, in terms of my artwork, um, well, different, like collectors played very differently. Um, I have works that I sold both print, like high quality print, attached with the animated NFT. That's the way, uh, collectors love that. Um, or there's some like high quality frames right now, like Lago frames, they have square frames, um, like pre-order only. Uh, some people have that, um, i will got to have them in my show. So people can just like buy the artwork, take it with the frame, take it home. So like, don't worry about the display. Like, uh, like it's it's yours. It's all included. Um, I feel like that's that's an easy way. Yeah, I mean, some people just put it on TV. You know, like good old way, and they like, have it right there. Or people have put them on their phones, like you know, like the the display. I I've seen that. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, and like someone else, like you can customize um, apps on uh, iPhone. Some people like did that. I know that I put my, some of my bears, some of my artwork for that. I mean, that that's a fun way to have yeah. it with you. I got all times, but yeah, I mean, I think like most of the people just like have them, you know, in their wallets and like look mm -hmm. at the art sometimes. Like, you know, like, hey, my Pokemon cards, like all with me. Like, oh, my NFTs is all with me still. Okay, nobody sell them. My apes, good, doing good. Yeah, um, nice. right. I mean, there are tools like spatial, like whatever you can have a metaverse exhibition. But I feel like it was a trend back like a year ago. People did like, I was like in a number of online exhibitions. Collectors would just like build a building, a museum, whatnot. A lot of people build the museums. But crypto art and they put like your artwork on their central land land. And yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think there's uh, still a lot to be done in this regard. I'll give a quick shout out to two that come to mind for me. Um, Gallery.so and OnCyber, I think, are both fantastic platforms to display art. But what I'm hearing from you, and I think this is a really interesting conversation topic, is that people have very different assets in their wallet. You know, they have NFTs that they're proud to own, NFTs that they're just using to flip, NFTs that they're not proud to own. Right now, they all just exist in one spot. Now, on OpenSea, I can go and I can hide certain assets, but it's very difficult for me to categorize, though, by different mindset. And so I think you bring up a really good point. And something that I see being, um, you know, a trend moving forward here is going to be, let's call it vertical specific wallets. So right now, if I have a wallet, I have all of my NFTs in one spot. But specifically for someone like myself, that's collecting a lot of music NFTs, it doesn't make as much sense for my music NFTs to exist directly next to my PFPs. And so I think a big area that we're going to see moving forward here is what do a music specific wallet look like? And maybe turning this into a question to you, um, Kate, when you're selling your music NFTs to people, how are they experiencing those or what do you, how do you think they're experiencing them? And when people want to listen to your music in Web3, you know, what are some of the ways that you think we can do a better job of allowing that to happen natively on chain? Yeah, I at this point, I'm I, thinking about this um, from my perspective also as a collector. There's not really, I think, a great way to share or display in some way like our collections like when i think about collecting vinyl for example it's something that i love doing um and as a dj too when i get the opportunity to like spin vinyl that's like a really fun opportunity to you know share these pieces of work that i've gone out to to find to like dig from the back of whatever bin at a record store and there's like a story behind each one and so that that social process also of like you know, going out somewhere, gathering with people and sharing this collection is really important to me and really special and valuable. And I would love to see um, sort of a Web3 version of that. I don't know at this point what that could look like, but I just know that so much of like music collecting um, when you are like gathering, I guess, vinyl, I keep bringing it back to that. Um, it, so much of that is, is very social and it's not as meaningful unless there's other people involved where you can share that with others. So I think figuring out a way to, to make that more of an experience for collectors is, is gonna be important going forward. Absolutely, I'll give, you, uh, give a shout out to Future Tape here. I think this is a project that's working in the direction of that, but I think there is still a ton of design work, whether it's displaying it as a playlist, whether it's having it as a vinyl collection. You know, I think one of the most exciting things about music NFTs, there will be a social layer associated with collecting. And to your point, maybe there's a day where if I want to DJ my music NFTs, I can only play it if I own the music NFT. 
you know, and there's some cool edge cases that emerge there. And so I guess, Karma, I want to transition this to you because I know that Song Camp talks a lot about this. You know, how have you guys been talking about, you know, music consumption, display, the social experience around it? And, you know, again, just ask the question, any blockers that you're seeing right now? Yeah. Yeah, no, I think this is honestly something I think about a lot because I have all these music NFTs and like, what do I do with them? Currently, what we do is we play them on BPM bot, which is a Discord bot we built to play catalog records. And or, like we recently, like the last month or so, added Zora and Sound. And that was interesting because honestly, that showed me the power of just this cross community collaboration because I was just in the sound discord. I'm like, I want to play my sound NFTs. And then another dev is like, I'm down to help build it. So I'm like, oh, let's just put this in BPM. We went into the wave world and we built it over a weekend. So to me, like that's the first step, right? Like at least having somewhere to play it. I mean, right now I don't play them in my car unless I play them through discord, which is literally what I'm doing. I'm playing them through discord, not the best, but I think also thinking about like, what is the offline version, right? Like I was on the plane. How am I listening to my music NFT? Um, I have future tape, but there's no way of like downloading them offline. And it really is about, I collect vinyl as well. And it's like, what is that displaying of the vinyl look like in a post skeuomorphic world, right? So like, what can you create to display music and interact with music that wasn't previously conceivable? Um, whether that be through smart contracts or some of the stuff Lens is building. But I think that's really where yeah, that's where my head is at. And as far as displaying them, like I have a gallery that I did it, but like, I feel like there needs to be a more music native one, right? Like I would like something with like spatial audio, like if you've ever been into Gather Town, where like you can go buy it and interact with it. Um, as well as like IRL ones. I know at ETH Denver, they have these motion sensor like for visual art. So that to me is interesting as well, right? Like how can you include the listener as part of the creation process? Because once you attach your identity or some type of emotional connection to it and you already get this by buying it from having skin in the game but that layer i think is what really also would be interesting to explore because i think that's what kicked pfps off right like having that status and having that way of like identifying with it because of the blind mint so interested to see what people are building there yeah i'm hearing a very big need for more projects around the consumption layer of nfts and i guess really just to round this out um right now we've talked about minting your work we've talked about the platforms you get it on you know, Olive, I want to I want to toss this one over to you and have this be kind of our last question for the session. But when you're getting your work out there into the world and choosing to have people hear about it or discover it more, what are some of the ways that you're doing that? And what are some of the you know areas that you're hoping to see some better improvements in? All right, that's my pain point. Like, how do I talk about my work? How I uh, tell people about it? Like, I've always been like shy to self promote myself. Maybe it's a cultural background. I don't know what that is. Um, I I don't know if I display my high value NFTs. I don't know. I'm weird about that. It's just such a weird thing. Um, I never had a Discord, uh, which perhaps is a great tool like to get organized. I'm like not very organized with those things. I'm not on Twitter every day. Sometimes like I'm not on Twitter like for three days. Is it like my engagement drops low? Like nobody like sees me for a, for quite a time. Um, yeah, but I'm active on Instagram. I, I guess it's a very like web two way, right? Like what artists did back in the day, they use, I mean, they still do like, it's nothing changed. They use Instagram and most of their collectors are on the gram, literally watching stories and they know what's going on. Like that's our world is on, on the Instagram, like everyone. That's how people discover things still, even in Web3, unfortunately, and like that, like um, Mark Zuckerberg's like own thing, which is sad. And Twitter is like bad algo. It's like, I don't know, maybe I feel like Web3 community should kind of like move into like better tools of discovery tools, better conversations. And maybe for me, personally, as a creator, uh, I feel like I really need to work on like being more active, doing spaces, doing my own Discord channel and like expand in that sense, right? Like yeah. uh, I'm actively trying to solve that. That's That's been my problem for quite a time. Like how do I reach out to people? Like, how, like who do I know? Like stuff like that. Yeah. So like, fuck, how do I do that? I think it's, right, it's a combination it's of both. You know, I feel like there's definitely a pressure right now if you are a creator in Web3 to be hyperactive on socials. I don't think that that's a mindset that suits many people. And for most of the creators I know, you know, they don't want to have a Discord. They don't want to be in there every single day talking to their fans. They want to make art. Yeah. So I guess uh, 
you mental know. health suffers if when you are like on social like 24 7 you, you don't have time to do the artwork you need to be yeah. in a process of flow right like if it interrupts by the message or whatever you will kind of lose it like that's like I I think it's, it's web too as well right especially in music you see that after covid hit and people stopped doing live gigs the industry went towards looking at tiktok as a metric right and like all the labels look at tiktok so i think it's it's a general thing with these algorithms being built from an incentive model where the advertiser is the customer and the creators are influencers which to me is like you're literally just worth your influence your art is nothing right like if someone else has influence we'll plug you in there and to me like that's the world i don't want to live in Right? I want to live in a world exactly like you're mentioning. That's incentivizing creators to have a balanced approach, right? Where they can be like, okay, I share my work, I talk to my collectors, but it's not predicated on feeling like I constantly have to like be on there, right? Because everyone feels that. I feel like the platforms want to make you feel like that because you will buy more things and spend more time on there. So I think it's really like from the ground up building with that design principle in mind. Yeah, Kate, I've seen you tweet a lot about this. Do you have any closing thoughts on this topic? Yeah, um, I guess just to, to ditto what the others have said, like, uh, I don't think um, our current incentivization to, to just be constantly active, constantly um, socializing or, or connecting with people is, is healthy for a lot of artists. Um, and it deprioritizes the actual work that we're trying to do. Um, so, you know, any anything that we can do to not only meaningfully co connect with the people who are either collecting our work or experiencing experiencing our work or wanting to connect with us like that is wonderful i think like having fewer but more meaningful ways of engagement would be really beneficial um <clears throat> excuse me and then also just meaningful ways of, of reaching new people again that doesn't prioritize like your constant activity on 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 a platform i think would be healthier <laughs> i love that well guys we're right at time here and just to give the audience a quick recap of what we talked about i think there's a huge need for easier to use custom smart contracts it seems like a pain point that everyone was feeling here i heard a lot around the consumption layer of nfts so how do i experience and display them and then lastly on the distribution side how do you get your work out to a web3 native audience and have direct communication with collectors that have bought stuff from you on chain and so I guess clean, cleaning it up here, um, let's go around and see where people can stay up with you post this conversation. All of will kick it over to you first. I know that you have a, a big IRL event coming up in April too. So tell us where we can stay up with you and learn more about it. Uh, so it's April 30th, um, my solo show called um, Welcome to the Metaverse. It opens at Postmaster Gallery in New York. It's Tribeca. I'll post more info and a flyer like um, like two weeks before. Some people won't forget it. Like it's like it's a month and a half. It's way, way advanced over notice. So yeah, it's IRL event. Um, basically opening uh, from six to eight is a bit of a party. Like everybody's welcome. I'd love to see everyone. It's going to be fun. A bunch Love of it. fun artwork uh, dedicated to the metaverse. Love it. I can't wait for it. Karma, what about you, man? Where can people stay up with your work? Sure. So I'm Karma Wave on Twitter and all other platforms. You can find my music on sound. I have a, I'll give you a little alpha, a little catalog release coming out. Um, and yeah, just tap in with me on Twitter. My DMs are pretty backlogged, but like I'll get to them eventually. Like back to our conversation, I think going with the seasons of life. So Right now I'm in a music creation process, but you can find me Karma Wave everywhere. Love it. Kate, what about you? Yeah, I am a dot music, uh, most platforms, D-O-T-M-V-S-I-C, um, putting out a bunch of new music this year in, in all of the places. So you can find me um, in Web2 spots or on sound and catalog. Um, gonna be playing a bunch of festivals this year too. So if you're at any of those, come say hi. But yeah. Love that. And uh, last but not least, I'm Koopa Troopa. Very thankful to have been hosting this panel. Kartik, thank you as always for giving us this space and it was a wonderful conversation. Cooper, thank you so much for moderating uh, this amazing chat and uh, Kate, Karma and Olive, thank you so much for uh, being part of it and giving out so many amazing perspectives. Really appreciate this. Thank you guys. Good luck with the rest of the hackathon. Thank you so much. All right. With that, we are ready for our next uh, amazing discussion. So the next topic I want to talk about is on uh, social data and unstoppable thoughts. Uh, it's, it's a pretty uh, broad and abstract sort of topic we'll kind of dig deeper into kind of how uh, we think about it. And uh, for this conversation, I'd like to uh, welcome Jonathan uh, from Starling Lab to, uh, to join me. Um, welcome, Jonathan. I'm glad that uh, we're able to kind of talk about this and uh, hi. 
Thanks, Kartik. Awesome to be here. Really excited. Awesome. So I want to start off by just kind of getting uh, more context uh, for everybody else and uh, kind of people understanding what you do. So we'd love to kind of get an intro on uh, who you are, what Starling is, and uh, um, and just everything that you uh, spend your time on. Sure. So the Starling Lab is based at Stanford and USC, and we are focusing on how to use Web3 technologies to advance human rights in, in three domains, history, law, and journalism. And we've been at this for about three years. So um, we've understood that as with everything in Web3, you got to be patient because stuff breaks and you got to figure out not only what are the possibilities of the tech, but um, our, our big focus has been how to actually integrate different solutions. So rather than thinking about one protocol or one solution that can try to do everything, instead, we're realizing that there are different tools that are out there that can be integrated together to create really robust solutions. Um, and so that... Um, has been exciting because you can imagine in the types of things we do across the different domains, you need to be flexible, right? And today, journalists don't know how to use these tools, right? Straight out of the gate. So you need to listen closely as to how they get their work done. Or for that matter, um, we're starting to work on uh, work in the Ukraine. It's a fast moving situation. It's very dynamic. And our, we understand what the lawyers need but we also know that Web3 tools are you know, struggling to even work in a basic way. So we need to simplify and create robust solutions. And, um, and that's really what the lab's all about, to just cut through the hype, make real stuff happen. Amazing. Is that more kind of a comment on like, how do you guys decide what to spend your time on? Is it a project-based thing or is it like a situation-based thing? Obviously you talked about Ukraine, but uh, how do you sort of measure the outcomes as well as what to focus next? Well, um, we got into this because we realized that there was just natural and intuitive things for us to do. So we started by focusing on taking vulnerable data and sensitive data and seeing if we can get that on chain. And that started with historical records. That was a natural thing. But what we realized very quickly was that we could start our chain of custody actually upstream, right? Rather than just taking records as they are, when we create new records, could we start, let's say, with video or images with a chain of custody that gets on chain in the camera itself, right? So part of what guided us was realizing that there were these interlocking things. So we have storage, we have capture, and then finally verification. Um, that was another area that very naturally led us to think about how as experts are reviewing information and trying to build confidence and context and clarity about it, uh, we needed to provide tools there. So that essentially was um, our, our approach to creating a framework. And all our metrics are around how we can deploy into case studies that are in the domains that I spoke about by using this type of framework again and again. Amazing. And kind of, uh, obviously there's a lot of room here to kind of go deeper into uh, all these things, but uh, I guess specifically focus on just what you, what you just kind of are spending your time on now. Um, what are some recurring themes that you sort of get into as you talk to the end users of these uh, technologies? Are they, like what stands out when they think about what three leverage kind of uh, solutions or any recurring themes around like this is what you get complaints about all the time? With Web3 technologies. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, wow. <laughs> it's, a, it's a big question. Well, I, let me start just by talking about the problems in general, and then we can kind of create the subset for Web3. Um, you know, today, I understand you guys are focusing on hacking around social media and, you know, with Lens and all sorts of really cool things that are being experimented with um, in creating new types of social profiles and methods for sharing information, et cetera. And what I can say is that the number one thing that we're addressing is that the social media platforms of today have very little context around the information which is distributed within them. So as an example, if I send a photograph um, on to you on Twitter, one of the very first things that Twitter does is it actually strips out all of the metadata that might help me establish the veracity or the authenticity of that uh, photograph. So it becomes a massive problem because people are essentially with that original choice, which has some wisdom to it, but, but um, in my view, it's outdated. Um, we're now really just start struggling to catch up from behind. So a lot of the challenges that we're addressing and a lot of the problems are that there's just bad hygiene. People haven't done proper schema. They haven't thought through the interlocking protocols and figure out like actually what's the optimal workflow. Essentially, it's just bad planning. <laughs> so um, I, I would say that the number one challenge that we're seeing in Web3 
is that it really uh, it can't actually address those problems. Um, it takes humans <laughs> to actually come up with better plans and better strategies and then use new Web3 technologies to help build confidence around good choices that you make at the beginning. Because if you're authenticating something, it's it's really it's garbage in, garbage out. Right. Right. So I think that's that's like the number one thing that we see is that it's just people have rushed, stuff is kludgy, they haven't thought through all the best practices. So that's in the human rights context, while we want to act and we want to be responsible, at the same time, like the stakes are so high. And so we can't afford just to put stuff out there uh, that's rushed. That's kind of one 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 big piece that we look at, just clarity and structure. The second, which is um, really important, is about performance. And thankfully, that's getting better with Web3. So I know there's, you know, the story of the last 18 months is surely a story about efficiency in terms of cost and performance. And so that keeps getting better and better. And I think that we're now at a point where interchain work is also going to get better and better. And so that I'm really hoping becomes a major accelerant and a story of 2022 is that we can start to use different protocols for different things. And that maybe I kick it off with an NFT, but then I immediately go into using three or four other protocols to achieve the type of consensus that I want to um, and the type of distribution that I want to. And, and I think that likely will produce more complaints, <laughs> right? Because more systems, more problems. Um, but at the end, it's just really important because if we're gonna keep Web3 decentralized and we're not just gonna go and recreate the BMS of Web2, right? And end up with the same problems that we that kind of got us here in the first place. Um, that requires us to be dedicated to this idea of interoperability. And so in spite of all the challenges, um, it's worth it. And, and we're hoping people keep at it. No, that's, a, that's an amazing answer. Um, kind of coming back to sort of what you're spending your time on now. Uh, I mean, th this event at Sacrifound is all about thinking about new ways to create social media platforms that are kind of crypto native or Web3 native. And there's a lot of ways you can slice that. There's a lot of ways you can think about what you want to pick on. There's, there, I mean, there's a realm of text. There's a realm of kind of possibilities around just other types of media consumption. Um, and all these things are sort of uh, being tried on for the next two weeks. But um, as you can look at the situation right now that's, that's out there in the world, like what do you believe is the role of social media um, in kind of documenting uh, in a way war crimes or any conflict? Yeah, well, to give you some context, because this is very applied for us. We, about three weeks ago, as the situation in Ukraine worsened and the war began, we realized that we had to spring into action. And our lab has been working for years on doing, uh, perfecting various forms of documentation for uh, war crimes documentation, human rights violation in Syria. Now that conflict, which got started 11 years ago, at the time, it was, um, if you remember, Karthik, it was the Arab Spring was dubbed like the Facebook revolution, right? Kind of unofficially. And you had all of these giant, well, at the time they were kind of growing, but Web2 platforms that um, were offering a new opportunity for people to start to document things just with their mobile phone, right? It was this incredible revolution. And they thought, maybe naively, well, certainly naively at the time, that, that would be enough. If you could just document it online, then you're good to go because the truth would be out there and dictators would come down. And Google has estimated that with that spirit, that there are now more hours of documentation on YouTube of the Syrian conflict than there are actual hours of the war in real life. Wow. Over the last seven years, that's how the torrent of information. Okay, so now 11 years later, here we are. We have... An, tremendous challenge in trying to bring people to justice. And people are documenting like they've never done before. However, the torrent of information that's coming in there and also the mechanisms for authenticating the information, it's, we, we still have a, a really, really difficult task ahead. Just showing the photo is not enough. As we saw, um, Zelensky was just featured in a deep fake video that was claiming that he had surrendered. So we had a lot of challenges, you know, just around trying to build trust, right? At the same time, just because you document something doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to get into, uh, be admissible for evidence. So there's a whole set of protocols that you can take to ensure that something has the best chance of being admitted in a court case. And if that's your goal for documenting war crimes, as an example, we need to take preemptive steps. 
And then the last thing, and this is really critical, the part of the problem with um, the rush in Web 2.0 was that everyone just put stuff online and they had just no idea as to what to do with um, dealing with the safety of the people that were featured in the video. And I think my biggest concern right now is that we are rushing and doing all forms of documentation, which is critical, but that record of all the things that, is, that people are putting up can be very easily taken and spun around from a tool that is just simply a tool of documentation for good to being a tool that now is used to surveil and to condemn people, to find people in their homes and take them away and imprison them, et cetera. This is the reality that many people in Ukraine may face um, as and how Russia proceeds in capturing territory and potentially taking over the country. And so while the initial intent is very important to preserve, that there's a, a spark of good here, the reality is that this can all go wrong very quickly. Okay, and then the final thing, which is that as you're trying to arbitrate whether or not to keep something up, content moderation becomes really challenging. And what we have found is that YouTube and Twitter and Facebook were put into this really difficult situation in which they had to decide what information do you actually keep up, right? So if you want to protect people, or maybe there's terms of service violations around like the brutality of what people are showing, does that deserve to stay up um, in spite of it being against common sense terms of service, right? And, but if you take it down, then maybe that would be then destroyed and potentially unavailable for war crimes investigators. So trying to find that balance of how you deal with securing the privacy of the individuals involved, but at the same time, getting information to the authorities that can act upon it and making sure it's admissible. All these things you could think of as problems. We think of it as opportunities. And we are really excited because um, we have been working. Well, let me take that back. There's nothing exciting about any of this. <laughs> um, we are passionate and we are dedicated to the idea that Web3 can potentially help. And so we're very carefully looking at how the tools that we've been working on could start to make a difference. No, thank you so much for uh, for that. Uh, just kind of thought process around. I mean, there, there are a lot of challenges here, and there's there's no perfect or right solution. There, there are multiple ways you can think about solving each of these. Um, and as you look at um, all the time that you spend understanding, like what should be done here as an next course of action, it, it is kind of if I'm understanding this right, and please correct me if, if I'm wrong. Is kind of the clarification here that this is more of a nuance between moderation and the content existing and the fact that like the data persisting is still separate from what should be done with it. And right now the, the conflation is that in, in the web two world, if the data doesn't persist, that it means there's no other way somebody would find out about it because suppression is real directly tied to the existence. Is that a fair statement or is that kind of where we are starting off? Of? It's all about authority, right, Kartik? It's like somebody has to make choices, right? And in the Web2 world, the platforms have said, we're, we're the ones gonna make all the choices. So we're gonna set the metadata standards, we're gonna set the modes of content moderation, <laughs> we're gonna figure out how to deal with identity and security, right? And that worked for a period of time, it kind of bootstrapped us to the point in which, you know, everyone got on these platforms. But now, obviously, we've realized that, well, I'm not so sure that I want um, Mark Zuckerberg determining, you know, the course of war crimes documentation. Doesn't seem like they may have all of the interests of everyone in mind here. And, and indeed, I mean, to be generous to some extent, like the platforms have been active this time around and doing a lot more. Um, and they've been consulting with the international human rights community. But the, the same challenge persists, which is, it's about agency, right? And so what I'm trying to emphasize here is that if Web3, you know, people talk about like cryptography and crypto and all that, right? Well, what exactly are the features that we really want to use, right? So the first part of it is that we want to use the ability to encrypt. And when you encrypt, and if you have the agency to encrypt, that also means you have the choice of who to allow access to this information, and you can then choose who can decrypt. Right, so that that first thing, if it's put in the power of the users, we already think that that's a better solution. Or if it's put into community, where a group of users can come together and make that choice, that's great. Separate but related is the other part of the cryptography coin, which is authentication. So that I know that as I distribute the information and I want to lock in all the facts around my initial documentation of something, I can authenticate it 
using a hashing algorithm and signing algorithms. And then what that allows you to do is ensure that no matter where this goes, no matter where it stays stored, where it's consumed, et cetera, that we have some provenance and we know where it came from. And we know that if it's been manipulated or not, which is critical for chain of custody. And Web3 is built on these primitives, right? That you have authenticity, that you have some method of protecting uh, users with um, anonymity or pseudo anonymity with encryption. Um, so as you guys are building and hacking away over the next couple of days, like really think about it. It's like, how, how can you allow users to try to flex these really powerful tools on their own with their own agency, but then also in groups that expand and expand and essentially keep that agency with the users rather than the platforms. No, this is a, this is really good kind of way of thinking about it because I, what I was going to ask next was just go into a bit more detail around what are other lessons learned from how um, existing Web2 networks uh, do this and how we actually kind of think about making a list of everything we need to address. And uh, as we're thinking about a brand new way to uh, experience uh, in a way a social network in, in Web3, it's kind of like a choose your own adventure uh, sort of thing, which is the data is separate from the users, which is separate from the platform, which is separate from the user experience, which is separate from like the front end and the platform we're gonna look at it from. And there's multiple things that you can tweak on every layer of, of that stack. And the question becomes like, what is important uh, to focus on and what is ephemeral versus what is actually variable? Right. Um, yeah, that sounds daunting, right? Because <laughs> you're you've essentially disintermediated all the functions. Yeah, exactly, and that's a lot of pressure, right? If you're if you're a developer and you you now have to essentially make all of those choices, um, yeah, I'm, I'm extremely empathetic in a sense that it's like this is um, I think what the engineers are facing the next couple of days are you know they're obviously like a multitude of choices, but also a multitude of responsibilities. Um, so so let me give you the the one thing that where we when we consulted with the leaders in the human rights space, they said to us, it's actually really simple. What you need to do is create platforms that allow for you to air grievances and to provide feedback. So you have to basically assume that you're gonna get things wrong at some point. It's, it's assured, right? Every major type of implementation is going to stumble in some way because that's what happens when you work at scale, right? That's what happens when you make something public. And so, you know, if you look back at like web two and you think about, well, did they really listen? Were they actually humble in their approach and trying to say, you know what, we're screwing up and let's make some, some choices that might actually make a difference, right? Or did they give agency to users to start to develop solutions around like better information, right? About what was wrong. Um, I think at the end of the day, um, we can say web two failed in that respect. The early experimentations around like voting around proposals and trying to get feedback. I mean, Karthik, you may remember this, right? There was Facebook advertised this, right? As, as like a key thing yeah. they were going to do, right? I forget what the threshold was. It was something like a hundred thousand votes or something like that could, could yield some sort of change. You know, it should sound familiar, right? Like Dow governance and stuff like that, right? And of course they didn't stay committed to it um, in part because you could argue maybe some part of it was impractical, but also they were arrogant. I think they, in retrospect, they would admit that. So that's what we need to flip on its head, right? Is we need to think about not just governance for the sake of decision-making, but you need to make people informed through this process. And so you need to be super committed to finding ways of getting feedback from users and then creating grievance processes that are structured ahead of time, not belatedly once like really bad stuff happens. Um, so I'd, I'd leave that message with everyone. It's like, don't, this is not an afterthought. It's um, this is this is actually core to the success of your platform is being able to hear these types of things. Absolutely. Um, I, I mean, I, I kind of listed some features that I, I think are just uh, from a framing standpoint, things that we need to solve for in this world. And uh, you kind of have direct experience thinking about and addressing some of these uh, in production, uh, for lack of a better term. Um, so so kind of from your perspective, what are some of these key requests that you get and or, or key features that all these new platforms uh, should have? And how should you kind of think about breaking down or solving uh, or checking for like, what is the right check that, hey, we have a sufficiently good enough solution if, if that check meets? Yeah, well, the first thing is thinking about identity, 
right? It's a super core and imagining that everyone's going to spend a bunch of time focused on that. And, you know, identity is complicated because it's obviously uh, multifaceted. And I think most people are realizing that personas are, are what is going to be one way out of the problem with identity, which is that you can have a central identity that defines that you can essentially speak for and have agency, but that you might want to present your persona in different ways under different circumstances. You might want to have a lot of choice around that. And that persona in some cases can be anonymous, pseudo anonymous, you know, you can, you can make varying levels of security features around that. So I think that's, that's one of the, the core requirements of a social network. I think we're to re-architect this is, you know, it is to, to find ways of establishing a multifaceted uh, identity. Uh, that then leads to the second piece, which is around content moderation, which um, really flows uh, from this concept, which is that you want to find a way to generate community here. So now we have a set of personas that can come together and they can help manage some complex tasks. And um, that uh, core feature, really important. And when we think about, for instance, content moderation, you know, it's one thing, for instance, to have content moderation happen for a broad distribution of content. It's another thing where it would be content moderation for a bunch of war crimes prosecutors, right? And so, you know, clearly they have different needs and agendas and, um, and, and feature requests. So I think that having the ability to shape community with a whole set of different requirements and uh, around what the community requires is um, uh, organically, uh, that's super important. Okay, and then the last thing which I'll mention is, um, is really about authentication and provenance. Um, so much of the problem that we have right now is that information is flowing with very little information, uh, metadata uh, accompanying it. So you have photos that have no time and date, you have challenges around establishing location, and even things like the veracity of, of information, like it's, like it's underlying hash, right? Has it been manipulated or how can I authenticate it as close to the source as possible? Now, this one holds tremendous promise. Right? Like we're already seeing, for instance, images from other wars being recycled in the Ukraine conflict because it's just they're evocative, right? They get people to, to think and, and to care, right? But of course, those are that's falsified information, right? That's a big problem. Do you also so, clarify the nuance in that third point about uh, how much of that kind of is already coming in as a feature for just being on the blockchain versus the additional information that you would have to uh, amend or append? Cool, yeah, I'm glad you paused me there. All right, well, let's think about it. So the first thing is about ordering, right? So blockchains are really good about establishing like the order of events of something. So if you can register something, we, we have at minimum, we know what happened before and after, right? We have some relative sense of time. And then we can align that with potentially like real time, so say this date, this time. Uh, so that that is kind of the first thing. The second is that if you in that record can pack in things like location as an example, or um, information about the device that took uh, the image, et cetera. You can help start to build confidence that when someone says, hey, this actually happened, that you're starting to say, well, I have now additional information there. And that's giving me some more confidence that, yeah, indeed, this, this happened the way that this person claimed that it happened, or has, it's not a deep fake, or it's not a, a shallow fake, or you know, some sort of recycled image. So um, that's really important. But I'm going to be a little bit of a stinker on this. <laughs> um, the immutability right, of that type of record is challenging. Because today, I might want to disclose that information. And tomorrow, um, I may not. Right? Today, I might be free and able to do this type of capture safely. Tomorrow, there may be an, a completely different security situation. And I now need my anonymity, right? So choice is very important to ensure. So as you're developing these features, it's not about um, opting out is about opting in. And that's like really important because of the, the nature of the, the immutable nature, you know, of these types of um, devices and, or systems. And I'll tell you, by the way, Karthik, this is fascinating. This is not abstract fear at all. Um, as we were developing cameras and applications that did exactly this, it would take a photo and you would know it's in this exact time and place, right? It hasn't been changed. Um, our security researchers um, let us know that actually 10 years ago, North Korea actually pioneered a lot of this work and has made that a standard feature of every phone that is shipped in North Korea that's approved by the government. So that form of authentication, powerful, amazingly helpful 
if I choose to do it. But when it's forced upon you, then you're, it's a completely different ballgame. Then now we're in the, in the case of surveillance. So that's, those are the table stakes, right? That I think the Perfect engineers- example of a double-edged sword. Um, <laughs> yep. Um, wow. So, uh, I mean, I think a lot of it is, I feel like, uh, although I'll cap that by saying, I don't think it's a solved thing. I think there's still a lot of improvements to be done. It's, uh, it's more about, I think we get a lot of things built in uh, in this world, uh, especially on the persistence and the availability, or largely the availability as well as kind of the immutability of information. Um, and it feels like a lot of what we're thinking about or talking about here, and especially discussing is that a way to think about moderation and different ways to improve uh, moderation. How do you think about breaking that down? Like, is this just a world where everybody says, bring your own algorithms? And if you're doing this for war crime, then you have a different script you're going to run on the same data. If you're doing this thing for like understanding what could go viral, you have a different sort of algorithm. Are we just going to see all this fragmentation and bifurcation here? Like, how does that world kind of change and evolve from your perspective? It's complicated because I don't think we've done content moderation successfully, even with billions of dollars being spent on it, and you know platforms that have maybe not a um, a moral interest, but a but a profit interest <laughs> um, that they have put forward to say hey, we got to solve this because this is hurting our brand, this is hurting our you know our reputation. So um, let's let's try to unpack it. I think the biggest challenge right now is that. There is no way to actually moderate content within community. And so I think the, the, the ability to create more robust groups that can make choices around the types of things that are acceptable and the values that they uh, want to stand for is, is an important step forward. Now, mind you, that can go, you know, that, that requires you to make sure that people like actually are doing, uh, thinking about their values, right? And that ideally those values, you know, are stated they're clear and that governance is built around those. Um, so that I think is the very first set of types of features I think that we would wanna see here about content moderation is to, instead of thinking about it as a centralized function that a platform needs to handle, instead we're starting to localize it um, to affected parties, to stakeholders, right? Um, the second thing is that um, there, Content moderation, you know, is is tricky because obviously we want to promote freedom of speech as much as possible. That's a core tenet of democracy, but the reality is that not all forms of speech are protected, right? And so, um, again, like spending time preemptively to figure out the nuances of how you want your community to deal with this, and then maybe forming webs of webs, right, where good practices from another community might be something that you can now have like a Dao Dao type of relationship here, where then you can have those values disseminate. And the, probably the key to that is really transparency so that you can understand exactly what's going on here. And remember that even that was something that we didn't really know what the standards were in Web2, right? There were these kind of investigative reporters that would un uncover like crumpled PowerPoint presentations that you know, explain like how content moderators take down content. And, and they were like, insane to see because some of them were really wrongheaded, right? So, um, so I think making just a lot of that process more transparent and more governable is, is gonna go a long way. Won't solve everything, but it, it certainly will um, be much better than the current state of affairs. Absolutely. Um, so to, to kind of give you a little bit more context into uh, this event, um, a lot of people, so we have 500 developers who are working on creating different ways of reimagining social networks, whether it's on the Twitter or Facebook side or, or media content or live streaming, just different ways we can have more consumer social interactions. And uh, it's all leveraged on Lens Protocol. And kind of the one key interesting piece here is that kind of what you're fundamentally sort of facilitating is uh, a, a standard around how people have a shared identity that gives them the ability to just get a graph of all the users uh, who have also interacted in any same realm. And I think that's, to me, a super interesting sort of uh, primitive because we kind of have almost everything open uh, and, and transparent on, on blockchain. You can inspect this, you can inspect the metadata, you can inspect kind of A to B transactions and destinations, but there hasn't been a strong incentive or even um, a lot of attempts right now to really figure out a way to think about how do I, in a way, roll up the activity or, or the identity of a user on a different platform and sort of 
leverage that to make sense of it on another, uh, whether that's like a reputation sort of uh, score or, or an aggregation of this is what you've done uh, that comes in. And this is kind of one of the bigger problems with social networks too. Like I can't quit Twitter because everybody I follow or follows me must do the same thing or, or I have sufficiently enough of an audience that I can say, I'm going to quit this thing. I'm going here, please follow me. And I hope that majority of them do. Um, do the same principles exist as you kind of think about um, in this kind of Ukraine case or the, the war crime sort of side? Like, does the network actually matter? Um, or is it largely about the outcome of uh, kind of the situation and, and that sort of the thing? Or do you think this actually enables more interesting cases or not? Wow, that's like, there's so many. So yeah, there's, there's a lot here, so, so I'll try to break yeah, it down. I'm, I'm, I, well, just I'm just excited to yeah. think about think about how I can answer this um, in a clear way because I think there's a lot of possibility, right? Um, yeah, I, the first thing I just want to talk about is, is you described here um, the possibility of creating a social network that has portability as like a key feature, right? So I have portability of my data, my identity, et cetera. And um, I just want to put out there that portability does not equal interoperability. Right. So I can take my data and maybe I have it, but like if I can't use it on the other platform, then forget it. There's like nothing there. And so I think that's really important for people to distinguish and stay ahead of because you saw this, like when the hand wringing kind of came out um, with Web2, they said, well, you can just take out your data. Okay, but what can I do with it? Right. And, and by the way, what type of data is actually being taken out? Right. In many cases, the analysis of my data, which was arguably the most important thing that the platform was doing, that was still kept proprietary. So I think portability and interoperability, which are now, by the way, requirements under things like GDPR, um, they, they are, are, are really important to build into the design. And, um, and, and I think it, we still need a lot of innovation there. So that's, that's, a, that's an important piece. Um, the other thing which is complicated about this, but I, but I think an opportunity is that you really need to figure out what, what are you betting on? And I think what we're all betting on is not that you have portability and interoperability and identity and, um, uh, you know, and, and the ability, like robust forms of security, but you're really like betting on emergent behavior, emergent features. And that means that like, your, your design surface is not just around the primitives of how I'm gonna do something at a tactical level, but that you really wanna think about like what are the emergent things that are gonna happen when this actually gets deployed and at scale. And so I'd urge people to think about like getting the lean prototype, experimenting with some things, but then really being, it's that next stage of the innovation, which is actually where you're gonna find out what you've got, right? It's because what you're looking for is um, changes to the fundamental content and the behavior that is um, basically that emerges from the features. Like I'll give you a funny example, but it's a good one. Which is that until Netflix decided to go in and basically like stream things in the way that they did and make their catalog available in the, in the way they did, um, the phenomenon of binging wasn't possible, right? And so what happened is that you now had a new pattern of viewing, right? That's the first level innovation. But then the content changed, right? Like the actual television product, like you had variable length, you had like new ways of thinking about episodes and series, et cetera. I think that's a really intuitive example to say, yeah, like it used to be that you had linear content, which was distributed on broadcast television that occurred weekly in half an hour chunks. And, you know, it's like, wait, what, you know, and 20 and so weeks and then you got to wait another six months for the next time. And then here you see 14 episodes dropped in the same night and people going right. crazy. Yeah. Exactly. So the, the innovation is not just about the fact that, okay, here's the content. It's available to you in one day. It's that like, oh yeah, this story is like way different than a sitcom, right? Or some whatever kind of classical television uh, format. And so I think that's a good analogy for what's going to happen here. Like you really, you want to say like, okay, we're making things interoperable. We're making them portable. We're making them secure and authentic. But like, okay, now what? And so um, that's, I think, the broader conversation that you guys are probably having. But with respect to war crimes documentation, um, I think that there is a, um, a really interesting phenomenon that it, we're on the cusp of, which is that right now, the challenge is that 
this type of work is centralized through the investigative authorities that are doing this work for the most part. And I think that there's still some wisdom in, in having experts deal with content of this kind. That makes sense to me. But engagement is still really important. And that what I think is gonna happen is that communities are gonna rise up and they're gonna say, we wanna be a part of accountability here. And so as open source intelligence gets out there and people are gonna start processing that information, I think the emergent behavior is gonna be that we have now open forms of analysis as well as just open forms of documentation. And that people are gonna say two things. One, I wanna use cryptographic protocols to actually retain the integrity of this information and to preserve it. And so I think that the archive of this war is not gonna be centralized in one repository or like one AWS instance, right? I think it's going to be distributed. I think that we're going to find that there's no think it has to be. Well, one would hope, <laughs> um, right? So we're, we're working on that. Um, and that's what will make it resilient because if Russia even decides to attack or destroy or turn things off, okay, great. Well, now, you know, this information's out there and it's the wider and the more diffuse uh, pattern of that storage, the better off we are. And the emergent behavior is that people are committed. They're not forgetting, they're engaged, right? As, because preservation is, is a very high form of engagement. And then the second thing is that they're gonna look at the content in some cases where it's responsible to allow people to look at things and they're gonna find evidence that maybe investigators can't find because they're too stretched. Um, and so those, um, I think those- the kinds of paralyzation, which is kind of what we haven't seen in moderation. Like if you, like they're largely, I mean, there's a fair amount of good, but largely I think a lot of not great cases where, uh, you see kind of Reddit mobs uh, hopping up and they end up trying to solve certain things or find clues from just little information. And it does end up often leading to results, but uh, that's also one sort of side of moderation at scale. And we just haven't been able to do that um, largely yeah. for yeah, social existence central networks. Yeah, and the chaos is basically that it's like this, with the analogy, it's a mob, right? So it just forms on its own and, it's, or, and then it's instructed to essentially go and kind of through the, the crowd, the thinking of the crowd, right? Go and attack something. Um, I think in this case, like that's the power of, of these types of solutions that are on chain is we can start to delegate, we can create more structure, we can think about ways of, of, of encouraging participation, but not having it be so unruly. Um, so I, I hope that that's, a, that's an emergent thing as well. Um, in, I can tell you having worked on the Syria conflict, which is now in its 11th year, and that still most of the major war criminals have not been brought to justice in any meaningful way. By the way, none, nothing on the international level and sparing work done in domestic courts in Europe. Um, the reality is this is going to take a while. And that what we really need to be thinking about here is a solution that's not about these intervening weeks and months. Um, it's about, this is a decade plus right. type of uh, work on, on, on accountability. Every growing challenge with no way to call it, this is done. Uh, this will mutate in different forms. Um, I, I do want to end on a note that sort of uh, helps uh, the attendees for the hackathon sort of uh, get some more uh, direction towards what they should be thinking about. I think one thing you did point out, which is a really good thing I should I would like to repeat, is just the emergent behavior. I think a lot of us, when we think about, oh, let's have a decentralized social media network, we're saying, okay, I need to like have some insurance from getting banned from Twitter or YouTube. So I just need to clone that and have the same one-to-one -one mapping of what this would look like now, just that the data is more distributed. That doesn't that doesn't count as emergent. I think the emergence comes from the fact that we are seeing use cases that either just are not possible or we can't think of yet, or we haven't figured out how to put that right combination in place. And uh, obviously NFTs did that. They did that with music just now, and that's kind of an emerging theme. Uh, we're seeing that with just how people interact and sort of form graphs. And, and that's a, a really interesting thing. But the hard piece about this is that we're hoping that there's something new will come up, but there's no way for us to kind of prescribe or, or give a category because by definition, it'll be <laughs> impossible. And uh, and while I, I I will kind of put you on the spot, but while I'm, while I'm not going to have you answer that question. I'm curious, like if you were to kind of give uh, some guidance to the attendees here uh, to think about what they should build or what different ways you would like to see social media networks evolve. Uh, granted, they only have ten days to try something out and do a minimal viable product. Uh, what are some things that you think are important? Um, 
one thing, and you know, we can direct people towards um, looking at some um, really cool things on authentication. So provenance is really a cool feature that we are looking for in social media networks. So the ability essentially to track content when it's first uploaded, then who gets to basically where, how it gets shared, and then finally how it's consumed in the end. Um, provenance is, is a really interesting area to think about um, for innovation. So, uh, and, and specifically with images and video, which are, are, are really important. Um, the other thing I'll just come back to, um, I, I'm, I'll, I will beat the drum again on um, issues around grievances and feedback. So really cool mechanisms for um, content moderation that are driven through like awesome methods of feedback and, um, and grievance addressal is like a, is seriously the, the biggest challenge that social media has at the moment. And I think small experiments here might be really, really cool to check out. Like how, if you have like a massive queue of complaints, for example, how do you, how do you sort through that, right? How, what signals could you bring in that could allow something to jump up to the top and that, that people wouldn't gain the system necessarily, right? So I think some of those kind of dynamics are really cool um, to think about. Um, and finally, um, I think the idea of the, the personas is really powerful and, and gonna be a tough one. Uh, for people to look at and really meaty. Um, so I'm hoping people, if, I, if I'm a user on the platform, how can I exist in different spaces and, and shape reputation in my activity um, in a meaningful way? Uh, what does the Web3 version of that look like? So are, are you're saying that my address or my identity underlying is the same, but it morphs based on the platform I'm on because there's a, a second sort of abstraction of who I am. Totally. Uh, how do you kind of manifest that on chain? Is it just like me saying this is a, a list of topics I'm interested in, and that's sort of what I fill in for a different platform, or or how would I kind of dedicate my persona? I mean, declaration is certainly really important because you obviously want to make sure that people can retain their privacy and disclose what they want to disclose. So I think that's important. Um, you know, the other thing is just um, is is keeping certain things sequestered in a way, right? That's another piece of the puzzle, right? So if you really want to. Um, potentially you may not necessarily want to associate one persona that I have to another persona, right? And so thinking about some innovation about how I could potentially keep different parts of my identity separate, that seems really important. Um, I know, you know, privacy norms were really challenged in web two and, um, Zuckerberg kind of famously said that, you know, privacy is like a generational thing. Um, uh, I, I think that time has not looked favorably on that quote at all. I think that yeah. actually there's right, a lot that we've learned about why privacy really matters. I think a new generation has maybe new ideas about expression. That's really awesome. But I also think that they recognize that um, choice and agency that comes with um, end-to-end encryption and you know, some form of, um, uh, of, of security um, means that you can actually have more robust expression if you have things like security and encryption, because you can, in those types of settings, maybe be your more authentic self, right? Yeah, that so, exists, um, you're right. Yeah, so, so that, if we can play with those ideas and now say, okay, how does that relate back to an identity that practically I can use? That, that's really the kind of the area of innovation. There's a lot of things uh, that are actionable from everything you said today. So uh, I want to thank you for taking out the time and making this amazing chat happen and kind of working on something that's super important and relevant right now. So I um, really appreciate this and uh, thank you so much. So great to be here. Big fan of the community and looking forward to doing even more. Can't wait to have you back. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Cheers. Bye. So with this, we are ready for our next talk and the next panel is about discussing social impact at scale. So we have three amazing people here, uh, Marcus from Klima, Rafael from Tucan, and Scott from Gitcoin. And uh, we're gonna kind of cover a lot of things that we wanna talk about on how we think uh, we can spend our time and resources as developers or as users in Web3 to uh, sort of make all of this uh, more impactful uh, for, for the space. So I wanna welcome all of you here. Um, I wanna start off by asking uh, the first question, which is I'd uh, love for uh, everybody to kind of get to know who you are, what you do and sort of how you got into this space. And uh, we can start with Scott and we can go to uh, Marcus, but uh, Scott, welcome and uh, ready to take over. Awesome. Yeah, Kartik, thank you so much. And I'm just excited to see this topic being discussed now actively um, in the space, honestly. It's been kind of a wild few years on the Bitcoin side where 
we sort of started as a community of, uh, I guess, just software developers looking to grow and sustain public goods in sort of the open source software, digital public goods space. And I think what we're, we're kind of seeing now is honestly just a complete evolution of that into this regenerative finance movement. And that's honestly been sort of my mission in the space since I started in the space. So it's sort of a, in a sense, like a dream for me that this is happening. And I think that, you know, what I'm hoping will happen in the future is just really getting more of these sorts of conversations happening across the space. Um, but, you know, my, my real background is kind of boring. I did machine learning uh, back in 2015, kind of got into DAOs in 2015, 16, the DAO hack happened. So there was a period there where no one really wanted to talk about DAOs for a while. Um, but then I joined Gitcoin as a co-founder with Kevin in 2017, 2018. And that's sort of like the, the little bit of a backstory of that whole journey. Um, but yeah, I'm just super excited to see this sort of evolution. And um, I'll pause there just because I feel like we have a lot to discuss on that topic later. Absolutely. Um, Marcus would love to kind of get a, a bit of intro on yourself as well as Clemma. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks, Kardik, for having us and uh, to the LF Grow community. Uh, Welcome from Klima DAO, glad to be here. Um, so uh, ultimately Klima is uh, trying to bring the voluntary carbon markets um, on chain and create a uh, regenerative economy uh, where the fundamental asset of economic activity is uh, tied to environmental services, in particular, the uh, mitigation of carbon emissions. Um, I personally came into the space um, around the time that Klima launched a little before. Um, my background is in data science and data engineering. I've been working in the Web2 world for uh, about six or seven years. Um, I first started learning about crypto uh, personal investment a couple of years ago, um, took the deep dive into DeFi over the last year or so. And um, when I found Klima, it all kind of clicked and I um, was excited to bring my data skill set to bear on this uh, exciting new space of ReFi. Amazing. And uh, Rafael, last but not least, we'd love to learn more about yourself too. Sure. Yeah, I'm super excited to be here because actually this is a big flashback for me. I've been at East London. Uh, I don't know if you, <laughs> you remember, Carl. Absolutely do. Uh, I was sitting on the, in, in the audience um, watching you speak. And um, so yeah, Toucan, which was uh, still called CO Toucan two years ago. Um, essentially, like our goal is to build you know technology that can uh, put you know, climate action at the heart of every financial transaction. And we realized that the, the fastest path towards doing this is to bring carbon on chain as a, as a money Lego or as a building block for others to build on, right? And um, yeah, Marcus is here, Klimada obviously being um, the most important protocol right now that is building on, on, on Toucan and uh, hopefully, you know, one of many protocols uh, that can unlock what we now call uh, ReFi. Um, yeah, I'm really happy how this term refi came together i i remember uh, i think like two years ago we tried to term the coin decli for decentralized climate finance but refi is just so much more elegant so yeah it's up here but um yeah like i'm i'm excited to be here and this is a, a little bit nostalgic for me we're, we're super excited to have you too i think it's uh, this is one of my favorite parts here which is anytime somebody who kind of comes in at the hackathon and sort of ends up pursuing their projects to be more than just a hackathon project and sort of comes back and gives back to the community. That is a perfect cycle moment for, for us and, and just a global team. Um, and it's just wonderful to, to kind of have these experiences. And, and interestingly, we've had this happen for every single event we've done in the past six months and it just blows wow. my mind that this is a, this is a thing. So I, I am beyond excited to, uh, to see this. Um, so I think you kind of brought up a, a lot of interesting points already because uh, this sets up the theme for what we want to discuss next. Um, starting with you, Rafael, uh, would love to kind of understand, like, what does it mean to be to regen for, for you and kind of why do you think it's important? Obviously, there's a bias here, but we'd love to, uh, <laughs> to uh, kind of still get that answer from each of you. Yeah. I mean, that's a tough one, actually. So for, for me, the, 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 main, the main problem that we have right now is you know, climate change is a huge coordination failure. And um, w when I first looked at this problem two years ago, I was coming, also coming from the DAO perspective. And I was like, cool, we have these amazing coordination tools, smart contracts are great at that. And we have this huge coordination failure. How can we, you know, put the two together? And for me, 
um, probably being a regen is applying some degen uh, blood towards a regenerative cause. So um, it's, you know, let's try things, let's experiment, let's move quickly. Really like one of the key theses, theses, no, it's probably not the right word, but you know what I want to say. Behind Tukin is, um, we want to put the 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 mind share and, and like just the innovative power behind uh, Web three on to work on the biggest problem that we have as as, as a human or as a species. So um, yeah, for me, be, being a region means um, trying out, failing, you know, experiment and um, and see where it, you know where where it leads us. And honestly, uh, climate change is, is is a money problem also, right? Like in both that we need to allocate huge amounts of money and other resources towards uh, solving the climate crisis. But interestingly, money is also potentially part of a solution, um, which I'm sure Marcus can talk more about. So um, yeah, I'll stop here. Uh, we can jump right into Marcus. Um, Marcus, uh, what does it mean to be a region for you and uh, why is it important uh, for you? Yeah, so to me, the the real difference between a degen and a regen, it comes back to like the structure of economic systems. Um, so I think often, um, well, historically, um, externalities have been a way to get ahead in the capitalist system, right? You, you can basically get something for free by, you know, polluting or, uh, you know, taking water from a public source or, um, yeah, yeah, basically externalities are a major problem for traditional capitalist systems. And regen, refi represents this idea, an opportunity to create financial systems, create economic systems where incentives are aligned, where um, the long-term health of the ecosystem is priced in to um, the cost of doing business. And, uh, you know, the, the hard part though, of course, is that as Rafa said, there's money on the line, right? Because there's obviously, uh, when you internalize, uh, an externality that in incurs a cost. Um, and I think until very recently in the legacy, you know, corporate world, the cost of addressing the externality of pollution, as an example, um, of carbon emissions has not been, the cost of addressing that has not been justified. Um, there wasn't social pressure. There wasn't a feeling of urgency. I mean, the case of the, um, you know, major fossil fuel companies basically covering up the science on, on global warming is pretty damning evidence on that front. Um, but there's now this opportunity to, to turn that narrative around, right? To, um, for instance, um, one of the things that I think is really, uh, you know, I think there's an opportunity to create collaboration um, where there once was competition. And that's what refi ultimately means to me. That's, that's an incredible answer. And um, I'll, I'll just let Scott jump in too. Yeah, I definitely think the positive externality piece is at the heart of pretty much everything we're talking about here because, and actually I would really credit Toby, Shoren and the other internet crew for writing a really great piece on this positive some worlds, which kind of highlights the fact that what we're building and, and actually what DAOs are able to kind of produce is kind of a club model, which or a commons model, depending on how you frame it, which allows for positive externalities to actually be produced uh, kind of as a, a side effect. And I think that that's something that previously was very difficult to extend. So if you look back to like Ostrom's common model, uh, commons model rather, in sort of like that uh, framing, the, the problem is really that you have local resources which are kind of scarce and you need a way to manage them. You need a way to ensure that people are using them effectively. And um, what Hardin sort of in opposition to Ostrom was originally stating was that you would effectively end up with this tragedy of the commons where you would never be able to do that effectively. You would always end up with basically someone defecting, deciding just to go off on their own and not really work with the group. And Ostrom was able to show at local scale that you can actually do that pretty effectively. And there's many cases in which that's happened. But in a global context, it's very easy to pass on externalities. Very easy, like as, as Marcus mentioned, just it's very easy to pass off pretty much everything um, that is you know, not useful to you as a company or as even a government to some other external party. And so with climate change, you see this most prominently, but it's also true with things like open source software, with things like even, you know, right now, as we're seeing uh, with some of the crises that are happening uh, with things like peace, it's very difficult to get people just on a global scale to coordinate. And I think what's interesting is this idea effectively of, you know, public goods on the one hand, but also global common sort of management, which is enabled by these DAO structures. So 
that to me is really the, the sort of like the, the positive externality piece of that is at the heart of why we can actually basically enable these uh, kinds of solutions today in ways we couldn't before. So that's uh, a bit of a TLDR. No, this is, it's really good framing too, because that, that is fundamentally, I like the fact that you're looking at measuring the impact and not just the process. Uh, and that's kind of a good way to think about this because otherwise you don't make progress. And uh, so I, I think, uh, I feel like one thing I missed asking, which I should have done before this question is actually giving uh, the audience a better understanding of what each of you actually do in terms of what the, the the protocol does or what the company does. So uh, uh, there's obviously a big climate heavy focus on this panel uh, in terms of two out of three of you are, are on that problem, but Gitcoin specifically is a, a really good public goods sort of solution and company out there. Uh, so I'd love to start with you, Scott, and then I'll learn more about Tucan and, and Klima and just kind of go into what is it the, the platform does? How do you do it? Uh, some of the impact that you can kind of talk about and just how does how do things work behind uh, the scenes and under the hood? Um, so let, let's start with Gitcoin and then we can go to uh, Klima and Tucan. Okay. Awesome. We've, yeah, principally been focused on quadratic funding, which is a lot to really get into, but in short, it's really a democratic way to crowdfund contributions in a way that kind of allows for a community to signal its preferences according to the will of sort of the poor and the many versus the rich and the few. So you could imagine if you have 20 grantees, um, which actually we do right now, sort of have, yeah, we are around going for grants round 13, where you can see this in action. But the idea essentially is that over a two week period, let's say you get a sense of what the community is signaling and you use this method, which actually was created by Glenn Wales, that we had saved and Vitalik to effectively distribute a pool of matching funds from larger players in the ecosystem. So in the end, you end up with kind of a preference ordering for a given set of public goods uh, within a specific community context. And you can almost, almost imagine those communities as kind of their own commons, right? So, you know, someone like a group like Polygon or a group like um, Ave or groups like, um, you know, anyone else who's kind of uh, got their own ecosystem could, you know, kind of curate and decide on what they care about and what public goods they want to fund in the context of their own ecosystems. But the beauty is uh, that those end up actually themselves creating positive externalities because it's all open source software. So that's kind of the TLDR of just, you know, what we're aiming to do with the tooling that we have. And we've started to, like, as I kind of mentioned at the beginning, expand on this notion in the context of you know, things like climate, we have a climate run going now, uh, and things like uh, longevity, human health, um, peace in the case of funding uh, in, in the case of Ukraine. And ultimately those are to me exactly as, as, as Rafa kind of mentioned, the problems that I think are just missing solutions in the context of you know, existing institutions. Um, and so you know, we're kind of broad in terms of what we focus on in terms of impact. Open source software was the start. But I think there is this broader recognition in the community over the last few years that there really is a potential for us to actually bring this impact back to the physical world, which, of course, everything that we're doing relies on. Amazing. Um, Marcus, do you want to jump in? Sure. Um, I have to say, though, I think it might be easier to understand what Klima is after Toucan explains how they bring carbon on chain. Sure. Here, let's, there we go. Yeah, cool. Um, I mean, so Tukin really uh, at the at the core is um, is a way to connect the Web two carbon market with Web three, right? So um, there's a bunch of like small comp like you know modules to it. The, the first one being the carbon bridge. So essentially, um, this is a way to connect to what we call source registries. So um, what's important to know is that we so we only bring credits on chain that um, are verified by nonprofits and and so-called carbon standards in the real world. So we're not like the auditing, the auditing body. We're really just like technology infrastructure that allows anybody that holds these credits today to, to move them on chain. And so um, on, on the other side of, you know, when you use the carbon bridge as a user, you get so-called TCO2 tokens, which are um, project specific carbon tokens. So th that's important because they carry all the metadata and attributes that are, that are relevant because, you know, carbon is, uh, a very diverse asset at actually like carbon credits, you know, it can be generated by um, planting trees, by protecting trees, by um, having solar energy or like direct air capture. So it's like a really broad field of, of, of use cases that can produce carbon credits. Right. And so um, we want to make sure that these, that all this data is, is represented. And then now 
you can think of credits like a semi-fungible, you know, carbon credits like semi-fungible. So what we want to do is that we want to create some commoditization and harmonization to this asset class based on like logical, um, like homogeneous groups. And so a good example, for instance, is the, is the Nature Carbon Ton, which we launched a couple of weeks ago, which uh, essentially is, a, is, is like a pool where you can deposit nature-based uh, TCO2 tokens or nature-based carbon credits into the pool as long as they match these criteria. So you can think of it like a, you know, I'm, uh, I'm from Berlin, so you can think of it like a club that has a bouncer and it only allows certain types of carbon credits to go into the club. And, um, and what you get on the other side is, a, is what we call a carbon reference token. So um, in that case, it's NCT, the Nature Carbon Ton. And that now has obviously much deeper liquidity and it has more like, um, it behaves more like a commodity, right? And so there's right now there's NCT, the Nature Carbon Ton and BCT, BCT, which was developed together with Klimadao back in, in October uh, to serve their, their theory of change um, of moving the price floor up um, for carbon. And um, yeah, I'll, you know, I'll, the, the main idea or like the main, uh, the main thing that we want to unlock is the builders the kind of using these building blocks to create, you know, novel applications. And this is why I'm excited to see what comes out of uh, this hackathon also. And um, yeah, so there's also a token bounty, by the way. So uh, building with carbon uh, and, and, and social graphs, I think I'm, I'm excited to see what comes out of it. Cool. Uh, I'll go ahead. So thanks for setting that up, Rafa. Um, so, you know, as, as Rafa was describing, uh, carbon credits themselves are um, sort of like a commodity. Um, but they're heterogeneous. And what Toucan's done is brought them on chain. Um, this sort of legacy Web2 um, financial instrument essentially brought them on chain and made them into a tradable asset, an ERC-20. Um, but that's not really, that's sort of like the beginning of a DeFi protocol rather than the end, right? Because there's the market that needs to be created. If we use an analogy here um, to like a sort of antiquated concept of like rail travel. Um, so, you know, there's someone has to build the rails and then there's a set of cars that carry some commodity on that, on those rails, right? Um, if, if Toucan is like building the cars and putting, you know, allowing people to put their tonnage into the cars, um, Klima is trying to own the rails. So we're establishing and holding long-term liquidity for carbon assets on chain. Um, we started out with um, Toucan's BCT. Um, we since added MCO2 into our sort of liquidity rail ecosystem. And the idea is that the Klima token um, is sort of the reserve currency of this new on-chain carbon market, where if you want to acquire BCT, if you want to acquire NCT, if you want to acquire MCO2 or any other carbon assets that come online, Klima is your medium of exchange, right? Um, and the reason why Klima, Klima has been structured, the tokenomics have been structured in such a way that the supply of Klima is tied to the amount of carbon held in Klima Dow's treasury. Um, so basically there's a liquidity flywheel inspired by the Olympus protocol where um, Klima is minted and issued in return for um, bonders bringing an asset to the treasury. Um, so that whole Olympus protocol stuff is quite complicated, honestly, but um, a good analogy to, um, to have in your head when you're thinking about Olympus style protocols is the Federal Reserve system, um, which I understand many people may not be familiar with that system, but the basic idea is you have some treasury of assets um, like in the old days, it was gold and silver would be held in the Federal Reserve. And then dollars would be printed where each dollar is backed by some amount of gold in the treasury. Um, so Klima is very similar to the Klima token. Um, in order to issue one Klima, um, we have to hold at least one ton of uh, carbon offsets in the treasury. Um, so that's sort of like the top level. But if I, um, if I step back and like think about what is Klima trying to do, um, ultimately, we are trying to create an, where the fundamental asset in that economy is carbon offsets, or really more generally, any kind of environmental service that can be tokenized. Um, so starting with carbon offsets makes a lot of sense because they're an established market. They've been around for about 20 years, and there's already existing demand. Um, but one of the things we're really excited about moving forward is the opportunity to create um, an economy where as a supplier, even, um, you could potentially... Um, perform some service, right? Uh, you know, whether that's planting trees or switching to solar renewable energy, um, but to create an economy where anyone can participate as a supplier of some ecosystem service and as a consumer of the tokenized versions of those uh, environmental services. Um, to be a little more clear about like what I'm actually talking about, um, you know, carbon offsets are one way of, uh, of financializing an ecosystem service. Um, another idea would be something like a, uh, you know, an ocean cleanup 
credit um, or a, a wetland restoration credit. Now, the hard part right now is this is a very immature industry and there aren't great methodologies for those more specific types of environmental services. Um, so we're sort of starting with carbon offsets as a simple already existing environmental service that can be tokenized. Um, but the goal really is to create an economy that incentivizes preservation of our planet um, rather than destruction of the planet. It's super in insightful. This is, this is amazing. And I love kind of the, the scope of the impact, which is you finally get to work at problems at scale with the help of anybody who wants to be part of these communities. And that's a really unique uh, thing that I think we've seen in, in Web3. Um, uh, there's a common thing that's been touched on here. And, and Marcus, you just kind of highlighted that um, you kind of pointed out that the carbon credit markets have been around for a couple of decades already. And Everybody has kind of been talking about these things for, for a long time in general. Uh, I guess from each of your perspectives, and maybe we can start with Scott here, like what do you think has changed over the last couple of years that have sort of created this surge in everybody wanting to focus more on impact or, or refi? And kind of what do you think have the, the factors have been that sort of sparked this? I think, honestly, like kind of what Marcus mentioned, the, the tooling is just there now where it wasn't before in a lot of ways. There just wasn't really an easy way to you know, even in 2017, 2018, the idea of, even though many people were building kind of products at that time, the idea of having users at scale doing this sort of work was like kind of unlikely. And now we've realized that actually that's really not even the model that you want to think about. You really want to think about building entire kind of like collective communities, um, almost like effectively creator collectives in which these kind of actions can take place. And that generally speaking, most people are actually very interested in doing this because you look at how the traditional economy has grown over the last even five, 10 years, it's generally not been very good for the average person. And I think that ultimately people are just looking for ways to find more meaning in the work that they're doing. Um, there's some great thinkers on this topic actually, including uh, Yvonne Illich, who I would highlight just as one that folks can probably check out later. It's too much to get into here. But I think that ultimately that search for sort of um, you know, really finding solutions to the problems that we're facing is something that just naturally um, has just almost taken shape in the, in the context of a more absurdist postmodern society uh, that we're in. The, the other last thing I'll just notice, I think, you know, from my perspective, I think that people ultimately just learned a lot over the pandemic about how much we can coordinate globally uh, in ways that were just not possible or really, you know, as I mentioned, like the tools weren't there for before. And so I think there's also been, in light of all these things, a kind of cultural, social shift. Um, but the details of those things are like way too much to go into. I'm sure Rafa markets can dive in a bit more. Yeah, I mean, what you said is, uh, just jumping on it, like, I think we're just in like very turbulent times. Like, you know, as, you know, I live in Europe and you know, Europe is like, I have war really close to me and like, that's just one example. But I think in general, as, as like a human, at, at human level, we're kind of in a transition phase, it feels right. And it, it's very clear that the, the model that we thought was uh, working hyper growth, et cetera, globalization, like we just, you know, we just looked at the bright side and we completely ignored some of, you know, that we were basically destroying the, the basis of, of life. And so it's just so clear, but it's really hard to get out of that, right? It's like, it's like we, we, we're like addicted to growth and we're, um, and, and also on like the personal level, right? Like it's just, everybody's like, why should I, you know, why, why, why should I give up my car? Why should, so like, it's a, it's a really fundamental problem. Um, and I think what has changed, so, you know, I remember two years ago when I talked about crypto and carbon, like nobody cared. Um, but like also in crypto, I think the, the, the tone has shift, shifted, right? It's kind of like an industry which, um, which now has, you know, like there's been a lot of criticism actually about the environmental footprint also of crypto. I think that has actually played like the NFT, like the NFT hype, which has been, you know, bringing a completely new set of users actually to Web3 that were maybe more, more climate conscious has, I think, done a lot of good for this climate and refund movement. Um, and kind of open open the door, but generally, I think as as Scott was saying, like people love to work on something that is meaningful. And now you can actually work in the most fascinating industry of the world and do something meaningful. Like uh, so, 
so you know i think it's um that plays that plays into it this is like um yeah doing something meaningful can be fun and um and people because of this transitionary phase are, are willing to think outside of the box right something like climate would just not have been possible even if it i think was techno like if even if the technology was there like 10 years ago i don't think like people were were ready to to rethink money at at that scale right and what crypto has done is that it you know it's it it made reinventing money really easy and this just opens up you know a, a new like a new playing field and uh so yeah I, I guess this is it's just interesting times and like turbulent times are always interesting times and that's where kind of major shifts happen yeah yeah i think you know just speaking from my personal experience relatively new to the web3 space and was really inspired by Klima to drop my my meat space job and go full time basically as rafa was saying you know with to take this opportunity that isn't presented very often to work on something meaningful and you know on cutting edge technology. Um, so I, I do think there's a sense that like the pressure to do something, at least in like the climate space specifically, has been growing and growing. And public consciousness does seem to have shifted in the last couple of years um, to the point where like corporates are under extreme pressure, you know, to have ESG plans. Um, and like the mainstream public is fed up with inaction on this issue specifically, I think. Um, the the other thing I will say though is I do think there's been some important innovation in DeFi specifically that has unlocked some of these new economic systems that weren't really practical um, before. Like I know that some of the early um, Klima founders had kind of an idea for this concept of like a new money system built with carbon as the backing. But the idea of like a on-chain treasury managed using a bonding mechanism similar to the Federal Reserve was really not hadn't been implemented until Olympus came around. Um, and so it's really these Lego blocks that have been created that now allow us to build more sophisticated structures that enable refi to uh, exist as such. Yeah, that's a really good point. And actually this was exactly my next question, which is there a lot of that from a timing standpoint is also because you have now an abstraction that just previously wasn't there or we just hadn't figured out how do we actually enable certain things uh, to exist in a, in a simple way. Um, aside from what you just said, Marcus, what else is um, is kind of just enabled by by blockchains here that sort of helps you accomplish uh, the goals for each of your companies? Yeah, I, in the carbon space specifically, there's a huge opportunity because the legacy carbon market is um, pretty uh, antiquated, to use a nice term. Um, so there's a huge lack of transparency. Most of these deals are done in back rooms, you know, behind closed doors. Pricing data is not public. So like most transactions are not, um, you, you don't know how much people like Microsoft and Amazon are paying for the tons they're acquiring. Um, so there's a level of transparency just at a pure like financial level that the blockchain brings that is right now absent from the legacy markets, um, at least in the carbon offset space. So that's a big opportunity. Um, the other thing I would say is that um, the sort of interoperability aspect is really um, promising because um, you know, in the old world, if you want to retire your carbon credits, if you want to claim them, um, it's like a manual process. Like you were talking like spreadsheets and email level of technology. Um, and so if you wanted to automate offsetting, that is like not really practical to do. Some, you know, larger entities have set up API connections and stuff, but it's not practical for a small project to offset automatically. Um, whereas on chain, it's just a contract call. Um, so that level of abstraction has really created um, the opportunity to create an ecosystem rather than a series of like walled gardens where you have to go through um, like a web to centralized authority to offset your carbon. Yeah, just like jumping on that, you know, carbon credits really are pa packaged positive externalities, right? Like somebody's going out, is doing something and somebody is verifying, somebody else is verifying that like there has been like a state change essentially, right? So let's from, from no trees to trees, right? And the, the, the delta in that state change is then given out in, in terms of carbon credits. But uh, so it's a carbon credit really is a bunch of data and signatures. And right now a lot of PDF documents that are uh, kind of packaged together, right? So, um, but ultimately we're dealing with like an intangible asset that is, you can see it, you can smell it. And so I, I personally think that environmental markets are, like this is this might be the killer use case for for, for for blockchains, right? Or it's definitely I believe it's definitely one of them, right? Is, um, because because the, the integrity of that process is so important, and um, because 
you know, and, and just adding on top of what Marcus has been saying is not like every jurisdiction now is trying to figure out how, how do we how do we address climate change. And so there's a bunch of different carbon markets actually, right? Like we talk about the carbon market as if it was one thing. Um, when we talk about the carbon market, actually we talk about the voluntary carbon market right now, but there's like a bunch, there's like a compliance carbon market and that one is, you know, is different for Colombia than it is for the US than, than for Europe. So um, everybody's like doing a little bit of their own thing. And then we have these credits and some of these are accepted in one jurisdiction and not in another. So um, like we believe that having that like, you know, neutral, piece of infrastructure, that's what we call the meta registry that um, everybody can issue on and that everybody can retire and like everybody, you know, can can do so pro programmatically. Um, this can actually unlock a much more homogeneous global carbon market that I think we need to have in order to address this at scale because climate change is a global problem and doing regulation on a like local level, I don't think it's going to cut it. Um, so yeah, I, I'll stop there, but um, I, I'm really like, Actually, my conviction grew grows by every like every day. My conviction grows that, you know, two years ago I thought crypto might be a good market to sell carbon into, and now like in the last few years I realized no, no, it's actually like we're now kind of leapfrogging from Web one directly into Web three carbon markets, basically. Yeah, no, that, absolutely. And I was just saying, Scott, I know this is maybe not one hundred percent overlapping, but I'm sure there's an answer for for Gitcoin and giving out grants too. So we'd love for you to share more thoughts. Yeah, I mean, for us, it's it's pretty simple, which is like in, again, like three years ago, five years ago, DAOs were not really a topic that were uh, very popular. Um, and I think that the idea of DAOs, I mean, DAOs are a nebulous term, but really what we're talking about, like when I talk about them, at least when I'm trying to kind of get at is the idea of these global internet native organizations and almost like kind of, you know, commons uh, based organizations that to Rafa's point, have the ability to create their own currencies and govern themselves according to their own rules. And really all that we're doing with the tooling that we have with prophetic funding and so forth is providing a rail for them to basically figure out what their preferences are, how they should prioritize what they're you know, funding. And in a way that effectively allows them to uh, you know, build things that create positive externalities. I just think that really, you know, we, we did that for so long with mostly the support of the Ethereum Foundation. And, um, now there's just hundreds of orgs that want to do the same thing and are kind of um, leaning on a lot of the principles that folks like actually Aya like and Vitalik put together, like the subtraction mindset uh, sort of principles um, from, from that side of, of the space. And that to me is really just put at the heart of everything that we're, we're doing. I think one, one thing that um, we sort of in a way acknowledged but didn't touch on specifically is I think all three of you are in an industry that is um, that has a proxy for like a, the enterprise side or just like the legacy world also is is a pretty big player. Um, and kind of my question, uh, so I have a two kind of two part question here. So the first piece here is uh, for the current non blockchain solution that's out there for the problem you're solving. Um, what does that kind of look like in terms of the partners that you have to work with, their reactions about the technology, or what do you have to do to convince them to actually think about these things or accept uh, your solution as one of the other integrations? Like, what does that look like? And, and similar to kind of on that theme, um, what has been anywhere from challenging to the still stuff that you have to do behind the scenes that interacts with the real world, especially for a lot of the stuff around carbon credits, I assume it's it's not just a software only problem. Um, it will be at least a little thing. So so what kind of goes on behind the scenes? What are those conversations like? What are the challenges there? And, and kind of how do you think about that part of the world also now adopting to uh, the newer solutions? Yeah, so Klima has a bit of an interesting positioning here because we, we're we ultimately aiming to be a credibly neutral market facilitator, right? We, we, we want to work with everybody, basically. Um, and so that gives us an opportunity, but also a challenge um, because, you know, the opportunity is we are able to interface with standards bodies, you know, we're able to interface with um, with legacy carbon players and, and sort of get feedback from them, get input from them. Um, but when it comes to actually bringing um, consumers of credits on chain, there's definitely a dichotomy between the sort of um, legacy consumers who are already operating in the market, already have expertise in how to offset um, versus the entities that maybe want to be doing that, but don't have the resources or the funding to do that. Um, so that's kind of where we've been starting in terms of our outreach. 
Um, we have a partnership program called Klima Infinity, where we're basically um, working with enterprises, partnering with enterprises and protocols to offset their emissions. Um, it's kind of similar to a like consulting model that um, many legacy carbon brokers um, employ, where they'll like uh, be hired, you know, for a few hundred grand to you know calculate the emissions and um, and handle all the offsetting activity. Um, so what we've been what we found is that we basically for the legacy consumers, we need to fit into their box. We need to kind of um, show them that there really isn't that big of a difference between um, consuming on chain and consuming in the legacy world, um, at least in terms of the underlying, you know, legitimacy and quality of the credits. Um, so there's definitely like a FUD aspect where, you know, people who are um, experienced in the legacy market want to um, throw shade at tokenized carbon, um, either from lack of understanding or because they feel threatened. Um, so I'd say that's our biggest challenge is like trying to keep everyone free, three, like trying to keep everyone realizing that like there's a positive sum outcome. It's better for everyone to move the market on chain, um, especially in the light of like um, uh, legacy players whose business model is potentially being disrupted. Yeah, I think you're mentioning a good, good point there is that like, I think it's, it's a mixture of curiosity and fear for the legacy carbon market. But in general, I think it's the curiosity is winning. And this is because uh, it's, you know, it's a market that historically, the volunteer carbon market historically has been a very small market and uh, it's been mostly driven by NGOs and you know, few, few, few corporate customers. But there's a, very, there's a new wave, like the, the, the customers of the last 20 years are not the same uh, as the corporates that are buying today, right? You know, Microsoft and um, you know, BlackRock, et cetera, they were like, carbon offsets were not that big of their agenda like 10 years ago. And so we have they, like the carbon market is now in a phase where the, the demand side is much more demanding also in what they want to see, right? So they're asking for more data driven, they're asking for more transparency in the process, etc. So we kind of have a market that is uh, didn't have the time to adapt to its kind of popularity. And so um, so curiosity, I would say, is definitely winning because people understand that they need to innovate. They need to you know, ad adopt digital, um, digital technologies and, you know, why not go all the way? So, uh, but yeah, so also just adding is that the carbon market also has been a place of fraud historically, like there have been incidents of fraud um, back in, you know, 2010 and 2008, et cetera. So, um, there's this, I think there's this fear um, with regards to crypto that, you know, it's just a bunch of cowboys that uh, are now trying to like fraud people. And uh, so I think, you know, this adds to that, the fact that there has been, you know, fraud historically adds to, to the skepticism. But, um, but yeah, like generally I would say um, it's the curiosity is, is, is definitely winning. And um, I have no doubt that, um, like we too can definitely, you know, pay a lot of attention to make sure that um, the, the, the tokens themselves are, are linked directly to the off-chain asset and that it's like a two-way link basically. So, you know, if somebody takes the time to actually look how that is created, it's like really hard to say that, you know, yeah, to, to not understand what's going on basically. Also, interestingly, uh, the answer to the fraud situation problem is is being actually digital and having traceability. So yeah. uh, it should yeah, tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, Scott, I also want to make sure that you get a chance to uh, comment on this as well. Yeah, I think actually it's funny. The fraud piece is particularly relevant for, for us because really, you know, what we're trying to do is figure out ways to in a credibly neutral way, but also in a way that is sort of ensuring uh, you know legitimacy of the donations, measure the impact that's being made. In a way that wasn't really possible in a lot of, I would say not most, but like a large portion of Web2 philanthropic initiatives. And I think there's a problem right now of mostly people, similar to the realizations we mentioned before in the context of other parts of, of sort of the economy, but there's a realization that a lot of these large, you know, foundations, which, which have lots of money, don't have a lot of transparency into how they're sort of, you know, spending that funding. And I think that ultimately what we're realizing is that in a lot of those cases, using these tools, uh, whether it's quadratic funding or whether it's, you know, there's a lot of really cool work happening around the conviction voting and conviction related funding too. There's retroactive funding, which Optimus is doing some amazing work on. All of those tools give us new ways to basically deploy funding that just weren't really there before. And that weren't really nearly as transparent, I think, as they can be now. 
And I kind of also want to get to uh, kind of wrapping this up on a respectful of everybody's time. Um, so kind of the final question is like, obviously we kind of talked about how these things are sort of uh, being done right now and kind of the individual standalone impact that all these solutions would have. I think what's interesting here and kind of also why this is part of the actual LF Grow Summit is that um, there are still more amplified and exponential uh, benefits of this being part of a larger network, uh, whether it's from a graph or just being able to port anyone from your history or background to, to other uh, solutions out there, whether it's on the DeFi side or other social networks or any other on-chain uh, activity. So kind of from each of your perspective, how do you kind of think that uh, having just sort of a notion of a decentralized graph of everybody's uh, impact or, or activity uh, would amplify a refi, uh, like looking at just kind of lens all together or your wish list of all of this. Um, how can we make that better for, for refi? Yeah, I just want to reference a book that is very inspiring um, for KlimaDAO and, and kind of ties into this question. Um, it's called The Ministry for the Future by Kim Stanley Robinson. And one of the really cool aspects of that is that um, Basically, in the book, uh, a decentralized social network is the driver of mass adoption of crypto and the use of a carbon-backed currency to basically save the planet from climate change. Um, so I think there's a really exciting opportunity here to leverage um, like social pressure, social, um, essentially social proof, right? Like you can show your friends, your colleagues that you've taken, you know, you put your money where your mouth is. Um, so one of the ideas we're really excited about is this notion of like a green check, um, right? So by... Um, basically going through some verifiable on-chain process, you can attest that you have, you know, made a pledge of like what you think your emissions are, um, publish that pledge, and then, you know, showing that you on-chain offset that tonnage to, you know, meet your, your pledge. Um, and then you get a little check, a little social proof that you have actually done this action and you can share that um, with, your, with your network. Yeah, I would agree. It's, I think... I think this is one of the key missing components, right? So um, it's, it, it all comes back to like, you know, climate action is something like, why do we do that, right? Like, uh, you know, I live in Berlin, I've, I've lots of friends who, who, you know, who are very conscious of these things. And I think actually, you know, and, and I've learned a lot about like environmentalism from my friends. So from my, you know, from my peers essentially, and, I see other doing a behavior and actually I might copy it. So I think that this, um, you know, this is how humans work and having this ported in, into the virtual space, which where, you know, we spend more and more time in, you know, the metaverse essentially and, and porting that into the metaverse and allowing, you know, people to express themselves and to show like the impact that they have uh, actually creates a new, it, new currency, right, which is status and which creates new incentives ultimately for people to do the right thing. Because, uh, you know, we know from, from behavioral science that people, like, if nobody sees you, like, people do pretty horrible stuff, right? But if other people are looking, uh, people start to behave, you know, in a much more 3-3 three, three positive sun, like, you know, way. So uh, I'm super excited about, um, about that component being, being brought on chain. And uh, yeah, like, as I said earlier, I like, can't wait to see like what comes out of it, and um, you know, like not just out of this hackathon, but you know, we've been we've been we've been in conversations, um, and I, I really want to make sure that this is deeply integrated into kind of the the climate positive, and not just climate. You know, like climate is just one problem that we need to solve. It's not it's not the, the yeah, it's just you know it's it's not everything. So um, yeah, I'm I'm really stuck, and I think it's really important. Yeah, I think there's a lot of really interesting ideas around like almost a, a regen score. And, and that's actually been something that we've seen play out in previous rounds uh, on Bitcoin where people effectively end up donating projects and they end up with actually real rewards as a result of that from, you know, projects that end up kind of graduating and going and doing their own thing and then giving back to the community that supported them. I think in addition, though, there's this kind of question of on the one hand, there's incentives for like extrinsically motivating people to do the work that they should be doing. There's also the idea of, and this is true in open source software, and I, I think it's just a really important point to hit home, is there's people who are also really already intrinsically motivated to do things, but don't actually have the financial means to do them. And I think that it's often, you know, historically in open source software, and I think this is true in the case of, uh, you know, the climate space and other sort of like global commons as well, there's this problem of just generally people not being willing to, uh, you know, not, not necessarily, sorry, that they're, they're willing to, but they're not necessarily able to take the time to do the work that they want to do. And I think that's actually, you know, kind of going back to our previous conversation where there's just 
this mass sort of realization that wait, like the collective hallucination that we had before doesn't necessarily uh, you know align with our values, and now we have you know all these tools to sort of allow that intrinsic motivation to to shine through. So um, I might be overly optimistic about the natural state of of things, but um, I think that's a really key key piece. Yeah, optimism is, is important in order to stand up in the morning. <laughs> so. No, I absolutely agree. And uh, I think uh, one kind of cool piece about this thing is that, especially at a hackathon, you get to try all these possibilities at a smaller scale and just see what resonates or what actually the impact could be um, and use that as a proxy to decide what direction you should uh, sort of uh, choose or go in more on. So uh, yeah, I'm super excited to see kind of seeing a couple of interesting carbon offset use cases with new social networks that come out of this hackathon and everything that uh, you said, Scott, I think makes absolute sense. Um, yeah, like uh, this is very much needed and I'm glad that people are now actually thinking about this thing as a priority and not just as a, a side thing that they should signal that they care about. So uh, thank you so much, uh, all three of you for giving us the time and kind of making this amazing chat and uh, want to thank, uh, thank you for your time. Cool. Thank you, Kartik. Thanks, Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Ciao. All right, with that, we are ready for our last talk for this summit. So the last topic in this panel is on the future of on-chain collaboration um, and just kind of how we think about DAOs altogether and what we can do if we have a notion of more uh, interesting ways to think about software. So for this panel, I'd like to invite Joyce, Patrick, Alex, and Jess on stage. I'd like to ask all of you to turn the videos on. Joyce will be moderating this, this discussion and uh, I'll, uh, I'll let Joyce take it from here. Okay, wonderful. I'm super excited to be here and thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you, Patrick, Jess, and Alex for being here. We're saving the, the best panel for last. And today we'll be talking about the future of on-chain collaboration, which means a lot of things. So why don't we get started and have everyone introduce themselves. Uh, I'll kick it off first. My name's Joyce Yang. I'll be your moderator today. I'm the founder of GCR or Global Coin Research. We are a research and investment DAO. And next, maybe Patrick or Jess, feel free. Hey, Hoppin. So I'm Patrick. I'm currently a product engineer at Mirror. We're a Web3 publishing tool. We've worked with a lot of DAOs over the past year who have used our crowdfunding tool to bootstrap their treasury and use it as a form of membership for Discord servers. And a lot of those products came from Seed Club and gonna be a good transition to Jess. What's up folks, Jess, uh, co-creator of Seed Club and mostly just fascinated with that orange couch Kartik had there. I'm hoping somebody's making a meme of that. That looked way too good. Uh, yeah, C Club is, is a DAO that builds and invests in other uh, tokenized communities or DAOs. Some call it a Web3. There we go, Kartik, what's up? Uh, a Web3 Y Combinator. Um, we're trying to reimagine what an accelerator looks like as a network and having a lot of fun doing it. And well, hey, everyone. Alex. Yes. Uh, hey, everyone. My name is Alex Masmaj, um, OG C Club cohort. Uh, with the Alex token, that was my way of moving to the United States with the ISA uh, social ERC20 token. Now I am building Showtime, a Web3 social platform that is coming soon on the App Store. Um, and yeah, trying to imagine what a social media looks like in Web3. Yeah, awesome. Thank you everyone for that intro. I think to get started off, um, we'd love to learn a little bit more about how each of you work with other members in your DAO or project and the challenges around managing that. Maybe Alex, we could go start first. Sure, so I've been part of many DAOs. Um, actually, DAOs were my only way of collaborating with people ever uh, before my job at Showtime. And so the way it works was usually social consensus. So like we minimized on-chain collaboration as much as possible. And by default, we used the Molokdown framework, which was popular two years ago. I think now Mirror is more like the best practice if you want to launch a DAO um, um, or then launch Seed Club if it's more serious. Um, but um, yeah, so minimizing social collaboration 
and really keeping it as tight as possible and really like progressively decentralized later on. And I feel like the same is true at Showtime. Like we do have smart contracts. There are people building on top of the Showtime protocol. Someone built like an Instagram to NFT on Showtime website without our knowledge or like Pool Street did like a Valentine's Day drop. Um, and what's really cool is like, we can just, you know, uh, do a DM group and very quickly iterate on smart contracts without much uh, collaboration, human collaboration needed. Um, so I guess, yeah, if it's for using smart contracts as, as little human collaboration as possible, if it's more for like investing in projects like Meta Cartel, uh, then it's like as much human collaboration as possible. And at, and the, like the less on-chain collaboration, um, uh, needed. So yeah, I guess it depends on, on the use case. Uh, can you just share some challenges there just as a follow-up? So I guess, um, uh, some challenges well i guess all of the current infra challenges so um you have to be a true crypto native today to participate in DAOs. um you have to understand discord you have to have gas uh like eth or matic on polygon to get started um and you have to understand a lot of knowledge and get your wallet started and get an understanding of no is this safe um so i would say those are the challenges to onboard people um and um, yeah, I think that that's already a big, <laughs> a big blocker. Yeah, Jess, I feel like you've been nodding there. What was the, the first question again? The first question is how do you work with your current DAO members right now? <laughs> so, you know, C Club has had the ple pleasure, privilege of working with, uh, you know, probably more than 50 projects. We have 20 in our current accelerator batch right now. And I think like the, there's a ton of consistencies and just a kind of ton of variability. Um, but I think like the, the hardest challenge of, and like the complication is just that the human layer, as I think Alex is sort of hinting at, right? Like we're uh, somehow believing that we need to reinvent the wheel significantly. Obviously there's reinvention to be done, but there's a, a ton of history and lessons in just, you know, dealing with human beings and, and uh, collaboration and structure and, all those things that come out of, you know, a long, long, long history of uh, exploration and, and, um, and innovation and organization design that I think, um, you know, we're, we're sort of intersecting with uh, at the technology level. And I, I think still a lot of that hard work to be done is in the soft side of things. Like, you know, how do we build trust? How do we um, think about compensating people in an organization that doesn't have, you know, the, the ease of hierarchy? Um, how do we know who owns things and gets things done? So, a lot of really boring stuff that gets people to work together, I think is really where we're at right now. We've come through this big phase of NFTs and DAOs being popular and interesting and easy to do and exciting. Um, and I think like the hard work right now is like, how do we turn these into sustainable, long lasting networks that create value for their members? And part of that's tech, but I think the hard work right now is um, on the, the human to human level. That's great. And Patrick? Yeah, so in my experience with DAOs, I've been part of some, but the one maybe unique perspective is from Mirror and just watching projects go through the life cycle. And we we like to model DAOs like through different phases. And at Mirror, we focus mainly on like, the first phase, the bootstrapping, or like one of the early phases. And so our crowdfunding tool, you basically can use it to raise ETH and put it into your treasury. And then with that ETH, you can basically have governance proposals or you can have working groups and you can give them allocate specific budgets. And so one thing that I've noticed with the projects that do well versus the ones that aren't as sustainable is that it's really around, it's kind of paradoxical. A lot of people talk about ownership, but to just this point around like just general like organizational best practices, many of the DAOs just have a lot of part-time members or people who don't feel like fully invested in the project. And so it's kind of like, yeah, this lack of clarity, lack of vision, there isn't a specific point of contact. And so it kind of ends up being just kind of this thing where people hang out a bit and then slowly over time, people churn, they stop checking it, they turn off notifications, they leave, et cetera. And so I think the main thing, yeah, it's really having a core team, strong core team that has a vision, has a specific mission purpose. And there's like, I like to think about it in terms of like concentric circles. And if you don't have that core team, it's very hard to really like build a sustainable project, whether that's a product, a protocol, a DAO, just an online community, et cetera. And so, and I think having that strong core team that has a vision, is organized, is willing to take ownership and push things forward, whether it's governance proposals, whether it's 
treasury management, whether it's projects to drive revenue, et cetera. You know, that's, that's probably one of the main things. Yeah, I totally agree with all of what you mentioned. And it sounds like coordination, leadership, and what Alex mentioned is on-ramp and onboarding users and members into the DAO ecosystem is, are some of the big challenges that we encounter. Uh, I, I'm curious, what do you think is currently missing when it comes to um, when you're collaborating with other folks? Um, meaning, you know, when we are uh, doing uh, or working in a project or a company in the Web2 space, uh, historically, there has been uh, guidelines or uh, rules or or tools that are provided. And what do you think right now is primarily missing in the space besides these soft skills and kind of uh, RM tools that you mentioned? I mean, lots. <laughs> yeah, I, I think like the you know, if we zoom out, like what what are DAOs, which is just like a, a massive term, but it, it's like these, it's on-chain organizations and we're using new rails that allow us to you know, collaborate regardless of jurisdiction or where you are in the world. Um, often it's amount of time. We can, you know, there's, there's just a, a variety of ways. So we're, we're building these sort of new organizations on new rails and the, you know, there, we've just come to a 20, 30 year innovation cycle of building SaaS products for building, you know, digital or digitizing our, our meat space businesses. And I think we're going to go through a similar sort of evolution here, probably a bit compressed. So like very easy things to do in, you know, traditional business, like set up a legal structure, um, set up uh, payroll and uh, health insurance and all the sort of basic things are, are still a challenge to do or, or nascent at least and, and tools are being built from it. Um, and that, that's not even sort of touching in on like the more novel ways people are working together you know, many people contributing to many different projects. What does that mean? You know, where do you pay taxes? All these sort of things. Uh, but I think like the, the biggest thing that's missing from this is really like a, a clear understanding of what the business is that people are in when they're building DAOs. I think there's still a big question mark around many, many, many of the concepts that are out there. Um, I think sort of like a, an honest look at the space right now is one where there's a lot of great, exciting opportunities. We sort of have some insights on, on where value can be grown. We have some insights on what valuable token me mechanics might be useful for these organizations, um, but we're still explore exploring. So um, you know, I think one of the, the interesting things about the point in the cycle we're in right now is that people like the early majority, early mainstream, or maybe early adopters are excited about DAOs. Um, you come in, you're like, I'm ready to go do this DAO thing and are sort of ignorant of just the, how much further we do have to go on across all layers of the stack and, uh, you know, including conceptually. So uh, that makes me incredibly bullish. I think like that's the place we should be in right now. There's so much energy and excitement and capital coming to the space. Um, but I think it should be directed in at solving the biggest challenges, which is like, you know, why is this and for what use cases are, are these structures better than others? Um, you know, we have some insights at Seed Club, but are really excited to see many, many more people push those core questions forward. Thank you, Alex. Yeah, I totally agree with Just. I think because we're so early, people can throw terms like DAOs or creators or NFTs, but those are extremely vague terms. And I think actually Vitalik talked about this at ETH Denver and encouraged entrepreneurs to think of use cases and like actual actions that are less vague and have a precise use case. Because I feel like if we get lost into the grand vision of DAOs of like a Wikipedia-like giant that can reward millions of contributors, it's awesome, but it will probably happen in like 10 years or 15 years. And so I would say like, what is a realistic next step, iterative step that we can take? Um, and, you know, kind of like in the nineties, like WordPress, like people thought they would do microblogging and like have those long form content, but turns out Twitter won by like a very simple 140 characters length. And I feel like the same is true for DAOs. Right now, what we are exploring at our project is what can we do besides entering a DAO by buying? I think crowdfunding may have proved there was a really great use case, but I feel like earning is something interesting that can build your reputation like Rabbit Hole is doing. But instead of earning from a DeFi protocol like Rabbit Hole is doing, maybe we can explore earning from doing something, participating with a creator or a DAO, and then earning a token for free, scaling solutions like Polygon and soon optimistic rollups and ZK rollups could help make that gas free, instant, and cheap. That could onboard like orders of magnitudes more people than buying, because buying, as we talked about, like suffers from all the on ramps and infrastructural uh, weaknesses that we have today. 
Yeah, Patrick. Yeah. Yeah. And so with DAOs, there's like, yeah, tons of different components. There's like, yeah, DAO operations, like payroll, that's like compensation, there's governance, and then there's this other component like around business model and like token incentives. But to Alex's point, I actually think a really interesting one is around reputation and identity and like credentials and understanding like, okay, who are the people that are best suited to do this specific thing for this DAO or out of different like service DAOs that may be focused on specific things like tokenomics or governance or design or product or protocol, et cetera, which are the best ones to help with our specific problems. And yeah, I'm really interested in seeing how people can build up reputation through doing things on chain as opposed to yeah, just aping into tokens and flipping them. And yeah, especially with L2s where it's like the ideal scenario is you basically just download a wallet. You don't need any tokens and you can start earning by producing content, whether that's uploading NFTs, whether that's by writing, whether that's by posting or just like, you know, whatever your creative skill is, you don't need any token to start off with. You can basically just start publishing. And then now I kind of view likes in Web2 as like this virtual currency that just lives in a database. But the cool thing about fungible tokens and NFTs is that you can like treat them as likes. You can make them very cheap, especially on L2s or side chains. And from there, you can basically like build like a similar toward sort of like engagement mechanic of, hey, I, I want to like this person's NFT, but you can use it. You can do it in the way of collecting as opposed to just like liking it and just storing a database. And then people can basically build their reputation based off of who's collected their NFT very cheaply or who collected at a very high price and how much have they posted and published and stuff like that. I think there's a lot of creative stuff there in terms of building reputations through on-chain interactions and data. Yeah, this is super helpful. And I think each of you addressed really great points around the kind of what we're lacking in the space, but it seems like there's obviously a lot of DAO tools and DAOs really striving for kind of best practices and 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 um, and um, expanding their usage when it comes to tools. I think when we are talking about onboarding, since each of you work with many early small communities and creators, what are your top recommended tool sets, right? Let's just say, name top five of them of what do you have your creators and NFT uh, creators walk through and uh, use when you actually first have them join your DAO? Alex? Maybe. I think I have non-consensus take on DAO onboarding. I think people are solving like completely the wrong problem when they're, they're taking about this or, or talking about DAO onboarding. Mm -hmm. and I think a large number of the tools are sort of missing the boat here as well. Uh, the, you know, not all, I, I don't think, like, I think there is a world where we have million people DAOs and people are participating on them. They probably look a lot more like a social network. Um, and on the opposite side, I think we're gonna have a large number of DAOs that have a small number of people, but who are using the power of coordination and broader token holder, uh, token ownership and, and this sort of like composable tech stack to have an immense amount of leverage out there. And so the, the challenge with, with onboarding right now is not about getting, Joe Schmo to join your DAO and do a bounty. In my opinion, it's more about how do we build up like areas of value creation and find the right people to go do that value creation. And so these start to look a lot more like the evolution of a startup than they look like the evolution of an app or a membership site or a Patreon. And so um, yeah, through that lens, like the, there, there is no traditional tech stack that we're, that we're using with any of our projects specifically. Um, DAOs are just such a huge variety. We have some that are, you know, we'll probably have a team of three and out do, you know, millions of dollars worth of dope things out in the world. And others will have, you know, thousands of team members. And, um, you know, what we, we like to see the, or think of these projects as like the center of their own universe. And so they're pulling in all sorts of different tools to enable that experience. And the reality is like the, the simplest tools right now are, are human beings engaging with human beings as they come through. So I think like the the work that the Krause House team is doing and the Cabin Dow team is doing and, um, and and even the C Club team as far as like how you hit their Discord, how you feel like you're a part of something right away, how you're brought in and and you know uh, opportunities to engage are created, uh, but importantly also teams are able to learn about contributors and, and ultimately make that match as opportunities arise. So not a tool challenge, again a human challenge and. Uh, we're not trying to, people who are trying to scale things to millions and millions of users and DAOs right now, I think are um, yeah, maybe a little bit misguided. 
Well, I would counter that. Like, I'm happy to give some tools um, for onboarding people as like our teams is mostly engineers. So the first one would be like, get a wallet set up as easily as possible. And so today there is Magic Link and Web3 OS X Taurus, which work pretty well with like just your phone number, which is like the normal Web2 social onboarding method. Uh, but there's also new competitors coming like Slide or um, Paper XYZ to do like easy NFT checkout. So that's one category, like getting your wallet set up. Then like, uh, I would say uh, the whole Gnosis safe UI space. I think Multis is pretty interesting. You can do management treasury in terms of things. Uh, and that could be helpful to like have people view what's happening in the treasury. Um, then obviously Mirror is awesome to spin up your DAO on mainnet, uh, really great tool to crowdfund. Then something else. Um, I just forgot. Oh yeah, I think Backdrop, back by C Club, is, is really awesome. Uh, Backdrop is essentially in the DAO discovery space, so you can just browse all the DAOs. And I feel like spinning up is one part, but discovering which DAO you're excited to join is also a great tool. So that would be my my tools. Alex, you missed out. Now it's the one place you can go to see all the proposals and information coming through. It's not just discovery. It's going to make your governance life so much easier. Amazing. Love it, love it. And Patrick, last last comments for you. Yeah, I would say, yeah, probably I guess basic level. Yeah, there's the wallet in order to hold on to the assets, such as ETH or NFTs or ERC twenty tokens. And so, yeah, there's like most likely Gnosis safe, just so you don't have control, just centralized with one person. And so you have like multiple people that can authorize transactions, and then. Yeah, it's basic level. All you really need other than that is a group chat tool and tell you that that's Telegram or Discord. You can get pretty far just from there. And so a lot of those that I've seen start from there. And then, yeah, if you want to do more advanced, if you want to open up to more people, maybe you use a crowdfunding tool like Mirror. And then from there, you can also, yeah, of course, there's also like governance proposals on Snapshot. And then there's like forums for and more like asynchronous communication. I think Discord's a good one. And then, yeah, I think those are the general ones, but I would also echo Jess's point around the like, most important thing is like, understanding like, what is the mission, what is the problem you're solving, what is the purpose of this, who's the core team, what are people responsible for, it? and I'm really trying to focus on that as opposed to getting caught up in using 10 new fancy tools. Yeah, there's so many fancy tools out there and always a shiny thing to look at and try out, right? I, I think as DAO users, we always wanted to see you know, find and optimize for the most efficient and best tool that works for our DAO. Um, I'm curious, maybe just to level set for folks, when you're looking at DAOs that are either wrapped by NFTs or tokens or a combination of the two, what have you seen worked really well uh, between those two different types of tokens, uh, fungible and non-fungible? And can you give some examples? Um, I would say that the DAOs that seem to do the best are investment DAOs because it's a very easy use case, very easy to rally around. And so NFT investment like Blizzard DAO has done really well. Um, Constitution DAO, although it failed to reach its goal, uh, was still extremely impressive to rally around like 42 mil in, um, in a few weeks or maybe one week. That was really impressive. So I would say investment DAOs right now is the easiest. And also like the long tail of all the mirror crowd funds that happened, um, pro like Cabin DAO, also like Basic Club started on there. Like, yeah, a bunch of others. I would say like weird DAO crowdfunding ideas usually tend to do well because it's like surprising. And so like Krahos DAO, I think it's called for like a basketball team. Maybe you should raise like billions of dollars because it's very expensive. But if they do, it's like a very funny goal. And like, it's easy to rally a community around something novel and crazy, the crazier, the, the better. The crazier, the better. That's the tip that you have. Gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> that's from Alex, that's, I love that. You live your life like that. Yeah, um, yeah I, like, I think like the, we always say that we're, we think tokens give community superpowers and it's our job to help figure out what those superpowers are and how to best apply them. And so we don't, start off thinking about any specific type of token. We're really interested in, in what the community is trying to achieve and their direction. And then, um, you know, can start making recommendations on 
you know, processes, methods that would make use of fungible tokens or non-fungible tokens. Um, I think what we're seeing right now over this last little while is that, you know, non-fungible tokens are probably a, a better tool for early, early stage projects. And uh, I think we'll see, like, if you want to see a, a, a model that I think will be rolled out across DAOs generally, it's probably what uh, Bored Ape has just done, which is like NFT is collectible slash membership thing preferably with some sort of governance built in, uh, you know, not a centralized organization that's running it, but I think, um, you know, DAOs can take that NFT launch membership, generate some capital for a treasury, um, do, do more releases of that and, or just release a, a fungible token on top of it. So, you know, we're in the early stages of a game plan like that with um, a number of projects, you can see some of the early stages with pool suite through their NFT drop. Um, you know, I think the, the Kraus house, NFT sales or and, and token, or I guess crowdfund was sort of like a, a hybrid of that. Uh, I think we'll see less and less of those hybrids. I think they just complicate things a little bit. And I know Mirror is sort of moving that direction as well as we're seeing some other partners as well. Um, and, and then, yeah, of course, we're seeing like some really great use cases of, of fungible tokens um, that as you know, organizations, communities grow and more nuanced or, or detailed ways of rewarding work need to be created. Um, that's where fungible tokens really thrive and or through scale. Um, of course, there's additional burden that kind of comes with market making, et cetera. So I think, you know, we're still in the early, earliest days of some of these ex ex uh, experiments, want to see all sorts of ideas. And so we're excited about a number of different projects that are leaning into fungible, non-fungible. Uh, and, you know, I'm sure there'll be other variations. Uh, you know, I think what um, uh, the team over at Camp Chaos right now, um, they're building... This is the um, third camp, I guess, from our, our friends over there. And they're rolling out this really interesting token model that's actually around splits. So like the value that'll come from the music that's um, that's produced there. So uh, I think we'll see more and more and more token types emerge. Gotcha. So just to summarize, it sounds like you're seeing earlier communities do NFTs and notably some examples are like Ape and um, board eight yacht club and then also for a segment of the DAOs, uh, makes sense more with a kind of a profit sharing type of token no want to be want to be careful there we're seeing numbers of different types of tokens that are that are emerging here and nfts or fungible tokens are, are two of them that we're seeing used well and i think we're also seeing new token types emerge but need to be careful about the the structure and method mm -hmm. of, of those yeah yeah gotcha Thank you for calling and Captain Patrick. Yeah, it's a, yeah, mirror the way our crowdfunding tool evolved because basically that is a, yeah, it's a token distribution tool for a lot of projects and kind of the evolution of our crowdfunding protocols. We started off where it was only issuing ERC-20 tokens, mainly because that was a, about a year ago, this time a year ago, a little bit further back. and. Yeah, we were really inspired more by DeFi and DeFi didn't really use NFTs as a governance mechanism or membership mechanism. And so we're just, all right, DeFi use it, work for them, should work for creators and communities. And so we used that for the first few months and then NFTs started blowing it up. We're like, okay, let's tack on NFTs to this protocol. And so not only do you get the fungible token, which even to that point, I was like last summer, people were like, okay, it's still good for governance or for other method mechanisms as well. And we just tacked on NFTs as like this visual representation. And then from there, a few months later, we realized that yeah, just for optimizing for simplicity, it's best, well, depending on the project, but if you want to optimize for simplicity, which I would recommend most projects do, it's easier just to have one token type. And usually people can really understand an NFT more than a fungible token. And the mental model is simpler where it's like, okay, one NFT maps to one vote as opposed to fungible tokens. And where do you buy them? And okay, wait, but it doesn't look like anything. Oh, I can't use this in my profile picture. And so ended up the evolution of our crowdfunding protocols. Then we basically designed this version where it's only NFTs and we've prioritized other things in the meantime, but that's definitely something that projects have asked for. And I would recommend for projects that are looking to just get started, keep it simple. And there's a bunch of like, I think the eight example is really interesting where it just brings in a lot of complexity where now there's like two classes of stakeholders. There's like the NFT holders, and then there's the people that are farming the token or buying the token on, on AMMs. And it just like, ends up 
kind of creating this like group of mixed incentives. And so I'm not sure that's necessarily what you would want. And I think Nouns DAO is really interesting in terms of using NFTs as a form of governance and membership and having that as a singular token. And you know, the thing with NFTs that is so interesting is that you can turn them into fungible tokens. You can just, you can, there's different tools where like fractional where you lock up an NFT and then you mint fungible tokens based off of them. And so you can end up, so at least the, you can turn the NFT into fungible tokens, but then turning fungible tokens into an NFT is a bit more difficult. And so that's kind of my approach. If you want to optimize for simplicity, use NFTs, and then you can end up evolving into fungible tokens from those same NFTs if you really want to. And like one actually, one really interesting example is Zora's latest protocol where they basically have like a lot of products, like for example, Uniswap and DeFi, they say, okay, token holders can vote on whether to implement a fee switch to go from so that token holders get a, the Uniswap treasury gets a percentage of trading fees, but they haven't turned it on. But that's basically fungible token holders deciding. Whereas Zora with their latest protocol, they basically implemented something where there's one NFT that decides the whether there's a fee switch. But then the interesting thing is that I believe right now that that, that NFT is owned by the multi stick controlled by Zora, but eventually there's different ways of distributing it. And basically you can create fungible tokens based off of that. And so I think that's a pretty interesting model. And at least like mentally, it's much simpler to understand like whoever controls this one NFT controls like these different mechanisms for the protocol. So those but are just a few like, examples. Yeah, that's really helpful. And I wonder if, you know, with the world, uh, with the Ape token and the NFT now coexisting, uh, and of course, I'm sure they'll figure it out, but it's, do you think that, you know, Zora might issue a token as well down the road, right? And then everyone will just have to figure out who are the stakeholders for the NFT and who are the stakeholders for the token. I don't know whether Zora is going to have a token and I have, there's no alpha here, but I am just curious, like, why wouldn't you tap into both the markets when you can? Yeah, I, mean, yeah. I think, I think it's, it's about like, what are you trying to do? Like why so many teams will start with NFTs is because it's actually really hard to bootstrap a market and, you know, having your liquidity live on OpenSea is a lot easier than having your liquidity live on Uniswap as you're an early stage project. Um, but you can see like the exceptional value and impact that launching a token could have. I mean, I don't know what Ape is at today, but uh, you know, there's, there's obviously significant value there. And, and that value, a, a big chunk of that value lives in a treasury that um, all token holders have, you know, some say over. And, uh, you know, I think the, the path from NFT to, to ApeCoin is pretty clear. Um, they did a great, I think a, a reasonable job in distributing tokens to existing token holders. So, um, you know, they have this on-chain graph of ownership and, and have rewarded people based on that. So is it can be perfect? Are there better ways? Probably. But I think this, um, it, it, I just, I find it very unhelpful for people to get locked into ideas of like, I need to do an NFT or I need to do a fungible token, or this is the pathway to go. And rather it needs to be like, you know, tokens give your community some sort of superpowers. There are a bunch of superpowers laying down here, like which one is most important for you now. And, and I do think like a, a general trend people learn as they get deeper into the space is just how much more flexibility there, there is if you have that layer zero social consensus in, in what you're doing, right? So if people believe in your team and what you're doing, um, you know, or, or in that project, they're going to come with you wherever. And, you know, C-Club I don't, has had multiple tokens over the, the year and a half we've been around. And, and those are all about, you know, rolling out better, more useful things for our community based on, you know, the, the understanding and opportunities we have today. So don't get too locked in on it. Amazing tools, amazing. And, and there, you know, there are plenty of other cool use cases that don't even have tokens whatsoever. So, yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. And, and this is a really about kind of takeaway for our folks who are listening and who are looking to build DAOs or uh, build tools for DAOs for sure. Um, um, maybe just a quick fire round since we don't have that much more time, but we're in this DAO cycle. If there's one, are we in? Uh, maybe Alex, if you want to go start or, or Jess, if you're smiling. <laughs> Feel free to chime in. <laughs> um, it, <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. To me, like each crypto cycle is less intense than the previous one. So we are in the latter stage of the bull cycle where like right now there's music NFTs and other trends that like try to push the open C layer one collectible as far as possible. But it seems like we explored the layer one infrastructure space uh, enough. And then we're gonna see a wave of infra startups and a wave of consumer and, and other startups in the next year or two that will innovate. But right now we are like 
in the end of the NFT boom that started around the time last year. That would be my, my view. Or DAOs, just to clarify. Well, to me, NFTs and DAOs and tokens are like mm -hmm. all like, as we talked like with Ape and stuff, like I agree with Patrick that you want a unified value flow. You don't want to have two distinct value flow, creates misalignment. Um, you want one value flow that you may be fractionalizing or maybe splitting. To me, that's much smarter. But like, yeah, like, well, yeah, the DAO, I mean, everything I said about the NFT stage like applies to DAOs. Like right now, we've done all of what we could with Noses and with Mare. And like some startups are trying to incubate, uh, to be incubated at C-Club. And now like maybe more infrastructure, not necessarily DAO tooling. I don't think we need more DAO tooling, but I would say more like <laughs> blockchain solutions and, and like a lot of other stuff that will then create a new, many new DAO use cases. But I feel like we are the late stage of like this bull market and that it applies to DAOs as well. My, my answer is a general shrug. Don't really care. I think like, and when I say that in the context of like this, these last two years, year and a half has just been transformative in the Web3 space. We have mainstream-ish adoption. We have, you know, it's, we're in the New York Times. C-Club was in Forbes. What's up? I don't know if that's good or not, but like, let's go. Like, uh, Vitalik was on time today. Like people are paying attention. Um, most people have exposure to the space. The honor apps are there. Like all this, there's just, it's, we were been building for the last three, four or five years. Like it's just night and day today. And so, um, yeah, I think it, it sure, are there, will there be cycles in volatile markets? Yeah, of course. Um, but I think right now it's very clear that there's a, there are businesses to be built here, novel organizations to be built, credible innovations that are happening. There's an immense amount of money that is recognizing that as well and is backing it up. Um, if you're a private founder in, in the market today, building something interesting in the space, probably never been a better time to do it, um, both capital and you know infrastructure and understanding. And so... Um, yeah, I think it's a little slower right now. And those of us that are building are very appreciative of that, I think. And uh, I don't know when the next bull or, or whatever hype comes, um, but my hope is that um, you know we get to continue to, to work with really talented, creative individuals who are putting their hearts and souls into building these organizations and that they're going to be you know long lasting, impactful organizations in the world. And that's what we're focused on right now. And when I look around this table, that's exactly what I see here as well. People who are just really thoughtfully building for their community, for their use case um, and making huge strides at it. So that's bullish. That's it's a perma bull market if you think of a life like that. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. It sounds pretty positive to me, <laughs> Patrick. <laughs> Dow super cycle, but yeah, I feel- That's it. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, I definitely look at it less in terms of like cycles, even though it's, it's useful, just like understand the market and what's going on, but more focused on like, yeah, what are like emerging infrastructure that you can use to build better product experiences, better protocols, or you know, solve different types of problems or the same problems in new ways. And yeah, I think that really interesting one on the horizon is or already here just really early is around scalability solutions, either for Ethereum or alternative layer ones and thinking through, yeah, in a world constrained by high gas fees, like that, that leaves, yeah, that's just like a certain class of problems that you can solve, but then now in a world with much lower transaction fees, like what are the problems you can solve? What are the product experiences? What can go on chain? What can you do with that new data that's on chain and composability, et cetera. And so that's what I'm really excited about. And in terms of the cycle, yeah, there's just so much in that space alone and other spaces as well, like around like, yeah, privacy solutions with like ZK tech, et cetera. But yeah, I think just thinking through like, what are the opportunities that scalability will provide? And yeah, I think that's definitely lower than we will be at some point in the future, not too far off. Awesome, awesome. And, and one last question that I'm particularly curious about and very relevant to the title of this, uh, this, this conversation, which is supposed to be a focus around on-chain collaboration. What is one tip from you for any communities out there and builders out there to 10X their on-chain collaboration? Tip or tool? You can never recommend anything. Uh, long-term or short-term? Short-term launch a token with yield farming. <laughs> and then, yes, so I'm probably like booing you right now. <laughs> 
That's a that's great advice for the short term. Um, <laughs> we've seen like I think one of the most uh, powerful tools is just a good TLDR, and you know having you and your contributors be more active in creating TLDRs um, and sort of taking ownership around communicating uh, uh, clearly and consistently and and multiple times. Um, I think yeah, information asymmetry is the biggest barrier, and TLDRs may be our only useful solution right now. I love that. We're going to use it for, for GCR, I think. That, that sounds like an amazing tip, actually. I would say memes, mm. definitely. I'd say one project that I'm really impressed by is Mad Realities. And they their TLDR is the first decentralized dating show and long-term decentralized media network. And so for those that don't know, they raised they raised some funds to be able to hire people. And now they're streaming this dating show where contestants are voted on by NFT holders. They're streaming it on YouTube. And at the same time that they're streaming the show or they're filming the show, they have Discord channels open, voice rooms, chat channels. And it's like, it's very interactive. Everybody grew up like watching American Idol and like texting on your flip phone. And like, and there's not really like a communal social experience, whereas this is more like internet native, like in real time, you're talking to people, you're going throughout the season together. Like a lot of people talk about, oh, I wish I could watch reality shows with my friends, but this is actually something that is building infrastructure for that. And if you just go to their Twitter account, their memes are hilarious. They have a certain brand and it just feels like hey, you want, you're want you rooting for them and they just make you laugh a lot and you want to be a part of it. Actually, one small thing for Mad Realities that I think could be generalized to DAO members is highlighting your DAO members. Because in Mad Realities, you have to like promote yourself, kind of like the mirror crowd fund, uh, right race, sorry, the mirror crowd right race. I think the, the job that Mad Realities did at like everyone has to post a video online, just like highlighted future DAO members. And that's something good because we never see other DAO members, but like the, the lead or chief person and so I think that's something that, it, that they've done well and can be reproduced in other DAOs. These are awesome tips. And I think you definitely need to check out that reality show. Um, apologize for the dogs, but I think we're wrapping up now and really appreciate Jess, Alex, Patrick being on the show with us today. And I, I, I'm really sorry. <laughs> this is, I'm glad they were embarking during the daytime. <laughs> that's how my life is as well. So I miss oh, my heart saying a little bit. The, the couch is back. <laughs> back. Uh, well, Patrick, Alex, Jess, thank you so much for those amazing answers. And Joyce, thank you so much for facilitating. Uh, it was awesome to hear kind of all those perspectives. And I think uh, kind of the most interesting piece here that, that is that everything we talked about is still in the, the early phases of sort of how we think this is going to evolve. Obviously, I think the how it actually uh, kind of formalizes and, and what it sells on will be much different than what we can imagine. But um, what gives me hope is that this is in like the very uh, right direction from like we are thinking about the same problems and we're thinking about the same challenges we need to solve. It's just a different path that we'll end up kind of converging on. But uh, it was kind of good to hear that. I, I hope that all the hackers that are watching this uh, sort of get some insights on how do you make that specifically more actionable for DAOs or managing communities, especially at scale. Um, and not only just the numbers wise, but also just different ways people are contributing for different roles. And um, I think one thing we kind of inherently sort of just ended up talking about without explicitly calling it out is um, you are describing a new social network at the end of the day. Uh, these are groups that care about specific problems and have different connections with each other and uh, being able to say, how do we make this easy for them? Or how do we give them a different community or a view on how they manage their world or their day to day is uh, it's going to be an interesting topic that I don't think has been explored too much. So I hope that uh, of the 500 people that are hacking and building new social networks for the next two weeks, uh, we see some innovation or some new creative ways to manage uh, now communities. So thank you so much again. And um, really appreciate you all taking the time. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank Hi, everybody. You. Bye, everyone. This marks the end of our summit. So uh, I want to thank everybody who kind of stuck around. And obviously, everybody who engaged with us on the chat will be getting the POAPs delivered to them uh, at the end of this event, which will be two weeks from now. So stay patient on, on that. Um, but I want to thank all of you again once more. And uh, for all the hackers, happy hacking. We'll see you all on Discord. This means all the workshops that are still pending for today will end up being on uh, uh, with the links to that will be on a calendar invite and also on the Discord. And any questions you have about how to use specific protocols or APIs or SDKs or anything about this event uh, can be asked on 
the LF Grow channels on Discord. So with that, enjoy some lo-fi beats and we'll see you all next week. Take care, everybody.